Chapter 1, Prologue. Hmm, my consciousness comes to me, I wake up in a place where nothing exists. 3, where am I? Ah, uh, another soul? Greetings their soul, a voice answers me. The entire nothingness then turns into a blinding light, making it impossible to see the source. Who are you? Why am I here? You, dear, man are one of those who wish to be reborn in another world. And so you are taken here, under my control. Reborn? You mean I died? Yes, yes, you were very happy when you passed so that's an upside. You had just finished binge reading the comic Invincible on the bus when it suddenly blew up. Such a tragic story indeed, tis 3, the voice replies, 9, I see, thank you for telling me, I think I know how this goes now, I said, very well, let us proceed then, his voice trials of as if waiting for me to do something, do I get any wishes or decisions on where I choose to be reborn, I try to guess his intentions, yes, yes, 3 to be exact, now do go on and state them he stated, okay, well I wish to be reborn in the universe of Invincible, and as Mark's twin brother, 7, yes, yes, one moment, there we go, what else? I want to have the powers of Connell with full Kryptonian DNA and the long life of a Viltramite. I don't want any of that rage and overconfident crap, I'm my own man. And also none of that Kryptonite crap I'm weak to. I told him as I remember Superboy. 34. Yes, yes. A moment. Granted. Like him your full Kryptonian powers won't manifest until the same time as Mark's powers do, although your tactile telekinesis powers will awaken by age 8. 3. That's great actually. Anyway, for my last I wish to keep my memories and especially my knowledge of the Invincible comics. I reply. 11. Yes, yes. Hang on, there. The voice trails off once more. It took a while for it to come back and said, Let's get you there young soul, I have more souls to handle before I can catch a break. 3. I began to feel different before being shunted out of that space altogether. Earth. My awareness turned dark, I can feel some slime-like matter surround and push me towards an opening that was too small for me. The pushing kept going as I slowly slid out of that opening to find a blinding light meeting me. 2. I heard sounds of crying near me and a pair of gloves hand take me, a woman's laughter and pained groans sounded out before I was out beside someone. I felt this someone, he was like me, small and hairless. Moments later we were cleaned and wrapped in warm cloth. 5. We were then brought to room where I could hear murmurs and excited voices ahead, and then a pair of powerful arms took me and the other. It was a man with a trimmed mustache on his lips, he carried us towards a tired but kind-looking woman who smiled as she saw us both. 6. The woman requested to rest and the man took us away from her, he sat in a chair while holding us both. For the Empire. For Viltrum. Chapter 2. Chapter 1. 8 years after. 4. It's been a couple of years since I've been reborn into the Grayson home. My brother Mark and I still share the same room even then but I don't doubt that will change someday soon. My father Nolan keeps his job as a full-time superhero, dashing around the globe trying to help the people and earning their trust as one of its strongest protectors. Yes I know why he's doing it and who he's doing it for. I can't stop the man even if I had my telekinesis awaken soon. He would crush my hands for even trying or even just having those powers. Viltramites are not known for their compassion after all. 9. So I prepared myself for its eventual awakening by trying my best to be a good boy. My mother Deborah was a housewife working on her real estate license. She was the stabilizing and grounding point of all of us. She was loving, kind, and very close to us as we grew up. 6. Mark and me began to prefer her company than our father's. But then again, he was always working and he does get paid by the government now that he's a guardian of the globe. 6. Four months later, November. My powers awakened by then, keeping me on the air for a good while before dropping back down. Red energy seemed emanated from my entire body as I floated, just like Connell in the comics. I was lucky enough to have been alone when I awakened it. Nolan took Mark to the park to practice baseball. 1. I tried to calm myself down from the excitement so as not to leave any signs of my awakening. I don't need to make Nolan aware of my powers, not until Mark gets his. I've grown hesitant in calling Nolan dad, which became obvious to me ever observant mother. She tried to slowly coax me into doing it for a few days until I did, albeit unwittingly. 3. Three months after. Dad has been increasingly strict with us, having decided to tell us that we were part alien. 3. He spouted some lie about his races being benevolent and helpful, which Mark took to heart with eyes shining as he listened. I acted the same but I couldn't stomach it after a few minutes of non-stop tales. So I pretended to yawn and went to sleep beside them, leaving him and Mark to just talk. The act might have insulted Dad, which also might have been the reason for him being strict now. 4. One year after, age 9. My practices with telekinesis has been fruitful. I've been able to keep myself a fly for an indefinite amount of time, and I've been able to come up with a way to enhance my hearing with it, which helped greatly at avoiding my father's watchful eyes. 4. My brotherly bond with Mark has strengthened over the years along with the shenanigans we always do, much to Mom's anger and Dad's laughter. Mom, however, secretly smiled at us every time. Dad has mellowed out a bit, I emphasize a bit, after that one time Mark scored a home run. He shouted and cheered in joy as Mark ran around and made it just in time. He caught carried him a smile, a pure genuine smile. Perhaps there was hope to turn him good. Hopefully. 11. Six years later, age 15. After years of secret training I have finally mastered my tactile telekinesis power, having mastered and copied all the skills Connell displayed in my past. 2. I have of course developed my own set of techniques to better suit my combat style. One such technique was what I called psychic intelligence. It allows me to focus my psychic energy into enhancing my brain's data processing. 1. With it I can think faster, memorize better, and remember things in an instant. Of course that not all but that enough for now, although it is very taxing to keep it active at all times, so I only rarely use it. I'm already smart enough as it is. 2. As a comic book reader and fictional debater, I have acquired a vast knowledge on things that can help me be stronger. 3. But for now, my focus is on school. The technique makes my life easier at school but my twin is struggling. And I can't have him telling mom that and watching her glare at me for not helping. 1. And if that wasn't enough, Mark befriended another guy named Danny with the same problem. Although it's not much of a problem to let them copy my works, I do feel like I'm leading them down a wrong and lazy path. Or I might just be cranky. Who knows? 3 years later, age 18. 
The three years that went by were not always spent in school learning kids stuff since I already know the basics. I tested my new super intelligence, TTK enhanced plus current intellect, by studying different subjects in the school library. I found myself being able to memorize and understand a lot better now, being able to finish my high school studies early and start on more focused topics. I found a lot of discoveries and breakthroughs that were leaps ahead of any technology one had ever known on my earth before. I've only read the literature of course, newspaper articles, and history books about them were obvious references. I was rather disarmed by how behind I was, so to compensate for that I began to build my foundation on three subjects in mind. Medicine, technology, and physics. Having decided on them, I exhausted the library of every book relating to the topics. 1. It didn't take long for me to move my studies to the public library. I didn't want to give Cecil any more suspicions by going on the internet to study. 4. As for my body training, I've had a few exercise regimens saved in my head. Kryptonian martial arts were a good reference since the comics displayed it quite obviously. Earth martial arts were just enough to fill in for quick takedowns and pressure points. That was my routine for the last few years. Until I got my powers, again. Mark and I got a part-time job as two different establishments in the same area. The guy was hoping for this day to come ever since that night dad told us he was an alien. He does know that it would be today obviously but that didn't stop him from being very optimistic. I mean, I was quite excited when I got my TTK. Who wouldn't be? Too. Anyway, my workday went on as usual until it was time for my break. I went to the back to relax and play with some pebbles using telekinesis. I got three of them and rapidly spun them around until they glowed hot. It was a trail of a technique I was working on. 3. I then heard a slight whistling sound followed by the sound of a minor boom. I look up just in time to see an black object fly over before disappearing into the sky. It was then that I felt some vibrating all over me. I grabbed onto the wall only to find my hand lodged an inch into its bricks. I flew in the air and directed myself to the thick forest just three miles outside of town. The awakening of my Kryptonian powers was disorienting at first due to the suddenness, the sounds, and smells from all over having turned to maximum. 1. I had to concentrate and consolidate in a place far from all of it to get a grip on my abilities. The flying will be coached by dad but that's it. It was hard to separate my TTK enhanced and Kryptonian enhanced senses but I simply decided to tone all of it down for the moment. I took me an hour to keep the sense to a minimum and another to learn how to make use of their max settings on command. Turns out speeding up your mind does make learning and think faster. 7. I flew back to the establishment and clocked out the end of my shift. I flew and landed just five houses away from home and walked the rest of the way. I arrived at the dinner table with Mark and Mom just having sat down and getting ready. Dad still wasn't around but he'll flew in shortly I think. Let's go ahead and start. It doesn't look like he's going to be home anytime so Dash her sentence was cut by a swoosh as Dad appeared at the empty seat just in front of me, all dressed and not in hero spandex. I'm sorry I'm late. There was an enchanted flood in Egypt I had to deal with on the way over he quickly apologized but in a calm way. Mom began to ask about it and some dragon from the news. They talked for a bit before Mom finally asked us both. So, how was your day, Rob? Mark? Great actually. I think I'm starting to develop. Fine. I think I'm finally getting superpowers. Mark and I both said simultaneously. Mom smiled and said oh that's nice. I'm proud of both of you. She then looked to her husband who was silently staring at both of us. Are you sure? He asked seriously. I could feel it. His previously calm demeanor went away and the soldier was left. Yeah, I threw a trash bin into space. Mark exclaimed, excitedly ignorant of dad's change. Yes dad. I saw it disappear into the blue sky and I found myself floating while I trying to get a better look at it I replied after him. Dad continued to stare at both of us, in silence. Mom moved a bit and I heard a kick from below, snapping dad out of his stare. Oh great, my sons. That's great. If you both want we can start training tomorrow. I'll make some time tomorrow, he said. Mark happily agreed while I simply smiled and nodded. I may be wary of the man but I can't deny his skills in matters like this. We finished dinner in silence and we each went to our separate rooms for the night. Mark's room was right beside mine so I could hear him very well, even when I don't want to. 1. Today, however, I could hear him shift restlessly on his bed. After a while finally stood and opened the window, stepped outside and just gave himself a pep talk to fly. I smiled at this and decided to join him, and together with our efforts he managed to at least float for a moment, before falling down with a thud and a crash. Something broke his fall huh? I failed to hold my laughter as I saw him crash face first on mom's, oh crap. I got scared at the realization. Mark get inside quick. You broke mom's bonsai collection. I quickly whispered before dashing towards my room, only to crash into a solid chest. Dad was there hover over my window with both hands folded and a plain look over his face. Mark soon got to the roof, his upper body was dirty with soil, leaves, and a giant piece of clay pot perched over his head. Dad's look quickly turned surprise and then into sympathy. He shifted his gaze from me to Mark and back until he finally let out a sigh and whooshed his way out of the roof. I found his actions to be suspicious but I soon realized why he did it. A set of light footsteps maybe its way outside and stopped just as the door was opened. Boys. Mom shouted, not caring if it would bother the neighbors far away. Nice going Mark. Chapter 3, Chapter 2, Early Morning, The Next Day. Last night wasn't good as mom proceeded to berate both of us for breaking her collection, having worked years into it just for it all to be destroyed. We didn't get much sleep but it was okay. Our current physique could handle let's sleep now. We were up in the air, just a few miles above the house. Dad wore his signature costume, the red and white combo with a single line as his insignia. Mark and I just wore our casual clothes since it was still a school day. My hair flowed as the winds blew on us, I had decided to grow it longer to distinguish myself from Mark. We looked somewhat identical, but I had sharper features and more training so my height was an inch over his. Our eyes, however, were one of the more obvious differences with our eyes as mine were gray and his was dark brown. Suck on that Viltramite dominant jeans? Anyway, Dad was teaching us how to fly properly before it was time for school. 
I soon found that his way of flying was not helpful for me at all. Viltramides have it easy as all they had to do was balance themselves using some system in their ears, while Kryptonians are a little bit different. Due to the evolution in Krypton's heavier gravitational pull, they have developed organs which help had helped them move around it as if in normal Earth gravity. So in flight practice it's more on getting used to the feeling of using it rather than simply balancing. So as Mark was busy trying to stabilize his position, I was busy trying to pinpoint the feeling inside and making it a habit to engage it whenever I want to fly. It didn't talk long for me to come up with a way to fully control that part of me, and I was flying circles around them by the time Mark finally got control. Dad then asked us to follow him somewhere and he took us to a clearing far away. We were talking as we go, Dad still trying to explain and failing to give any relatable feeling of his version of flying, trying to pee on purpose, H.A., what crap is that? Dad then slowly landed I followed his example, but Mark just crashed into the ground, leaving a sizable hole upon impact. Dad then proceeded to teaching us how to punch, which he does by punching straight at Mark. Mark didn't expect it and was hit square in the chest, resulting in him squirming and gasping on the ground. He then just stared as Mark continued to call out and struggle for air. I threw a punch with my right, only for it to be caught. His facing still calm and still staring at Mark. I called out to him, Dad, why did you do that? His grip was tighter than I expected, old full-blooded Viltramite are tough bastards. To be fair, I wasn't even trying my hardest at that punch. I pretended to struggle from it and desperately pulled. He soon let go after seeing both, suddenly feeling guilty somehow. I helped Mark up and looked at Dad, look Dad, I know your job is hard and I get that you're trying to get us prepared for the worst. So, I promise we'll train better and be more aware next time. I gritted my teeth after the words went out of me. We went home, the mood wasn't good as Mark felt ashamed by his weakness and I felt weak despite my powers. I could probably take on Dad but Mark would see it as me being crazy and fighting me instead, and I'm not confident enough to face both of them at the same time. We both went to change as it was time for school. Mom and Dad argued as Dad's attitude change was becoming slowly more apparent to her. A week after. It's been days since we started training and Mark has been itching to prove himself for real. He left in some strange attempt at a costume followed by Dad who intended to watch over his actions. I stayed behind and worked on my laptop. Yes, laptop. Mom got it for me as a reward for doing good at school. Mark wasn't jealous as his interests focused on his powers. For the last week I had started to work on developing my skills in hacking and AI creation. Funnily enough, it only took me three days to get into Cecil's main systems without getting noticed. I downloaded a lot of technology specs on it to use for my suit. Everything from cloaking to medical devices, as long as it was necessary for survival. I also drew Superboy's cybernetic suit and made some alterations to its features. I remembered in the comics that this world's version of Edna Mode had designed a suit with solar batteries with our family specifically in mind. I plan on using that but I'll have to insist on removing the yellow monstrosity of a suit and changed into a black and red design instead. I disconnected a little while later after getting everything I needed and leaving a backdoor to their systems. I printed out my suit design, but without the blueprints for the solar batteries. I plan on modifying Modifying them myself. The back door might be handy someday, who knows. Another week later, Dad finally took us to his costume designer, aptly named Art. Dad introduced us which made Art smile and tease him on having a handful. I saw the pair of yellow suits and focused on the discs that functioned as solar batteries. It somehow reacted to me as I touched it, which was odd. I then noticed Art looking at me weirdly and I just smiled and handed him my costume design. Plus plus Art's POV plus plus. It's been some time since I made another suit, and when I knew it was for Nolan's kids I just had to go the extra mile. They arrived today and I was very surprised by the other one named Robert. He had, a strange glint in his eyes as he looked around and saw the pair of yellow suits I designed. I had made them identical as they were twins, and it usually goes that way. But not with this boy. Mark was your usual newly awakened kid with a naive sense of superheroism. He tried out the costume I designed and asked for a change, which was expected. He still hasn't come up with a name yet so I let him be. This Robert boy, I don't know, somehow he knew exactly what he wanted. He handed me a piece of paper which detailed exact measurements and specific fibers to go with it. I read through them and I was very impressed. When I used them in the order he suggested, I found the resulting costume to be tactical and resilient to wear and tear. It was elastic but didn't seem to cause any sounds as I rubbed it together. Don't you want a mask to go with it? Seems pretty ballsy to not have any. And what's this symbol on the chest? What does it mean? I asked the boy out of curiosity. No thanks, I'm okay with it. Lots of heroes do it. And the symbol is for my hero name. He smiled. Oh and what's that? Better be iconic. I think I'll go with. Sentry he replied with a light chuckle. Sentry, guardian, has nice ring to it. The boy has a gift. I chuckle as well as I began to plan out the changes he proposed. Plus plus back to MCPOV plus plus. My costume arrived on the same day as Mark's, along with a box containing a solar battery disc and its blueprints. I studied the blueprints for a moment and found quite a few things to change. The disc's main function was to store and release solar energy when activated. With the changes and the upgrades to the suit now mapped out, it was time for some unethical means of gaining money. The cost for building the equipment needed was staggering, but with a little hacking anything can be done. And so began a week-long spree of purchases with criminal money, using their accounts to buy stuff and deliver them at unusual locations. Swiping those products and leaving a computerized wet note saying you have failed at being shitty. With the components now set, I just need to find a location for me to set up and I'm good to go. For now the suit will have to do, the upgrades will have to come later. Dad was planning on playing catch with us in the sky. He imparted wisdom on what we must do at times of great importance, no doubt alluding to his duty as a Viltramite sent to Earth. Back then I used to feel wary of him, but recently I've found myself changed. The man was a perfect husband for mom, and even if some of those times were done out of necessity he still held a special place in her heart. And with mom being at her sexual prime, the feelings between them have gotten even richer, and louder, and more obvious, much to our collective discomfort. By the end of the week, there was news coverage over a mysterious hacker group raising hell for the criminals in the city. Enigma.Green has once again left even the criminals filing for lost property as the continued assault on their finances continue till this day. The group left no trace other than the note had cybersecurity experts puzzled and scratching their heads. We go to a live. And then it went on about how childish their actions were and how damaging it is to the honor of some of the biggest businesses around. Childish? Yes but necessary. 
Being random would throw off any investigation and the case won't even merit the demon's interest since it happened to criminals. Though it did send the criminals into a spiral of paranoia and eventual skirmishes, which led to a lot of them being arrested and assets being frozen. Seeing the opportunity, I took it upon myself to siphon all their asset before the death confirmation and transfer all of that into various accounts in overseas accounts. Under various names and organizations, I became a multi-millionaire. A-H-H how neat. Sometime later. Tower Crane. I stood up from my spot at the edge, only a bar separating me from falling a few hundred meters below. The wind blew greatly on me, sending my medium cut hair into a mess of waves. I was wearing my costume. An all black suit with bright red lines crossing at certain parts and a giant S on my chest. The suit fit me perfectly and wasn't at all difficult to wear even in the heat. The sun shining overhead, its rays hitting me directly and filling me with energy. Mark was behind me, smiling as he looked down from the great height we were in. His yellow and blue costume was quite confusing to look at. He wore goggles over his eyes and a mask covering his ears and forehead. Ready yet Rob? In a moment, Mark. I'm basking. That means I'm enjoying the moment I say with a smirk. Ha ha very funny man. I know what it means, you brainiac. We have to hurry if we don't want mom to cook more meatloaf he visual gagged at the thought. His words broke the serene pleasure I got from the sun and replaced it with a horrific dread, as the memories of meatloaf became more haunted just as the years went by. He floated near me and placed an arm around me, plus I plus come on cheer up brother. He then held out his hand, let's face doom together, brother forever. I looked at his hand and shook it while smiling. Same as always then, last one to arrive gets the winner's half of the meatloaf. I slipped from his arm and dropped before flying at top speed towards the house. What? We didn't agree to, oh man. He said pitifully as he flew at top speed, chasing me. Chapter 4, Chapter 3. Plus plus robot POV plus plus. Bridge base. Teen team. I am robot, the leader of the teen team. One of the many superhero teams around the city. I was investigating a series of bombings done in a local mall, when suddenly a security alarm goes off. 2. A local game store broadcasted an automated distress signal and sent a 10 second footage of the incident. I played the video just as my team gathered around. Ah, uh, can't these people give us the night's rest? Who the hell is it now? Rex Splode complained as he tries to wear his costume. Rex stop it, we're nearby and are able to help so we are doing this. Adam Eve replied. 1. Quiet I said. The footage then showed our primary adversary in the recent months, one of the Mahler twins. Let's go. Adam Eve went ahead and flew towards the location showed, while I gathered the rest of the team who can fly in our flying vehicle. Half a minute after Adam Eve had left, I received a call from her. The situation might have changed. I answered the call and she said, Robot, I, I don't know how to say this but Mahler is fighting someone, and they're powerful. We're almost there Adam Eve, stand by. We arrived moments later to an unusual sight of two young men in their pajamas, each were fighting Mahler. The first, the one with stripped pajamas, fought like a newbie. Inexperience was obvious as his moves only seemed to consist of basic punches and kicks. He was even backhanded away a few times, though he was unhurt as far as we could see. The second, the one who wore black fit joggers, was different. His moves seemed to practice despite him not getting any hits in. He would apply just the right push at certain points to strip the force of Mahler strikes. He was experienced in martial arts but not in fighting as he seemed to take on Mahler on his own. Ha, huh? amateurs. Rex Flood explained as he threw a charged BB pellet that exploded on impact, flinging the, the second young man and Mahler away and through a wall. 2. I looked at Rex Flood whose gaze shifted towards the stunned Adam Eve, who was previously stuck staring at both young men as they fought Mahler. 1. I'm suddenly alarmed by high-level energy signature coming from the wall the second went through. I zoomed into that hole and found two glowing red eyes there, its gaze focused in our direction. 1. Things, have become complicated. 2. Plus plus back to MCPOV plus plus. There are a lot of things I could take. Obviously I'm pretty much invulnerable already and I could handle more. The number of things that tick me of is small. Bad mouthing my mom, being insulted by dad, and now being caught in a surprise attack. 2. I had went with Mark on a relaxing fly along the sky, under the pretext of a race. We had not even gone 500 meters from our house when an alarm broke the silence of the night. The local game store was being robbed, and when we arrived we saw one of the Muller twins carrying a large crate filled with game consoles. 2. Mark looked to me and said team up. To which I smiled and nodded. We each took turn fighting Mahler, which was a very enlightening experience. The Mahler twin had enough strength to prove to be a challenge for us. A moment later and I noticed a pink streak of energy fly towards us, with my telescopic vision I saw it was Adam Eve, Mark's future wife and a very powerful superhero. She saw my gaze and stopped midair, which caused me to smirk. 21. I was on my third turn when there was a glowing BB pellet that fell in front of me and exploded, throwing me and Mahler of the sides. I felt my eyes burn from the anger inside the building, I struggled and somehow managed to power it down after a few breaths. I got up to find my brother flying towards the wall I went through. I quickly floated out and looked around, finding Mahler still groaning not far away. 2. Hey, Rob, are you okay? I saw something small fall and explode in front of you. Oh contraire. That was a BB, you do not want to see what I could do with a golf ball. Now, who started it? The show didn't do him justice at all, his voice itself sound very irritating. 1. I said nothing as I flew in front of them and put my hand on the vehicle's head. I'll give you a guess I say as I grab the head and flung them off before throwing it away. Is it normal for superheroes to strike first and ask questions later? Stand down. We are here to assess the situation and deal with it as needed. I hear the robot speak while trying to stop me, I scanned his body to confirm his inorganic nature. It was simply an avatar. Who are you? And why did that dash I pointed towards Rex, fire a charged explosive at my direction? I already know who they are but formalities of course. He proceeded to introduce the team team one by one and said, We apologize for the provocation. The actions of my team are on me, so if you have anyone to be angry at it should be me. I then hear a heavy wind headed my way, so I turned and caught it with my left hand. Mahler's fist was three times larger than mine but was still not able to make me bodge. He tried for his other hand and I still caught it. I then gave him a headbutt which prompted him to spin, giving Mark the chance to deliver a sucker punch that finally knocked him out. 
Two. I looked back to the team team and said, well, the team then focused their glares at Rex which forced him to say, I'm sorry, despite it being forced it was enough. This time anyway, as the tension began to dissipate, the team slowly started to ask question to me and Mark. Mark seemed especially drawn towards Eve who complimented on our costumes. Sorry there wasn't any phone booth nearby, um, do I know you? Mark asked shyly, you know, you both do look familiar. 7. Their other flying vehicle arrive a moment later and duplicate multiplied herself to help robot carry the knocked out Mahler into the thing. I looked at all three of them with my x-ray vision and confirmed that they were indeed biologically the same, one was equal to the other. 10. The girl, S, seemed to have noticed and misunderstood my gaze as they kept sending me sultry looks and flying kisses. To be honest, I would be lying if I said I didn't find it interesting. 5. They all got up to the vehicle and said their goodbyes, Adam Eve waved at us as she flew away with her team. I looked at Mark and found him still looking at their direction, and no doubt focusing on Eve. Oh, Marky's got a crush. Such precious secret. Mom's is going to be thrilled I say while laughing as I floated and flew back. 7. Why you? I wasn't. I'm not. He said as he chased after me. The next day. School. 1. School got a bit more productive with Mark actually managing to find Eve. She seemed pleasantly surprised and was happy to keep our secret when we asked her to. She then invited us to tag along as her team continues to find the other Mahler twin. She took us to a secluded area and began to shift her clothing into her costume. Her powers are really versatile and useful in all situations. Too bad she still holds back. 1. As we changed into our costumes, she asked me why don't you have a mask? I prefer to fight with my face unencumbered, and besides how else am I going to find a superhero girlfriend if I keep my face covered? First impressions are important after all. I reply. 1. She smiled and giggled before finishing her costume change. Mark elbows me and says makes a hey wth dude, face. I apologize and whisper we have a somewhat same face Mark, just be confident and she'll like you. 19. We flew on top of a huge bridge, a huge circular entrance opened up and showed us the inside. Their base was huge enough to accommodate them all in separate bunks. You're late. I removed Mahler's memories from last night and left him close to the store. My hypothesis is he will lead us to his base and hopefully we can figure out what he was going to use those consoles for. Robot finishes his typing right after his words, and then guides us towards their hangar. Dozens of assorted vehicles and parts filled it. I passed by a terminal and inserted a small USB drive. The USB was my version of Trojan virus, undetectable under a certain amount of time and destroys itself once the time is up. Its purpose was to copy and plant a backdoor only I can access to any system it plugs into. Robot's designs are important assets I'd rather not leave uncopied. 8. He sat on one and said I've been tracking from here but we'll need to be on site once he arrives. Let's go. I flew after them. We arrive moments later and subdue the Maulers in their hidden base. I put another USB drive behind one of the site's CPU and proceeded to help them. The fight didn't last long and the twins were taken in. Their projects were left alone until it was cataloged and sorted safely. The USB only needed 15 minutes so that wasn't a problem. The entire operation was done quickly and the global defense agency arrived to an hour later to clear up. I went ahead and excused myself from them, getting an invitation to join their team as I was about to fly away. I need time to consider it. 3. I arrived home to see only mom at the dinner table. He had a half-volume bottle of wine beside her and a full glass of it in her hand. She seemed worried somehow. Mom, what's wrong? She was gulped down the glass before replying. Your father's still not back Rob. I'm just waiting for him. Here. She replied. I'm having a bad feeling about this. Don't worry about it mom dash I sent and sat near her. I'm sure he's just taking care of some mystical sea dragon or underlifting an entire mountain somewhere. I try to appease her worry, while praying that nothing severe will happen. 4. Mark arrives minutes later and saw mom current state. He tried to make her feel better the same as I did. It made her smile while she watches us fumble around, trying our best to keep her mood up. There was a swoosh a moment later and dad arrived just in time. His costume ripped to shreds and pieces of sea kelp stuck between his armpits. Sorry. Had to deal with a revolt against Aquarius in Atlantis, got some really stick kelp out of it though. I'm told it's the best kind of kelp out there. Dad said with a smile. Mom finally looked up and practically jumped into his arms and began kissing him fiercely. 2. Um, Debbie, the kids are still dash his words cut short by mom's shouting out now, both of you. Mark and I immediately took the opportunity to escape and wandered separately for a bit. We knew what our parents were doing of course. We're already teens now. Chapter 5, Chapter 4. The next day was spent helping Robot find the cause of the bombings. He pieced together enough evidence to find the connection between all of them, our school. The students who were missing were somehow being made into suicide bombers, but that question was who did it and why. 1. I helped Robot with his investigation and suggested that maybe a member of the staff was responsible, someone with enough history on bomb making. The hint seemed to have triggered a brilliant moment for Robot as he almost instantly got the culprit, one Mr. David Hiles, our school's physics teacher. Mark and Eve quickly apprehended the guy and saved the other student he had strapped on his operating stand. Mark shared some terrible fact about David. He was doing it to take revenge against children that spend too much time at the mall, parties, drinking alcohol, and play sports when they should be studying and doing homework. Saving him would only make more suffer so I'm glad Mark couldn't save him. Mark and I had both agreed to just stay outside but still loyal friends to the team. Mark and Eve's relationship is, slow. Mark was shy and Eve was dating that toolbag Rex Splode. They also had a bit of history together which makes things harder for Mark but not impossible. However, I choose to separate myself whenever the two meet up. I can't jeopardize their future and the future of my nieces and nephews simply by being around. 25. Later. With nothing else to do, I decided to finally fully upgrade my suit. I had ordered about 15 sets for it just in case it goes wrong. I moved them all to an undisclosed location I had bought near Rockbound Lake. It was an abandoned rock mine that still had a functional tunnel system, prone to quakes and leaks which made its price even lower. I bought it and took a few hours renovating and reinforcing the tunnels and spent a night digging out a cave big enough to serve as my science room. 3. It took me a total of 4 days to finish it and finally collapsed 10 meters of the entrance to ensure it's closed. I insulated and installed panels on important sections to keep the entire structure sturdy enough for me to renovate. Looking at the map, I decide to let the groundwork be done mechanically. So I built the robots that the Mullers have been working on. The processors needed were simple to find and I enhanced their capabilities to continue maintaining a sense of clean when I'm not around. 2. 
I had built around five of them, each with different tasks that given them directives to do. I also installed some rechargeable power generators. I decide on adding a command line to have them charge automatically under a certain battery level, and another to have them shut down and send an alarm to my phone should the directives be accomplished. It took the next day to finish setting up a communication systems and another to set up the bare bones of the teleportation system used by Cecil himself. It will give me the ability to teleport in and out without leaving a trace. 2. I can't get it to work yet as I need an advanced satellite and a large enough power source to cover its functions but still it's important to have it ready in case I run into one. As such my week of moving and renovations finally came to stop, the lab worked just enough for me to tinker. It was the kind of work that required one to use all of 24 hours to do, even with a super intelligent mind and Kryptonian physique. But when I finished I marveled at my work. And after 24 hours of work, my cybernetic suit was complete. Made with a mix of materials to eliminate any sound from movement and embedded with enhanced cloaking and solar battery. Giving me the ability to camouflage myself even in high-speed movement and a second life in the form of a solar jumpstart battery to pump my cells full of life. 2. It wasn't without its failures. I spent over $3.5 million worth of components in trail and error test, and over three sets of costumes gone. 2. But it was worth it. And now that I have the proper way of doing it, I won't have to spend that much. But that's a task for tomorrow and I need to sleep of the mental fatigue, so I went home. The next day, as the morning light shined upon my now awake form, I began to feel myself being energized and more active. The perks of having a Kryptonian physiology no doubt. 5. The day started normally, breakfast then school and then finally lunch. But what made it worrying was the fact that mom had sent me a worrying text, dad had yet to arrive, despite being away for almost a day. It's still midday when I called up Mark and told him the situation. Mark initially shrugged it off, believing that he somehow got stuck somewhere and will be back. Like he sometimes does, which made me feel a little bit better. 2. All that came crashing down when an unknown number called both our phones at the same time. Mark looked to me as we held our phones and answered. Hello boys, I'm Cecil Stedman, director of the GDA. I have news about your father, and the reason why he was late. The voice on the other line said gravely, Go home and I'll take you all to see him and then the line went dead. We both flew back at our top speeds and saw three black cars and our mother waiting for us outside. I scanned the cars and found them to be heavily reinforced and guarded by a squad of cloaked soldier, both inside and out. An unassuming bespectacled man opened the door and ushered us inside. The car then hummed as it ran us towards our destination. 2. Pentagon. GDA secret headquarters. We were taken into an elevator that went down, an endless number of floor indicated by the long list of virtual buttons. Nolan's receiving the absolute pinnacle of care here. The unassuming man goes on a monologue about how grand and important the GDA was. We went through guarded and high-tech corridor as he guided us to our dad's room. 7. We arrived at the door as Donald opened the door, the other side of it revealed a heavily beaten and bandaged Nolan Grayson. Mom and Mark rushed in to check on him, while I slowly entered the room silently taking in what this all means. Quite thinking to myself this can't be true. 8. Who did this? Mark finally asked, clearly angry at seeing our father in this state. We have no idea dash a voice I recognized answered just left of me, not yet anyway, but when we do they will look a hell of a lot worse than your dad over there. You're Cecil Stedman, Director Stedman. I looked to my left to see a balding grayish blonde haired man in a plain suit. The other side of his face feared a huge scar that seemed more like roots under skin than dead skin. Yes, we talked on the phone, and both of you must be the Grayson twins dash his gaze moved from both of us then to our mother. Deborah, I'm so sorry. How dare you dash she was about to say when Cecil interrupted. Someone murdered the Guardians last night. All of them. Torn and beaten to death, we tried to revive everyone the best we could bet. Cecil seemed to grit his teeth at the reminder of what they couldn't do. Nolan was the only one who survived and with time, the only one who can point out who killed them. His words sent a chill to my spine, a brutal confirmation. Dad, no, Nolan actually did it. He killed the Guardians, all except for one I suppose. Including Mr. Immortal, I asked. 11. Yes, him included. Look there's a lot of question marks in this case and only your father can answer some if not all of them. We have our theories on what happened, but I'm not comfortable casting out possibilities just yet. We kept this under wraps for now but the media will soon notice their absence. Mom shed a few tears from hearing his words and composed herself. She suddenly sent out a few demands and firmly declared herself staying inside his room until he recovers. Cecil and Donald tried to protest but, Mom has her way of making even the strongest of men bend the knee to her, so after a fierce standoff they relented and accommodated her. 3. We were then brought home, Mark, and me. We were silent along the way, I was thinking about adjusting my plans now that the flow of events took an unexpected turn while Mark was quietly digesting the feeling of weakness over being unable to do anything. 5. We just entered the threshold of the house when Cecil rang our phones once more, only this time he needed help. Listen kids, we need backup downtown. Hostels are pouring out of some kind of portal. There are dozens of them and armed to the teeth. We're a little understaffed with heroes now so you guys are the only ones we can turn to for help his text read. Mark already flew to his room and changed into his suit, which prompted me to do the same. Luckily I had managed to bring my upgraded suit. I heard Mark fly over at top speed hurrying towards the location. I let him have go first while I suit up and review my knowledge of the Flaxons. An advanced species from a dimension that ages extremely fast compared to our own. They fight quickly and come back stronger every time due to the time difference. It doesn't sound like much but I am interested. Perhaps their technology could boost my own, if I took the step inside and do what Nolan did in the TV show and wiped them all out. Hmm, a problem for later, I'm sure an opportunity will show itself. 4. With my suit ready I start to fly after Mark and follow the line of smoke and the sound of explosions, I arrive a moment later to find Mark still hovering over the scene even as the flaxons start decimating everything around them. I stopped in front of him and grabbed his head, Mark, stay focused and think, more people will die if you keep waiting, so calm, down. 4. He snapped out of his thoughts and looked at me with unsure eyes. Okay brother, just like we always do, let's take turns, I'll fight first while you get anything big enough to use as cover for the civilians. Okay, Mark, he understands and nods before flying off. 5. Well dash I say as I conjured my TTK and form an aura around my fists, here comes sentry. I say as I flew myself just above the armies marching out of the portal and dropped straight down. 
I charged up my TTK and covered my whole body in a field. My fall causes a gigantic shockwave that flattened all flaxons within 10 feet and knocked away everything else. The flaxons who were far away started firing their energy weapons at me. Their tanks turned and focused their fire upon my still grounded form. I quickly found out another weakness of TTK. I don't have a reliable way to defend against energy based attacks. As soon as the energy made contact, I was flung to the side. It didn't hurt but it was enough to push even me back. After assessing my surroundings and situation, I pulled the nearest soldier into my grasp and read through his thoughts, while learning his entire language. I let go of him but still hold him overhead with my telekinesis as I began to walk out of the crater. I pulled all the bodies around and lined them in front of me, their damaged forms dragging across the ground leaving a trail of blood. I slowly walk out of the crater as they watched, while speaking their native tongue perfectly you never should set foot on this dimension. Chapter 6, Chapter 5 The army of Flaxons were still staring at my direction, blank expressions on their faces as they just stood where they were. One Flaxon who seemed to be their commander shouted what are you F Pyro S doing? Shot at him now. The Flaxon soldiers snapped out of their collective stupor and began to open fire. Their shots raining down on the line of bodies, each impact scrambling the bodies even more. I jumped over the line of corpses with a flip and landed in the middle of their group, stomping my powered right foot to the ground. The impact sending a shockwave of red energy that passed through every soldier, stopping them from their actions. A technique I created that momentarily messes with motor functions. 1. Then I flew towards a tank, sinking my entire form into its metallic shell and going right through its other side. I flipped over the damaged tank to cover me from the rain of fire and kicked it forward, mowing down an entire flank on its way before colliding with another tank, exploding as a result. I hear the Flaxen leader shout more orders and insults as the situation continued to turn dire for them. He commandeered a more sophisticated looking tank and threw the Flaxen piloting it before firing at me. I managed to pull a small pile of bodies to cover me but it wasn't enough. It went through and blasted me through a bus mark had moved earlier to cover the civilians. Ah, uh, no 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 please no please, as I tried to get up I heard a trembling voice shout. I looked to its source to find Mark inside a small crater with a badly disfigured corpse of an older woman in his arms. The Flaxen leader heard the shouting and aimed its next attack at Mark. Mark was still distracted by the body so I flew in to take the blast instead. The Flaxen fired and just as it was about to reach us a pink sheet of energy rose and deflected the shot towards a nearby building. Adam Eve landed just in front of us and said I don't know who you are, but you need to go. Two. A moment later the team team arrived and quickly acted to suppress the situation. Robot gave clear and concise orders that quickly took care of the situation at hand. I looked to my brother, worried that he might suffer more if he stays shocked. I grabbed his shoulder and felt the blood that was stuck on it. It was still warm, still fresh, an intense feeling of dread and sorrow started to rise up. I struggled to find clarity and after a few breaths was calm enough to tell him, Invincible, take her to a hospital I'll handle the rest here with the team. Mark mumbles some incoherent slur, now. I shouted trying to snap him out of it. Go Mark, we'll handle it from here. Eve floats near us and reassures Mark, and also herself. I look around and the situation was desperate. We were surrounded and had no avenue for escape with those tanks primed at us. I see him still confused but readily carries the old woman and flies away. Good, now to let loose. I flew and covered myself in a force field, strands of red energy cackle all around me and producing a thin membrane. I powered up my heat vision, ready to decimate the invading flaxons. Robot, get your team together and gather in the hole now. I shouted at him. Robot was confused by the request and looked to me, his gaze stopped in my eyes. Plus plus robot POV plus plus. The situation was dire. I looked at Invincible's twin to clarify his request, yet all I saw was a pair of burning bright red eyes. My visor reported dangerous heat levels from them and spent multiple warnings. Asterisk danger, danger, extreme temperature spike imminent, asterisk. I hurriedly called the team over and gathered ourselves in the hole. Rex was the slowest of us as he questioned everything that was happening. Eve put a force field on the crater under my orders. And just as she finished it, the pink energy of Adam Eve turned red. Plus plus back to MCPOV plus plus. With the team secured, I could finally let loose. I released the energy building up behind my eyes and destroyed the entire Flaxen army. 4. I burned Flaxen tanks, barricades, soldiers, and corpses until only ashes were left of them. The only things I left are was the tank the Flaxen leader sat on and a pieces of limb from Flaxen bodies. He closed his eyes as my heat vision glowed too brightly and when he opened them once more, he found nothing but the charred remains of his machines and me, still floating, coated in red cackling energy. 4. Out of fury, the Flaxen leader aimed and fired at me once more. I easily dodged the shot and flew in front of his glass shield. As I drew my fist to punch I noticed the color of his skin start to pale. Rust began to rapidly form all over this tank and soon the tank broke down. The glass broke like thin paper and the Flaxen leader began to crawl back to the portal that brought him here. I let him crawl until he was nearly a few feet away, then I landed right beside him and lifted him by his antennae. Better luck next time Flaxen I say to him in Flaxen. He struggled heavily and slowly, his was filled with fury and rage while it locked eyes on me. 1. I closed my left eye and burned his left with my right. The Flaxen muffled his screams, unwilling to acknowledge the humiliation. I stop and admire my work before throwing him into the portal. He sent me one last furious side glance before disappearing. The portal closed just after he entered. 2. I flew back down and went to see the situation of the team. Adam Eve had placed a pretty dense force barrier around the hole. I knocked on it a few times and it disappeared, as one by one the team slowly came back up and observed the surroundings with wide eyes. Why you killed them all? What the hell man? Rex exclaimed in fear while reaching out for his bag of ammunition. Relax Rex, do you see that? I pointed at the still rusting tank. The leader rapidly aged somehow and his tank rusted just as quickly. It was almost like watching a video on 6x the speed. Robot flew towards the tank and analyzed it for a bit before saying, rusted and increasingly corroding, for an alloy like that should take years. He then went beside an unburned corpse of a flaxen and said cell activity is abnormally high, it almost as if dash. They're aging to death I finished. Time runs faster, wherever they come from dash, I then received a missed call from mom. Sorry gotta go check on Mark. I took off at top speed towards the GDA headquarters. Plus plus Adam Eve POV plus plus. We all saw Robert fly off, silently thinking about what just happened. Okay, is no one gonna talk about how, H how insanely dangerous that guy was? I mean look at that dash he pointed at the scorched road what the hell is he? Rex, calm down. Duplicate 1 replied. 
He's not an evil guy, he saved our asses, K2 added. And he has a cute ass too. Rar, he he K3 finalized and giggled. 8. All right. Both of you cut it out dash I said, eagerly trying to shift the conversation. What matters is he helped us and risked facing all of them by himself. I consider that a good guy, right robot? I looked to robot as he was curiously looking around. He suddenly knelt down and rubbed a finger in the road and rubbed it. Um, robot. Strange, no biological matter left at all, only ashes he said. The words sent a chill down my spine, and made me wonder will Mark be able to do that too? So I'm right? Right? He's a danger. Rex asked in a panicked voice. Uncertain. Were his last words before the GDA rolled in and asked us all for a briefing. Plus plus back to MCPOV plus plus. I rushed into the base and just as I entered its main hospital ward, a dozen cloaked and armed guards stopped me. It was ridiculous but a necessary precaution. When they were all given the all clear they pointed towards a trail of bloody footprints, the trail ending inside Nolan's room. I opened it and found mom hugging the bloodied Mark, trying to console him. It was a bit of a surprise actually, of the two of us Mark was always the positive one. The only one who smiled even if he was hurt. But now seeing him like this, dispirited and brought so low, it hurts just seeing him go through it. 3. Mom noticed my presence first and pulled me into their hug. She reassured us that everything will be okay. The next day, Mark decided to go to school while I decided to take the day off. Besides, being absent for a day doesn't affect my perfect grades that much. 3. I went back to my secret base and made another batch of 5 robots, to accelerate the modernization of my base and start on building more things. I revised my plans for the rooms to accommodate some future tech I want to own. The Flaxen fight yesterday really opened my eyes on how advanced they were. Obviously their weapons don't pose much of a threat to me but their portal tech intrigued me. Thinking back on the show and the comics, the Flaxens have a high possibility of coming back with more advanced weaponry than before. And with my influence I'm very sure that they'll have something made to neutralize me. 5. I tinkered with my suit batteries while pondering on a viable option to fill in my lack of more advanced tech. I lost myself to my work, trying to increase the capacity of each battery and making it more micro-sized. I was about to move on to drawing plans for specific rooms for the base when my phone rang. I looked to the screen to see it's a video call from Mark, I answered it and immediately saw him flying with Eve in their costumes. Rob, finally you answered? I'm patching you to robot dash Mark's words stopped as another took over his audio. Rob try get TYCH Flax robot's voice was chappy, I had established an intricate comms jammer. It catches specific phone frequencies that direct it to my phone and analyzes them for access, access I only set for my family. Cecil cut off the call and seconds later I received a message from Mark saying robot said it's important, meet us at the bridge. I was surprised, that was earlier than I expected. But then again, robot was a genius. I went to a computer station to access the team's database, and sure enough robot had built a tachyon detector. I copied the blueprints for it to research later and flew off towards the bridge. The bridge. I arrived just as Mark was being taunted by Rex Explode. He then Frenched Eve in front of him. I couldn't see Mark's face but I know he must feel pretty jealous right now. I landed myself just behind Mark, Rex's eyes shifted to mine. I made my eyes flash red, making Rex jump away in fear with both hands held up to cover his face. The action made me chuckle silently. 4. Rex tried to tell the team about my bullying but no one wanted to believe him. Robot then interjected and explained his tachyon scanner, an early warning device in case the flaxons came again. Mark's phone rang as he was busy figuring out which duplicate was the prime one, he excused himself and answered. The caller informed Mark that the old woman he saved was now awake, and she wanted to see us. We said our goodbyes to the team and flew to the GDA, all the way to her door. A beautiful black-haired girl about our age opened the door before we can knock and ushered us inside, not noticing the name card outside saying, Maya Troy. Chapter 7, Chapter 6 Mark rushed towards the bed, where the old woman was being supported to keep her alive. The girl was now to her side, looking at her with concern. I, for the first time in my life, found myself unable to take my eyes away from her. She wore a dark leather jacket, a red shirt, brown leather-heeled boots, and a black belt keeping her tight jeans in place. Her outfit was eye-catching enough, but it was her face that drew me in. In simple words, she looked just like a younger, wonder woman. 2. Hello miss. I don't believe we've introduced ourselves, I'm called Sentry and he dash I point at Mark is my brother invincible. May I know who you are? 3. What am I doing? I thought to myself, trying not to cringe. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, I was just a bit worried. She woke up a while ago and went to sleep just as I told the doctors. I'm Donna, Donna Troy she stood up and smiled. 10. My heart skipped a beat and a chill went up to my spine. It was, a weird thing to feel, to say the least. Donna Troy, I remember her, she's part of the Titans, can't be. 9. Nice to meet you, Miss Troy. Just Donna, please. Well, Donna, you are very brave to be here to support your friend at difficult times. You must have been very close. Yes, we are Donna replies with a sad look on her face as she watches Maya. Donna, may I ask how you're related to her? Oh, um, she's my SI dash she seemingly choked for a bit before continuing, mother. She's my mother. 1. Hmm. I look at the old woman, obviously seeing no resemblance. She must have been quite the beautiful woman when she was young. Why do you say that? She curiously asked. Because you are the most beautiful girl I have ever dash I stop, albeit too late. She's gonna think I'm a creep. 5. I I mean you are very caring towards your mother. I wish I was more like you. I slowly look back to see her wide-eyed, a tinge of blush started on her cheek. Ahem, Mark, who was behind me, cleared his throat. Sentry, read the room. He whispered. I try hard not to cringe and say, I, I apologize Donna. I'm, was being weird. I hope you can forgive me. 1. Cough cough, do Donna. A slow voice asked. The older woman had woken up. She later introduced herself as Maya, after being reassured by Donna's presence, and expressed her thanks to us, calling us her young knights. She then asked for some private time with her so we exited the room. Plus plus Donna POV plus plus. Sentry. I thought to myself at the cute guy who awkwardly blurted out that embarrassing compliment. He hasn't talked to a lot of women before. 
Didana. Maya said weakly. Yes, Maya. I'm here. You're going to be fine now. And no. Donna, listen. I think. I think I'm not gonna make it. I need you to do something for me. She stuttered, struggling between breathing and talking. See, continue the legacy of War Woman, of your mother. The world of man needs an Amazonian, as one of its main protectors. The older woman straightened and strained. 8. I realize what she was trying to do. She wants me to take over mother. Even after she just died not so long ago. I need dash. I, I know. You need time to consider. I have stood with your family long before you were even born. And even, your mother has done the same at first. It proves how seriously you take this responsibility. Maya nodded weakly. She paused, letting the moment last as she just stared at me. Before. Now, let's talk about that idiot boy who thinks you're beautiful. She said with a conniving smile. 3. I, your mother, must tell you a few things you've missed since last you visited here. Maya. I stood up exasperated. Despite saying that she's not long for this world, her behavior showed otherwise. Plus plus MCPOV plus plus. Mark and I sat just a few benches from the room, even with our hearing we could only hear muffled laughter and shouting. Cecil is quite prepared for everything. 5. Mark suddenly elbows me and says Rob, are you seriously hitting on a girl whose mother just survived a horrible accident? Come on Mark seriously? You're getting some sweet moments with a girl who, mind you, already has a boyfriend. I think my weird timing is less offensive than yours. I defended myself. 3. He just stared at me for a full minute before quietly sitting back. I have to admit though dash Mark suddenly spoke she is beautiful. Not Eve level beautiful but still beautiful. As I looked at him I found him looking back with both brows raised and a sly smile on his face. Sigh. Mark. Slightly cringing at his poor attempt at humor. The room door opens and Donna came out of it. She was smiling now. The talk was much lighter than I thought. She moved towards us. I met her halfway and stopped just as we reached each other. Ahem. Hey. So, um. How was it? Is she okay? Are you okay? I say somewhat nervously. I almost want to facepalm myself. What is wrong with me today? 2. She looked stunned for a moment and smiled. I'm okay Sentry, thank you for asking. Donna, if you feel the need to talk about it then please don't hesitate to I was in the process of trying to find a pen and paper when I was stopped. 5. Gasp. She closes in on me and hugs me, silencing me and surprising Mark behind me. Her head rested on my chest for a moment before she looked at me. You're very sweet, Sentry. Thank you dash she smiled at me and lightly kissed my cheek. Gasp. Mark once again gasped behind me, albeit a bit exaggerated than before. I'm gonna kill you, Mark. 3. She broke away and lightly chuckled before walking past us. I watched as her hair swung left and right so elegantly, and her ass, I mean form was quite a sight to behold. 11. She walked up to the elevator everyone had used to get in and out of the place and pressed a button. She looked at me once more with a smile and waved her hand goodbye. 1. I waved mine in reply as the elevator door closed and she went up, by herself. Oh, should I have guided her out? Ahem, Mark's throat clearing snapped me out of my daydream, aren't you forgetting something? What? I asked, very confused as to what else I did without much thought. Oh, okay, mister if you need to talk about it literally forgot about giving dash Mark sarcastically explained as I realized. My number. I flew at blinding speeds towards the nurse's station to find a paper and pen to write on. I found one and not a moment later finished writing my number on it, and flew towards the elevator doors. The sign above it indicated it's still ongoing, which made me hesitate for a moment. She will find it weird if I just punch my way into her elevator. I put both hands on the elevator door and just stood there trying to come up with ways to give her my number. Tisk, 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 that sad man. Opportunity wasted. Mark commented behind me, but more importantly Rob, robot called in. He wants to talk to you in their bridge base. I gave Mark a deadpan look and said Mark, brother, let me punch you. Right. Mark slowly floated backwards and flew away. 2. Why didn't you tell you me, you dash I flew after him. Plus plus Donna POV plus plus. He is cute, and very sweet I smiled while thinking about Sentry's nervous questions. I appreciated his offer for counsel but this was something I needed to handle on my own. He didn't give me his number though, well, maybe we'll meet soon. I hope the thought made me smile. 2. I was nearly on the ground floor when I was whisked away from where I was. The high-tech elevator changed into a beautiful forest overlooking the sea. I was standing on a building made with ancient architecture and a small ivory platform inlaid with a runic script. A tall woman with blonde hair and leather armor had her hands held upwards, traces of magical essence spread across them. 1. I immediately realized what was going on. I was inside a government facility, Mel. I just visited my sworn sister on Man's World for goodness sake. As I have insisted many times, it's Melasa. And your sworn sister is old by now, she won't need your constant annoyance. Mel held a slight smile before it disappeared. Your Highness, the Queen needs your answer sooner. Urgently. Mel replied with a hint of worry. No, I will not be pressured and pushed into something I'm not even sure I want. Your Highness, please? Your mother is gone, the circumstances around her death are unknown to all but the Queen herself. She has advised in starting your training now, with or without your taking of your mother's mantle. Mel insisted. I love my mother but I also love my freedom. Tell the Queen that I am not ready for the mantle just yet. I need time to grieve Mel. Surely both of you will understand that. I do your highness. I have lost many sisters during the dark times, when we were still part of man's world. And as much as I am bound to my sister's right of burial, so too am I bound to my queen orders. So please, forgive me. Melosa words drifted as she held up a hand towards me. 1. A flash of magic later and I was unconscious. Plus plus queen Penthesilea POV plus plus. Everything is ready. My daughter has been slaughtered by someone she didn't expect. Someone she thought she could trust. I saw it, her last moments. The last face she ever saw before dying. A being they hailed as their strongest superhero. He was strong, too strong. I had believed he was a good match for my daughter, that their offspring will be the most powerful one born on Earth. But, needless to say, he no longer is a good choice. In all my years here on Paradise Island, I have never imagined my daughter's death. We were unaging as a people, but never truly immortal. Only the gods are. I will not let my daughter's death be in vain. I will put everything on the line to avenge her, and to kill everything that man holds dear. 3. Bang. The main door opened to my chambers was opened, and what greeted me angered me but I held it in. My granddaughter, Donna, was unconscious. Two of her fellow Amazonians held her aloft while Melasa walked ahead. They bowed as got near, and Melasa spoke. My queen, her highness was, unwilling. 
I had to resort to other methods to get her here her words nearly made me chuckle. Always so headstrong, much like her mother. Put her down by the bed over there and leave us. They left shortly after gently placing her on my bed. I walked to her side and traced my hands on her face. I gave Melausa a look and she dispelled her spell on my Donna, before swiftly exiting. Donna shoots up and looks around until her eyes stopped at me. Grandmother, why are you doing this? Oh, sweet Donna. I moved forward and gave her a light kiss on her forehead. You need to be ready. Your mother's killer is closer than you might think. I heard from Mel, I thought it was a lie. Tell me, who is it, grandmother, who killed my mother? Donna asked. Oh, how I wanted to tell her, but she's not ready, not yet. He would kill her instantly, and I can bear losing another of my family. Not again. One. Hush my sweet. I will tell you in due time, just know that he is very powerful, ruthless, and dangerous. Donna tried to protest but that was easy to solve. She was a stubborn girl, but she still headed my words dearly. Soon my sweet. We will avenge your mother, and kill Omni-Man. Chapter 8. Chapter 7. Plus plus robot POV plus plus. It has been three days since I sent a message to Invincible, I needed to closely examine his twin. I had been reviewing Sentry's combat data, in an attempt to test his viability for the project. Which ironically, comprised of two videos and a myriad of photos of him and Invincible flying. From what little I could gather, he seems to have all the same powers as his twin, Invincible. Superhuman physical capabilities and flight, but Sentry has exhibited the ability to create extremely powerful bursts of heat. And I feel that he's still holding back, given his toying of a Mahler twin when we first met. A blood sample might help answer what other secrets he's still hiding. But that would be difficult, as he also seems to have the same if not more powerful durability than his twin. All the more reason for me to. Beep, beep. An emergency broadcast from Cecil and an alert from my tachyon detector. Another Flaxen incursion. Robot, there's a situation downtown. Three portals just opened up and Flaxen troops are marching down the streets as we speak. Get your team together. Now, Cecil threw a fit as he explained and instantly cut contact once done. I immediately opened the team's communications channel and sent out an urgent call to action. Adam Eve lived with her parents, while Invincible and his twin were on their way here. Luckily for me, Rex and Duplicate were nearby. I marched towards their separate quarters only to find both empty, odd. I searched for a few moments before deciding to respond ahead of them. Searching for absent teammates is a waste of precious time. I went back to the hangar and found both of them there, waiting for me. Duplicate had faint markings on her neck, which urged me to do a quick biological scan. My combat calculations needed accurate data to ensure accuracy in determining chances for success. I was surprised at the shocking results. The markings on her neck matched Rex's teeth composition and molar arrangement. There were also traces of a very specific type of biological residue on her mouth and lips. I had not said a word as there were more important matters to attend to, so I activated our transport vehicle and went off along with both of them. Proximity must be a primal cause. Or maybe Rex's attitude towards life is somehow attractive to females all over. Curious. Plus plus MCPOV plus plus. Mark and I were flying towards the bridge when Robot sent another message. Another attack was happening somewhere downtown. A massive one judging from the number of portals that were opened. We immediately diverted and headed towards the location, which wasn't hard as the smoke and explosions were getting more and more obvious as we flew closer. Invincible. A voice behind us called out to Mark. We momentarily stop and look back, seeing Eve waving at us in midair. Mark smiled and waved back, Eve got near us and we flew together. As I observed their interactions, I noticed that Eve seemed to smile a lot more as she talks with Mark, having entirely forgotten me. Watching them made me remember Donna, and cringe at my awkwardness. I wonder where she is now. We landed a few moments later atop a building where the rest of the team team was on. Ah, where are you guys coming from? The idiot sounding Rex Splode asked as we landed. We met along the way, Rex Eve replied. Oh really? What else? Do you guys to the same school too? Rex, I don't even know anymore. Yeah, we do actually Mark calmly replied. Must be nice. Do you know who didn't get to go to school? Me. Rex said disapprovingly. I got tired of listening so I flew over him and landed near the edge. Robot and Duplicate were observing the situation ahead. I used my telescopic vision to get a clear picture. The Flaxen emerged with more sophisticated looking weaponry and even bigger tanks. I noticed a few modifications and a few boxes being carted around. Certain Flaxen soldiers had a device hidden behind them, I'm guessing their portal device. And all of them have wristbands. They seem to have developed, and look extremely prepared for a confrontation. What makes you say that? Robot asked. Their dimension's natural time flow is distinct from ours, they may have spent a lot of time planning. It's a guess at most but being aware might give us an edge, what do you think robot? Your logic is sound. It will lessen the risk of failure if we observe for a while he called the rest over and began to explain our course of action. What? Robot? The people there dash Eve was expectedly concerned. The civilians have been evacuated early because of my device. We have the all clear from Cecil himself to engage at full capacity robot answered before she could finish. Eve sighed in relief and went along with our plan to wait and observe. A few minutes later, the Flaxons remained in their fit state. It seems that they've found a way to counteract the effects of the time flow difference, just as we suspected. The cause of this requires examination of a Flaxon robot concluded. W.A. Wait wait, you mean they did all that in three days? Rex was flabbergasted. Three days for us, but perhaps decades for them robot replied as he moved forward to meet their flying vehicle and hopped on the driver's seat. Oof, who cares? I bet their bones still break. Duplicate commented as she hopped on. So does mine? Ever think of that? Rex commented. Regardless, you guys have to be careful. They might have devices aimed at disabling us, so watch out for each other I say before they flew down. I started floating and looked at Mark, waiting. Huh. He seemed dazed. Ready for this. Eve asked gently, putting her hand on his shoulder. Yeah, I think so. Mark replied and we all flew after them. I look at them fly down and focused my sight on the portals, trying to find that particular flaxen I burned. I found him a moment later, the scar on his face still present and a scowl was on his face. He wore a different kind of armor, one that had components finely fitted and connected to a set of gauntlets on his hands. He was commanding the rest of his troops to quickly subdue the others and spread out into the city, which was not going to happen. Not on my watch. Bang! I flew and touched down heavily just a few meters from the leader, encircled by flaxen troops and tanks. My eyes flickered red intensely as I prepared to shoot. Welcome back, to your hell. Plus plus flaxen leader POV plus plus. The scourge is back. 
and he delivered himself into my grasp, eyes brimming with intense red energy. My nightmares were coming true once more, the sight of my armies burning to ashes was not easy to forget. I was unprepared for what happened before, but not now. I have spent decades pressuring our scientists to develop a way to subdue him, and they have delivered. Stop. I commanded the army around me to give way. I will handle the scourge myself, go keep attacking. Ha, funny I hear the scourge speaking my tongue in mockery. Then his red beam shot out. Zape. My troops were cut in ways I only saw in sword battles, some were bisected while some lost their heads in the process. But all the lives that the beam passed through were either dead or burning. No, no, I activated the armor and ran towards the beam's next target. The beam drew close until it finally hit me and... Pang, the beam was absorbed, IT works, scourge, prepare to meet your end. Plus plus MCPOV plus plus. I can't believe it. They built an energy absorbing device that's capable of rendering an energy attack obsolete. I watched in fascination as the device redirected the beam before it could make contact. The chest plate of the flaxen glowed increasingly, so I decided to stop it. To see how it goes. The chest plate kept its glow for a few seconds before returning to normal. The components on his arm seemed to channel the energy into his gauntlets. Open fire on him, now. The flaxen spoke to the others and they immediately obeyed. The lasers didn't do much damage so I just stood there, watching the tank slowly turned and aimed. The leader then held both hands out towards me and blasted me with a massive beam of red energy. The tanks fired at the same time, as well as the others. Zop, I was blown away and was hurt at the attempt. The custom I so tediously upgraded was being burned away, the skin that made contact with the energy slowly heated up. Crash God, I was driven towards the inside of a building, a deep hold was dug around me. I checked myself and found that I had actual small bruises on me. For the first time in years, I was hurt. Albeit only slightly, still, it was enough to reinforce my plans for the future. I slowly got up, slightly chuckling at the irony. My wounds slowly healed. I didn't think they would certainly build a countermeasure for me. Boom, I said no. Mark's voice boomed loudly over the streets, sending a shockwave that flung the flaxens off their feet. Whoosh, seeing the opportunity, I rushed towards the leader and grasped his throat, before pinning him on a wall far away from his army. I ripped off his chest plate and gauntlets, and hid them somewhere I'll be able to retrieve unseen later. Whoosh, Mark flew behind me and held out a hand, signaling me to give the flaxen to him. I look at the one-eyed flaxen in my grasp and tapped his head for a moment, getting as much information as I can about their homeland and this new tech. When I was done I simply turned, the flaxen straining to be free from my grasp. I held him in Mark's direction and told him, hmm, it's a very bad day to be you, in flaxen before throwing him. Boom, Mark immediately caught the flaxen and slammed him down, a huge impression on the ground formed as from the impact. Mark mounted the flaxen and began to beat it up. Spark. There was a small spark as the flaxen was being beaten up, I checked and found that his wristband was destroyed. The beaten face of the one-eyes flaxen began to sag and darken, which made me remember to remind them of this weakness. Mark, that's enough. We have to help the team. The guy's already half dead I put a hand on his shoulder and gave him a little shake. I thought for a quick minute before flying over to Robot. Robot it's their wristbands. Something to do with their staying young. I went near a flaxen and gripped its wristband. I gave it a slight squeeze and it broke into a thousand pieces. The flaxen slowly aged in front of the team. Robot quickly incapacitated one and scanned its wristband. Give me a few seconds to work on this. Protect me. He ordered and the team moved. Mark and I helped guard Robot and cover their backs. A few seconds later Robot emitted a sonic blast that broke every wristband within the area. Ping. The entire army quickly aged rapidly, their skin turning darker and face started sagging. They all dropped their weapons and quickly made their way to the portals. The two portals closed, leaving one still open as they dragged the still alive one-eyed flax into it. He faced us and specifically looked at me and said I'll be back scourge. His voice was weak. Whoosh. Right as they were about to walk in, I flew and grabbed the leader and the ones holding him out. I ripped the antennae from the helpers and held them prone using telekinesis, then faced their leader. I know you'll be back dash I stepped forward and held up the flaxen. I moved my mouth near his ear and said and I hope you will because next time, if you're enough to put up a decent fight, I'll give you a reward myself. But for now, I finish and proceeded to break and rip off both his arms. Screams bones breaking. No, you, A-H-H. Willa, the flaxen flailed and tried to stop my actions in vain. I cauterized the damage with heat vision and threw him into the portal. I grabbed the head of the other two and twisted it, before throwing them into the portal. It closed a second after the last body went through. Sigh. I heaved a sigh, relieved at finally ending their incursion. What I did may be cruel to look at, but it was necessary. Chapter 9, Chapter 8. MCPOV. I flew back to the team, the shock on their faces was obvious along with duplicate's eye fluttering as she met mine. Behind her were numerous parts and bodies of her dead duplicates, each death more gruesome than the other. I was always amazed at how she manages to cope with seeing her elves die. Sentry, why you could do that? Since when? Mark floated near me and asked. It was something new actually. When they first attacked I felt my eyes grow hotter as I feel angrier. And when I let go of that, well it's as you see I replied. I was going to tell him the truth soon. Once father has left for his, new life on Bug World. 9. You did not have to resort to such extreme measure, they were already retreating robot commented. Yeah, I mean they were already running away. You didn't have to do that. Mark chimed in. I didn't have to, yes, but I needed to, to serve as a deterrent. I have warned them not to invade next time and sent a clear message to whoever they consider as superior. What? What message? Rex asked. I looked at him, his voice endlessly irritating me whenever I hear it. I made my eyes glow red intensely before saying, come back next time and die. I paused after each word for effect and powered down. I pretended to stumble and fall over, Mark managing to catch me and put my arm around over his shoulder. H hey, you alright? And no, I'm fine. I just need a little rest, I'll be going first. I gently got out of his hold and flew away. Plus plus Mark POV plus plus. Rob was acting, weird. One minute he was filing over a girl he clearly likes, the next he's ripping off weak alien limbs like pulling on candy. Way to go psycho out there, invincible. And what the hell? Your twin can do that? Do both of you just get new powers when you get angrier? Rex exclaimed. I I, I don't know. I just, say Eve and the team in danger and I got, mad, I guess. 1. 
Don't get me wrong, okay, that was the most amazing display of powers I've seen from newbies, but also very terrifying. Just, tell you brother not to point it at me okay, Rex replied. Eve elbowed Rex and reprimanded him. Don't listen to Rex, you did great there invincible. Your brother too, he, well Eve struggled to find the words. One, yes, I'll have to ask him about it later. What's going on with him? Plus plus MCPOV plus plus. I soared over a few blocks before pretending to fall over a subway tunnel. I was midway on its stairs before I stopped and cloaked myself. The suit I wore was functional enough to provide me a few minutes of invisibility. 2. With the cloaking on, I retrieved a sample of the most important flax and technologies I could find. Their guns, artillery weapons, the cheap plate and gauntlets, and most importantly their portal device. 1. It was an unassuming piece, that seemed more of a scanner than a transdimensional portal generator. It was still running and didn't seem to be affected by the time flow so it was a two-in-one find. I know they would advance more in the future but a head start in their foundational tech would help smooth my journey later on. I rushed over my secret base and managed to get inside with the remaining time still cloaked. I cleaned myself and began to arrange the tech in an array over a table. I then went to my computers and accessed robot's automaton schematics, specifically its scanners. His display in tech analysis and reverse engineering intrigued me. I found his schematics and looked over them. After a few moments of reading and I found my answer. I was an implant on his original body that lets him mentally control and let him receive massive amounts of input that somehow he can translate to sensory data. He literally feels and sees everything the automaton goes through. The discovery was a bit of a letdown, but it did give me some utility. I reverse engineered his implant and added a few changes of my own. It has all the bells and whistles of the original version but none of robot's original coding. Also my version is a versatile piece that lets me access, override, and control its primary coding. It might theoretically give me more control the longer I stay in contact. Of course, if it's my tech I can instantly control it from anywhere. I built it into a wristband and an earpiece, then deciding to make another set and mark. It's a bit crude but improvements need time, time I don't have, yet. I connected my systems to it and tinkered for a few hours before stopping. I sat back and rested my hands for a bit, looking at the time it was already afternoon. I decided to hold the projects for now. I got out of the base and flew towards home. On my way there, I got a call from Cecil. Damn it Sentry, where the hell have you been? Your mother is dash's voice was cut off and mom's voice replaced it. Robert Grayson, you will come here right now or I swear, you will only eat meatloaf for the rest of your dash her voice was cut off again. Not that I needed to hear the rest of it to prevent my stomach from churning. One. So, I heard Cecil's sympathy through the phone. Yeah I'll be there. I slowly shift directions and flew towards the Pentagon. GDA headquarters. I flew quickly and arrived in front of the door. I sighed before opening it, expecting a rigorous course of mom. What I didn't expect was my father to be awake. The man was holding onto mother, with a smile on his face until I showed up. 1. His face immediately turned solemn and said Mark, Debbie, can you excuse us for a moment? I'd like to have a word with my son. Mom didn't hear the faint change in his voice when he said son, neither did Mark. Nolan, I dash. Mom was about to protest when father gave him a certain look, which she understood somehow. She got up and dragged Mark outside, wait. Mom, dad just woke up. I know Mark, but let's just give them time to speak Mom answered and looked at me. Her expression was that of concern. I waited for both of them to get out of the door before facing father. So, what do you want to talk about? Is it true, you have other powers? Father asked. Did Mark tell you that? Didn't he also say he created a sonic boom by screaming? Crash, answer the question. Father shouted and sent out a minor shockwave that shattered the surrounding glass. I instinctively readied my heat vision, my eyes glowed red as I looked at him. This enough to answer. He stared at my glowing eyes in shock. A look of, disbelief almost, his face soon paled before he looked away. Whatever you're trying to do, I'm fine with it as long as you don't hurt mom or Mark I powered down and slowly floated towards the door. Wait, Robert stop. Father called out. What? I was shocked, I mean. It's been a good while since I've seen someone like you among the Viltramites father replied. Someone like me. I remembered the words of the Rob I met. He didn't say anything about being related to Viltramites. One. You. Well they were very few. They were born naturally among us. Some kind of mutation. Other than the natural powers we get as Viltramites, they were gifted with a few additional powers just like the one you showed. And they didn't mix well with their other Viltramites because of it father replied. Two. So he knows what to look out for. This is bad. I hid my hand behind my back and clenched it, trying to keep the nervousness away. If he makes a move here, mom and Mark won't be able to escape. They were powerful but also like to keep to themselves. Father paused for a moment and continued, then one day they all went away. We didn't see them again. Why? They wanted to be separate, to build a community of their own. They took the word cryptos meaning hidden and used it to describe themselves, Kryptonian. The ones who had powers not one but they knew. Years went by and we didn't meet them again, until today, with you father finished and looked at me. He just started, calm and unmoving. 4. I looked for micro expressions, listened for his heart for lies, but I got nothing, still, calm faced. Rob, you're my son, and as hard as it is to believe at times, I do love you. I love my family father, dad, simply stated. I didn't know what to say, a bit confused about him now. Ow, oh, yeah, we'll talk about his more once I'm out of here. Can you please let your mother in? Dad smiled as he flinched from the pain. Sure I exited the room, still confused. Mom rushed inside and towards Dad's side. I signaled Mark to say that I'll be leaving early to think. I left and just coasted on the air, just a few miles from my secret base. I was confused about how to deal with him now. Why did he say that? I remembered a lot of his initial cruelty from the comics and the show, how he ended the Guardians and beat up Mark so easily. But I also remember the good he tried to do afterward, how he changed and still loved Mom despite it all. 1. I realized that, as I got closer to the base, that I was living with these characters now. 2. They were my family, along with all their flaws. And Dad is a complicated guy, given the thousands of years of repressed feelings. Well, this got complicated. I tried to think of other topics to prevent myself from overthinking. I went to my lab, where the Flaxen tech was laid out for examination. I lightly tapped each device before using TTK to disassemble all of its components. It took me a few minutes to scan the parts and create a blueprint I can study better. I managed to get the basic coding architecture the Flaxen uses on their tech, which would be helpful in the future. My main focus was the time band, which I spent a few hours getting ready for their last incursion. If the flow of events follows the show. 1. Beep beep. 
My computer alerted me of a breakout in some high-powered prison located deep in the Nevada desert. The alert made me smile, another show moment that most overlooked. I hastily flew away and activated my cloaking. 1. Nevada desert. 5 minutes later. I was soaring through the cold desert night, trying to find the thing that would lead me. Took me a while, but I eventually found it. It was a drone with a surveillance camera, flying just ahead and towards Las Vegas itself. I followed it stealthily and observed its flight path, taking note of where it's been and where it's headed. I went back a few meters and I found it. There lay the still shifting and semi-living body of a Mahler twin. A massive mass of blood and ripped off body parts, was not anyone's idea of a treasure. Normally I would share the sentiment but what I needed was the mind of this guy, and its DNA. I landed just behind the head and watched it for a second. The entire right side of the brain and a half of its body was gone. I tapped each part of the body once and levitated it with me towards the base. I arrive a few minutes later and got to work. I had prepared numerous vials for the blood, also a container filled with a special liquid to keep the brain viable. All of it was then safely kept in a temperature-controlled room. 2. When I was done I safely disposed of the waste matter using heat vision, reducing the mass to ashes. I then went to my computers and accessed Robot's visor feed, watching as he followed the Muller twin in an orange jumpsuit hiding around Las Vegas. Chapter 10, Chapter 9 Plus plus MCPOV plus plus. The robot was watching the remaining twin assemble parts and begin to construct some kind of incubation chamber. He had scans on the thing which automatically made a copy of the information on my drive. I cut off the feed and started looking through his findings. Robot's business was of no concern for now, until he touches anyone I care for. The Mullers were indeed geniuses, making such a marvel like this. A machine capable of cloning a replica of the donor sample. He even found a way to configure the age of the clone. 1. The only major downside is the caloric material required by the body to form. The more dense the organism the more the intake of material. It was necessary to provide for tissue growth. But I still needed it, so I put in orders for the parts and moved my focus on other things for now. I continued my work on the chrono band and managed to incorporate its technology into the wristband I was wearing. I would need to test its functions in the actual flaxen dimension soon. 2. I did have the portal gun to enter, but I decided to wait. Who knows, maybe they'll give me another good reason to raid. 1. Ring. My phone rang again, a ringtone I set for Mark's number. I looked at my wristband and saw that it was nearing midnight. Why was he calling? Mark? What's wrong man? I picked up and answered. Rob, let's meet at home in an hour. I have something I want to talk to you about he replied. He sounded off for some reason like he does when he's trying hard to keep his emotions in check. Okay, what is this about? I'll tell you later. Just please. He sounded serious. This was new. Okay, Mark. In an hour then I ended the call. Not letting myself overthink things because well it's Mark, I went back to work. As I passed the time, I realized how boring it was. Having no one to bounce ideas off of, and no one to talk to. I look at one of the robots I had made, an older model that was designed for maintenance. It somehow knew I was looking since it stopped and stared back. I shook off my head and ordered it back to work. 2. After 50 minutes or so, I left the base and flew home. The evening darkness was slowly settling in. I was 10 seconds away from the house, cruising in the air when I heard the sound of something flying towards me at top speed. I looked to where the sound came from and saw a shadowed yellow color, one similar to what Mark wore. Mark. I asked out loud, the figure increased its speed. When he got close enough to see clearly, I confirmed that it was indeed Mark. His hair blowing wildly as he picked up speed. He went in for a punch, which I caught with my hand. Boom. It was the first time I realized how different we were. How weak he still was. The impact was not as powerful as I expected, given his Viltramite blood. He went in for another punch, aiming it to my face. I let it, trying to find out how much of it I would feel. 1. Boom. The impact let out a similar but much more muffled sound. I didn't even feel it at all. Fight back. He screamed before sending out a barrage of fists to my face. His moves were all over the place, obvious signs of no training. Just instinctual. No. Why does he tackled me, which only pushed me back a little? Is he being mind controlled or something? I grabbed his hands and easily removed them from my torso. He was trying to force get them away but could only struggle in vain. I rapidly spun him and sent him downward, aiming him just outside of the houses and in a clearing nearby. He somehow caught himself and darted towards me. I rapidly fly behind him and clutched him in a chokehold, halting his movement. I dragged both of us down and crashed into the ground. Mark? Snap out of it. No, let me go. I felt a wave of force emerge from him as he flexed, but it wasn't enough to get rid of me. He tried reaching towards my eyes. I grew angry at the attempt and slightly scorched his fingers. Screams. Snap out of it, Mark. Now, my threat somehow worked as he began to calm down. I let him go after I felt him relax. He suddenly sends a kick my way which I met with my fist. Boom crack. I heard his bones break as we clashed, I saw him trying to hold it in. He seemed determined to get something out of me. I wasn't having any of it, I just hurt my brother. My family. I quietly stared at him and used my heat vision as a threat. Mark, stop. No, I need to do this. I don't want to be left behind. He replied desperately. What? What the hell does he dashes towards me, cutting me mid-sentence. He was fast, but not faster. I caught his neck and pinned him down, securing both arms behind him. What the hell do you mean? You? You're stronger, faster, and smarter. You even have those, those eye things. I must be stronger. He replied. It shocked me. I hadn't considered what he would feel about it. So your solution for that is to fight me. Dad told me Viltramites get stronger the more we fight. That's why dash. 3. You could have asked me for a spar or a training session instead. Why just outright attack me? I interrupted him. 1. He merely stared, still floating, and intent on fighting. Then I realized it. He was desperate. Just, just stop okay. Let's think of other ways. Surely there are other things we can do to make you stronger. 1. He was still staring as he let his guard down. Good. Come on, let us go into the house and you can tell me in length. I flew first as he followed closely behind. We arrived at the house and started talking. He had been working out for days now, trying to push himself as far and as fast as he can. He also began lifting progressively heavier stuff to increase his strength. But that one day, when he saw me with my other power and told Dad about it he had a change of heart. Dad seemingly told him the same tale about me being some rare line of Viltramite. He got a bit jealous and so, Mark, I'm not trying to win some favorability contest here. I just want to keep our family safe. 
So I prepared myself for every possibility and I don't know, I guess I just got stronger along the way. Ah, uh, that's bullshit, Rob. You mean to tell me that your laser thing came from training? He replied, annoyed. 3. Well, see, I am also quite special. I smiled at him, which only annoyed him more. 1. But anyway man, fighting isn't the only way to be strong. There's martial arts, tactics, and of course style I strike a pose as I finish. He merely face palmed and flew to his room. So we're good right? You won't try and stuff meatballs on my mouth when I sleep. I said loudly. He flicked me and closed the door. I smirk and just sat there for a while. I looked over the dining table and suddenly get the urge to eat something. Even with my Kryptonian physiology, I still crave food. Especially pizza, and especially the unholy pineapple pizza. 40. Mark hates it, but the soul wants what it wants. So I called in the best pizza place I could buy and ordered two boxes for myself while ordering a box of pepperoni pizza for Mark. The lady on the other line told me to wait for 30 minutes. 1. I passed the time simply by doing random stuff after I changed into my regular clothes. Enjoying the simple moments in this very, chaotic and dangerous world. Ring ring. Oh finally. I would have been paralyzed with overthinking, saved by the bell. Mark? Pizza's here? It's your favorite. I hear him rumble and fly towards me as I headed to the door. He was still in full costume. This better not be one of those, those pineapple ones Rob. I can't understand why you'd think that tastes good. He complained. 2. Ever heard of the phrase, to each their own, Mark? Maybe you should try it too, I think it's one of the things that made me stronger. Also, mom always reminded us never to wear costumes inside I replied as I opened the door. He raised a brow and started. It's like you want everyone to know that you're invincible dash. I stop, eyes wide at the person I saw on the other side of the door. Holding three pizza boxes in one hand and using the other to search her pockets, wearing her signature leather jacket and a red top was Donna Troy. Donna was busy searching her pockets for something when she looked up. Her eyes darted between me and Mark before focusing on me. You look like. She stopped, the realization dawning on her. She then, miraculously, found what she was looking for. A receipt with a few words written on it. I didn't have to use my x-ray vision to know it was my name on it. She then read it and I saw her eyes widened in surprise. Your. She looked at the paper and continued, Robert Grayson. Prop Mark trailed off as he rushed off and reappeared moments later with his normal clothes. I simply face palmed. Why? She already, never mind. I cast a glance at Donna. Donna's eyes didn't move from my face, she seemed to await some sort of confirmation from me. Ah, uh, hi Donna. I awkwardly wave at her. Hey, I wasn't I mean that was dash Mark stumbled on his words. Donna still had her eyes focused on me, not minding Mark's attempt at an explanation. Um, I have your pizza, she asked, or was she stating? I couldn't tell. Oh, right. Why don't you come in? I can explain, thoroughly. It's late, Robert, she raised an eyebrow. Okay, how about tomorrow? I can take you anywhere you feel safe enough to talk. She paused for a moment, seemingly thinking about the offer. All right, Robert, meet me at Central Park, 9 a.m. Don't be late, she said. One, I won't, I promise. Good, that'll be $29.99, she suddenly said. Two, what? Is she asking me to pay for the da, the pizza? The total is $29.99, she replied, smirking. Three, crap, I did it again. I quickly paid for the boxes before watching her leave, only now noticing that she arrived here, by herself, with no car. Do you want me to take you fly you or dash? No, it's okay, besides dash she then started floating upwards. You're not the only one who has something to explain tomorrow. She gave me a wink and flew off. I was simply standing there, staring at her figure slowly disappearing into the night, admiring the glimpse of her. Wow, both of you forgot I was here Mark abruptly chides. He pulled out the box with a very distinct pepperoni smell and flew off to his room, mumbling something about Eve and flying. 2. Plus plus flax and POV plus plus. It is almost time. My revenge against the scourge is near. My body has been augmented with machines powerful enough to take him down. New arms capable of crushing the biggest rock in Flaxo with ease. 3. After years and years of pushing the royalty, I finally perfected my armor against the scourge. I stand, looking over the massive army I have prepared. Our weapons have proven to be more powerful now, but more time is needed more preparation. Until the scourge will pay for the humiliation. Flash boom. What is this? Why has the sky gone red? I look up to see the once yellow star shining overhead get covered by a massive patch of red energy, a darker color than that of the scourge psi lasers. I squint my eyes as I notice something, two small black dots moving fast across the red patch. I then see the dots were humans, similar to the scourge's form, one had a green suit while the other had a torn uniform of blue and white. 6. The green one punched the other, his form rapidly crashing towards my way. I ran in time to dodge the impact but not the aftershock. Crash. The hard floor on my feet shook and cracked. A crater formed and inside it was the unconscious form of the blue one, with a strange looking blade impaled in his chest. Boom. The green one landed heavily right in front of him, his pale skin and yellow mane contrasted with his deep green suit. You, reap what you, so, it muttered in the scourge's language in a very broken way. He rushes to me, grabs my face with one hand, and slams me into a wall. I tried prying it off with my augments but it wasn't enough. No, you, who are you, are you with the SE dash, change, or die. It screamed childishly before. Crush splat. Chapter 11, Chapter 10. MCPOV. 9 AM the next day. Flying was as fun as it was effortless. Soaring through the sky is addicting but also quite showy. Hence my cloaking turned on. I had arrived a minute ago and was searching for her, Donna. The park wasn't that big but it was quite dense. I did find her eventually, hearing my name being uttered a few hundred meters away. She was quietly waiting on a park bench, watching everyone around her. Her usual black leather jacket and red shirt paired nicely with the black Toreador pants and heels. She also had some sort of bracers, golden colored bands of metal that glinted in the sunlight. I stealthily landed behind her. Hey, Robert. Glad you're on time she looked in my direction as if seeing me. You can stop that now, I can hear your heart beating. Quite loudly I might say. She smiled. I shook my head and disabled my cloaking. I was wearing my superhero suit so it was quite eye-catching. I saw her raise a brow as she watched me. Always have to be ready. Expecting trouble soon I replied. Oh right. Those green aliens with energy weapons? I saw them on the news. They were quite strong she replied. Yes, hence my preparation. Anyway, let's talk about. Last night. 
A-H-H right. Okay then, you start she insisted. So I explained to her about me being sentry and about Mark. I told her about my heat vision as something I could do by but Mark couldn't, which seemed to mildly catch her interest. 1. She seemed, calmer now. Despite the truth bombs I dropped, she merely listened. Much different from the Donna I remember just a few days ago, and when it was her turn to speak, I was more than surprised about the reveal. Turns out she had an extremely similar power set with Wonder Girl in DC, superhuman physical attributes, flight, and combat training. I also expect some of her more magical items to be in her possession as well. She also hinted at being related to War Woman, one of the previous guardians of the globe. It was at that moment that I felt conflicted about that piece of information. Telling her about Dadwood, sour things between us. It's her right to know but, I like this girl. 1. Hey, what's wrong? Is it too shocking? She asked. I, was thinking about the last time we met. How is Maya? I haven't been able to visit her room since the Flaxen incursions I changed the subject, trying to take things one step at a time. She's, she's not doing great, to be honest she grew sadder after I mentioned Maya. I regretted my actions. I nearly apologized when a portal appeared just a few meters in front of us. I immediately dashed in front of it, readying my heat vision whatever may come out. Donna landed beside me a moment later, her stance ready. I'm helping Robert. I mean, sentry she stated and I wasn't going to argue. I saw something come out of the portal, a group of Flaxen soldiers. I almost burned them all right then if I didn't see other beings start to emerge from the portal. Creatures of different shapes and colors came out, most of which were wounded and needed help moving. The few that saw me and my eyes stopped dead in their tracks, terror simultaneously overtook their pained expressions. The Flaxen soldiers mustered their courage and slowly aimed their weapons at me and Donna. SC Scourge, if this was your plan all along then, end it quickly. A female Flaxen soldier demanded. The other beings that heard her immediately stopped and stared at me. The young among them started to cry. Robert, why, are they so afraid of you? Donna asked. I warned them last time, but, I didn't expect this reaction. You Flaxen, where is your leader? The scarred one. I asked the soldier in their language. D do not play games with you as Scourge. Your pale companion has slaughtered our armies and disintegrated our defenses with his yellow beams. She replied loudly, tears started streaming from her eyes. Pale companion? I don't know who dash. 4. BZZZT. A yellow beam of heat emerged from the portal and went through soldiers behind the female flaxen, killing them instantly. I shot my own to intercept it before it reached her, the collision seared and reddened the female flaxen ears. The other beings started dispersing, leaving the young among them behind in the panic. I compelled the female flaxen to direct the young away, feeling the power of the beams as they collided with mine. Donna jumped into action and started forcefully guiding the fleeing beings to a spot far away. The beam stopped, as a large figure emerged from the portal before it closed. A pale-skinned blonde man, with a dark green colored torn uniform and cape. His face reminded me of someone. Reap what you sow. It screamed. Then it dawned on me, I know who it is. More precisely, what it is. A reaper. 3. Donna, you need to get them out of here and call for backup. Why? Who is he? Donna asked curiously, noticing me on edge. Someone I didn't expect to meet, at all I clenched my fists hard and readied my heat vision. Die. It screamed. BZZZZT. The reaper shot his beam, aiming it squarely at my face. Donna's figure arrived in front of me, her arms crossed and held out. Pang. The beams hit the bracers, intensely heating them. But it didn't seem to affect Donna as she swiftly flew forward, bashing her arms into the reaper. It tried to grab her but she caught its arm and locked its movements, pinning it to the ground. Boom crack. See? Not too tough is it? She flashed me a cheeky smile. I then see her arm start tensing as the reaper slowly flexed his arm. Die. Die. It chanted, like the ones I know from that comic. Oh, it's getting stronger. She strained. The reaper completed its flex, sending Donna flying into the air. I caught her and said, Donna, go now, I'll handle the reaper. I took the opportunity to contact Mark as the reaper slowly stood and faced me. I let go of her arms and flew towards the reaper. My fists held up front. It saw my actions and reacted in kind. Boom. Donna POV. We were having such a nice talk, date. The park was peaceful, the spot I picked was scenic. Everything was set. But it just arrived and is now trading blows with him. Boom 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 boom. The being Robert called a reaper had the same powers he did. His eye beams were intense and had enough power behind them to heat my bracers enough to sear me. Boom 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 boom. The skies continuously resounded with the impacts of their fists. The speed at which they moved was not easy to follow. Luckily Robert managed to keep their fight in the skies to lessen the damage. Meanwhile, I had ushered the strange beings to safety. The idea of calling in the government to secure them came to me, but I choose to handle it myself. I had not told Robert about it yet, but I understood his conversation with the feminine being. It called him Scourge, which was, oddly fitting. 4. I watched him take on and fight equally with a being stronger than me, the current strongest Amazonian. Hey, beautiful. Haven't seen you before. An annoying voice spoke behind me. I turned around and found the group that Robert had called the team, along with his brother Invincible. I looked at the boy who talked, the one who dressed like a smiling baboon. I chose to ignore the grinning fool. Hello, team. I'm a friend of Invincible and Sentry. I'm here to help. Good. We're the team team, a pleasure to meet you. What's the situation? A metallic humanoid stepped forward with his hand raised towards me. I tentatively shook it. It's not bad for now, Sentry is keeping the Reaper occupied. Reaper? What's that? The clown and a girl with multiple selves asked. Where is he anyway? Invincible asked. Boom crash. Something landed heavily behind us and left a crater on the park grounds. Everyone was blown away by the impact, but those who could fly quickly caught themselves and others. I landed a few meters from the crater and readied myself. I know how strong it was and what it could do. I saw a pair of glowing yellow lights amidst the dust. It suddenly dashed towards me. Its slightly bruised form and largely torn uniform showed the intensity of Robert's strength and its durability. I got ready to catch and take down this reaper once and for all, but I found that I didn't have to. BZZZT boom. An intense beam of red energy struck the reaper's head, propelling its body into the ground. I look up to its source to see him, Robert. His suit was torn in places but he was otherwise unhurt. Get away from her reaper, your playtime with me is not over. He angrily proclaimed. He charged towards the downed reaper and landed both legs on its back, another crater resulted in impact. Boom. The team came over one by one and slowly showed shock and awe at Robert's performance. Robert slowly rose from the crater and landed in front of me. Hey, Donna he smiled at me. 
MCPOV, the high, a Superman template from the Wildstorm universe. But this one is not the actual high. 5. More specifically, it's a clone. Primitive brain but still dangerous. I gave my body the once over, checking every part for injury. Luckily I have none. The stalemate earlier surprised me. I knew the high speeds of strength, and the clone justified it. It was on PAR if not a little bit stronger than me at times. Might be due to its lack of intelligence and inhibitions. My hands slightly trembled as I remembered the earlier exchange. I had used all of the strength in that, and it's still in one piece and was fighting back. I later realized it was excitement. Finally, something I can go all out on. But not here, not in New York. Otherwise, the city will burn. Donna, can you get that, green soldier I was talking to before? Okay, but know that I don't let just anyone order me around, sentry she remarked before flying off. 3. Order you? What? I wanted to look at her but refused to let my eyes stray from the reaper. Sentry, do you require any assistance? If there's any way we can help dash robot suggested. No robot. It's fine, just focus the team's effort in situation control and evacuation if needed. I can handle this, I think. Robot stared at me as his visor flashed. Understood robot ordered the team with different tasks as they scattered, leaving me and the reaper alone. I sensed its movement and swiftly punched out behind me, hitting it square in the face. Unfortunately, he also hit me the same. Boom. The blows caused a shockwave that scattered dust and debris everywhere. We were both thrown away. I caught myself midway and dashed towards the flung reaper. Boom. I saw Donna fall into it and catching its head in a chokehold, then using its momentum to forcefully slam it into the ground. Sentry. The soldier, she's right, behind you. Donna struggled as she grappled the reaper. The reaper tried to shake her off, slamming her into the walls of the crater and the ground. But she didn't let go, she held on. I turned around as I heard the sound of an erratic heart beating. Scourge, what is the meaning of this? Why have you called me back here? The female Flaxen spoke cautiously, aiming her gun at me. Flaxen, put that down. That won't hurt me and it won't help your situation if you shoot. I'm warning you I used my heat vision to help dissuade her actions. I need something from you, your portal device. Where is it? It's, it's. She struggled somewhat. Boom boom. The clash behind me intensified as time went on, and I could hear Donna's heartbeat continue to rise, as well as her groans. Speak Flaxen, we don't have much time. IT was destroyed. All of it, along with everything else on the planet. She screamed, tears flowing from her fierce eyes. What? I was, taken aback. It only took a month for that, that thing to decimate my entire world. We managed to scrape together enough tech and power to construct a temporary portal to evacuate what was left, but he came and. The female Flaxen explained as she choked on her own words. This was bad, I couldn't let loose here just yet. I suddenly remembered the portal gun in my base. I activated my armband and connected it to the base, sending my intent to the bot who stared back at me. Third POV, sentry base, underground. Inside one of the new dugout paths in Sentry's base, bot hashtag 001 was currently lifting 10 tons of dirt. As the first ever of the bot series to be made by Sentry, bot hashtag 001 had been installed with the most powerful processing chip. It could learn, unlike its brothers. So when it received its creator's intent, it immediately dropped everything and responded. Chapter 12, Chapter 11 Donna POV This Reaper is immensely powerful but was lacking in reasoning. I couldn't match its strength but I could outmaneuver it. Reap what yo, so, it spoke. 2. Instead of trying to pry my arms from his neck, he reached for my head trying to get a grasp of anything and crushing it. I momentarily release it, then kicked it away. Boom. The reaper caught itself after a few meters and darted towards me. I flew forward to meet it. Die. It screamed in mindless rage. It jabbed towards me. I caught its arm and proceeded to use its momentum to spin around and throw him upwards. Rushing towards it before it could react, I sent an uppercut to its lower jaw. Boom. The impact exposed his back to me, so I took the opportunity. Boom 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 boom. Punch after punch sent him higher and higher into the sky. It turned its body to face me in a blur and as my fist landed, it took the blow. Veins bulged on its face as it bared its teeth. Change. It screamed, both of its arms suddenly grasped my neck and head. Or die. It smashed its head into mine. Boom. The blow nearly drove me unconscious, were it not for the fruits of harsh training my grandmother had put me through. My vision became blurry for a second before I was shaken, the reaper's hand still clasped on my neck. Boom. It punched me again, straight in the face. The pain was excruciating. I taste hints of blood in my mouth. Change or die. It threw me forward and darted towards me, both arms raised and aimed at my head. Groan. Intent on killing me in one go. I painfully raised my bracers to block. I might have overestimated my chances. Boom. MCPOV. I was still communicating my commands to the bot when I heard something crashing my way. I turned to see a body that wore the same clothes as Donna. I flew in and caught her, and quickly determined that she took quite a beating from the Reaper. Her clothes tore in some places, some of her ribs were broken, and her nose was bleeding. I carried her in a princess carry, trying to make her as comfortable as I can. She struggled to speak as her throat was hurt. I touched her face and spoke telepathically. Donna, you should have called for me. A hey, new power, Robert? I must admit, this is quite handy she replied. I can take what he throws at me and give back just as hard, we could have worked together. I don't understand why you push yourself too far. Groan. Are you saying, I'm weak Robert? I'm not, I saw you pummel the Reaper. You're strong. I'm just, trying to keep everyone I, care about safe. One. Boom. Something heavy landed in front of me, and I didn't need to look to know that it was the Reaper. Reap what you sow. It bellowed. I felt her hand caress my face, go then. Beat that thing, do a good job and I'll let you carry me like this more often. Deal? And by the way dash. Boom. I raised my left hand to grab the Reaper's fist, my hand coated with an outline of red light as I used TTK. We have a lot more to talk about I say as I gently placed her down with telekinesis. Shock was plastered on her face as she stared at the red light illuminating from me. The augmented strength made his fists weaker now, but I won't use it in full just yet. Just showing off for now. I pulled in the Reaper and punched his face with a right fist augmented with TTK. Boom crack. I heard the bones on its face break from the punch as the Reaper was thrown backward, crashing into the asphalt street. 
Crash. Robot POV. Duplicate split up and evacuate the civilians. Eve use your powers to surround the area with anything to keep the damage to an acceptable degree. Both of them went and performed their task. Eve seems to disagree a little with my use of acceptable degree. Impact imminent. Implementing preservation protocols. My body moved by itself and blasted away from the previous spot. Crash. Something heavy crashed at my previous spot. Dust covered the crash site, heavily obscuring it from normal view. I turned around and my scanners immediately blared. Caution. Extreme level danger. I saw a pair of glowing lights from the crash site and recognized who it was. Sentry's opponent stared at me, eyes glowing aimed straight at my head. Energy spike detected. Evasive maneuvers in progress. Whoosh crash. A humanoid with a red outline stamped on its back grabbed its head with both hands and pulled it. Its face pointed upward. BZZZT. A yellow beam of energy shot out from its eyes, increasing intensity for a short second before fading out. Scream. I looked to the source of the scream and found it covering its eyes with both hands. Blood trickled from it as it kept shouting. It tried to fly away, no doubt distancing itself in panic. Eve? Keep it still. I heard sentry shout. Eve reluctantly flew over and raised both hands. Pink energy powered from them as the debris and energy hastily shot towards the fleeing enemy. It coiled around it, transforming into a liquid form the solidifying once it covered its body. Die, die. It frantically moved, pieces of the bindings came off easily in their current state. Then I saw Sentry appear behind him, leaving an ephemeral trail of red behind him. Both his arms opened wide, with a smile on his face. Read this, bitch. He brought both arms close and clapped on its head. Clap boom. Ah. A horrible shriek of pain emerged from its mouth. Analyzing, eardrums ruptured. Possibility of complete hearing loss increasing. MCPOV. The one thing I learned from comics and biology is, superhuman senses are a gift and a curse. Especially hearing and seeing. I could see its eardrums blow wide open as I finished my move. 2. Not wasting any time, I held his head and made it face me. BZZZT. I shot my heat vision into his eyeballs, putting more energy into it to burn the whole thing shut. Screaming. It went wild, trying its best to grab at me. It only took a few discreet and timely telekinetic blows to redirect his arms away. I stop and check my work. I could see his eye sockets were hollow, black markings on the insides indicating that the eyeballs themselves were gone now. Flying upwards with both hands still holding the reaper's crippled body, I took him just high enough to avoid any immediate damage should he try and fight me again. I then entered his mind, trying and succeeding in prying out bits of information. For a clone, the reaper had quite a detailed memory. Being cloned from one of Wildstorm's supermen has its perks. I went through flashes of its early days until I reached one particular memory. I saw multiple of its fellow clones being teleported in the bleed. The subreality between universes, comprising of an endless space of red fluctuating matter. I felt its mind control device momentarily break, causing it to lash out because of the strain of flying in the bleed. It attempted to enter a wormhole that seemed to lead to their earth but was intercepted by a Spartan. A sentient AI in a cybernetic body, built to handle superhumans. It had a blade on its back, which it used expertly. 1. But its strength could not match the Reaper, as it ripped the sword from its hand and impaled it in the Spartan's chest. The Spartan grabbed it tight and flew into a part of the bleed, where it ended up in the flaxen dimension, leaving a tear in its sky, and the rest was history. I opened my eyes and saw the Reaper still struggling, so I pushed it forward. It immediately grabbed for its eyes and ears, patting them down as if to check. Die, reap. It mumbled and screamed, very angry and confused. Yeah, buddy. You reap what you sow on this one I said in reply, not that he could hear it. I then heard something slowly approach from behind the reaper. The familiar sound of mechanical clicking and the unusual mix of rocket propulsion. I looked behind it and saw a silhouette being, cloaked. Cloaking? BZZ. My wristband vibrated, and in seeing what it was I was surprised. It was one of my maintenance bots, but this one had used my cloaking tech without my instructions. It seemed to be a lesser version though, just enough to mask its physical appearance. I almost distracted myself with how the bot acted without my orders, but I reminded myself of the matter at hand. I sent my intent to the bot and readied myself. A portal opened behind the reaper and I flew towards it, slamming into the reaper, taking him along. The last bit of sound I heard before I completely went through was the intense flapping of fabric and a voice calling out. Rover Dash. Donna POV. Robert's display of abilities intimidated and intrigued me, I'm not gonna lie. I nearly laughed as I remembered the nice guy who fumbled when he talked and compared him to the sentry I see before me. His strength, speed, skill, and powers made him worthy for the reaper. But I wouldn't be bested without trying. I tried to stand up but still felt the intense pain of the punch earlier. I nearly stumbled when another pair of arms caught me. Whoa there Donna. Take it easy, you're still hurt a familiar voice spoke out behind me. I turned around and saw the unmistakable yellow and black outfit of Robert's brother. I can handle myself Mardash. Invincible? My name, my name is Invincible he interrupted in a hurry. Right, anyway, I need to go and fight the Reaper, your brother said he can handle it. And I don't believe him. Rob I mean Sentry. I resisted the urge to facepalm. Sentry can take care of it, rest assured. He's stronger than you think, stronger than me for sure he explained. There was a look of helplessness in his eyes as he said it. Are you jealous of his strength? Why, aren't you twin brothers? Doesn't that mean Dash? No, he's stronger all right then a strange determination came over him. So he's a class above his sibling. I wonder who their father is, to sire such children. Distant screaming. And that's my cue. Might be sentry or civilian in danger, either way, stay put. You need to rest he flew off into the direction of the scream. I relented and took heed of his advice, resting on a bench just a few meters away. I began to float towards it when I saw a faint hint of a red glow and a pain scream. The source of it came from the direction where Robert had punched the reaper into. My curiosity got the better of me and I floated towards it, just in time to smell burning flesh. I found its source after looking around, Robert held the reaper in his arms. Its considerably large frame struggled under his grasp, a portion of skin on its eyes was charred black. Blood trickled from the charred eyes and ears. Robert was pretty rough with the reaper. Was it because of me, or simply his bloody nature? He flew up, the reaper in hand. I saw brief flashes of red energy go every time it reached for him. Then he lets it go. I found it strange and dangerous but as soon as he did a portal appeared just behind the reaper. I stared at him and saw him smiling. He's not seriously thinking of. I flew hurriedly towards him, trying to stop the fool from doing it. Stopping him from leaving me. One. But he did. 
He flew into the portal, pushing and taking the Reaper with him to the other side. I met two people as I nearly reached the portal. I saw Mark slash Invincible fly hastily towards him but he was too slower than me and further away. Boom whoosh. Robert. The other one was fast. I saw him, the one called Omni-Man. He screamed his name in anger as the portal closed before he could follow Robert. He looked around and his angry eyes settled on me. I felt a shiver go down my spine, something about his gaze unnerved me. He flew to my front, faster than I could blink, and grabbed my shoulders tightly. Why didn't you stop him? He asked in a low tone. I, I couldn't dash. You mean to tell me that you just watched as he battled that thing alone? Why are you even here? His grip tightened. I, I, I couldn't find the words. Omni-Man was being weird. Who was he to Robert? Dad stop. You're hurting her. Mark flew near us and pried me off of hands. I'll deal with you later Mark. Your brother is trapped in a dimension he may never escape from, and you just let him do it he fiercely replied to Mark. Wait, Omni-Man is Robert's father? Third POV. Meanwhile, far away from the hero's battle, Bot Hashtag 001 was tasked with a very specific purpose, and was on his way .y towards the base to fulfill that purpose. Prepare for my arrival. Command received. Chapter 13, Chapter 12. MC POV. Flax and Dimension. Whoosh crash. We both crashed into hard soil, a very dry one too. The Reaper landed not far from where I was. And looking around I finally confirmed what the flaxen female told me. The sky was painted red, as a large tear in space opened up and covered the sky. I picked up a few stones from the ground and spun them in a circle, using my telekinesis to rapidly create friction and heat. It spun until it formed a bright ring. It gradually thinned after a moment until it disintegrated entirely. At least my TTK is still active. I went and tried to punch a larger rock with simple strength and found that it hurt. It still cracked the thing but there were bruises on my arm. 2. Great, the tear is blocking the yellow sun of this planet and acting as a red sun instead, draining me off solar energy. 1. I willed my intent to my suit, setting it on standby mode. The suit's red parts immediately glowed as solar energy showered my cells in controlled amounts. The bruises healed at the same rate as my healing. At the rate my cells are draining of the energy, I estimate it to last for about 2 hours before I completely run out. Plenty of time to take care of it. 1. I still have my TTK to fall back on. Roar. I hear the Reaper's anger as I flew blindly, crashing into abandoned skyscrapers and broken buildings. Boom boom. Shockwaves came from its strikes on the ground, desperately trying to find and beat me. I started to coat my body in telekinetic energy, the glow of my suit now masked by red energy. I lifted myself up and towards the Reaper. It was time to end this now. I noticed the skin around his eyes now became clear, the burnt flesh was gone and some semblance of flesh now filled a portion of his eye sockets. Ah oh, fuck I forgot that the high heels like Wolverine. Die. It flew in my direction, no doubt now have its hearing back. I quickly dodged out of the way as the Reaper simply passed and continued, crashing into another building behind me. I flew towards it and crashed into its back. Boom glass breaking. The resulting shockwave shattered the glass and compromised the columns of the building. We went through it as it started to crumble on itself. BZZT. A short burst of yellow heat vision came out of its eyes. I grabbed its neck in a rush and threw it downwards. Boom. It landed heavily. It made a man-sized hole. I flew after him, my hands immediately grabbed for his head. BZZZT. I resorted to burning them again, this time putting in more power to hopefully burn his brain as well. I don't need two hours to kill you repair. But it used its arms to block the beams, leaving a burn scar on it. It flew forward and grabbed my neck, both of us now flying away and into broken towers. Bang bang. He used my head as a battering ram, slamming me into each floor and column we passed through. I retaliated by encasing his fist in telekinetic energy and changing its trajectory as it hit me. It tried to kick me away, which I simply caught. I kicked him in the face, my foot coated augmented as it cracked his cranium. As so began the tedious exchange of blows, the buildings around us crumbled and fell from the shockwaves. Despite its limited reasoning ability, it still had the ferocity to disregard its injuries. But his advantage over me became more apparent as time went on. I remembered about the high, someone who had all the powers of the typical Superman but did not rely on the sun to keep it. And with the ridiculous healing factor and genetic reconstruction, the threat it posed could not be ignored. 1 hour 30 minutes in, its eyes and eardrums are now fully healed, back to peak efficiency. Boom crack. Both of our fists struck our faces, the blow nearly tossed me across. His face bled from the blow, but it won't be there for long. Bang boom. I had used everything I had and still this, cockroach continues to come back again and again. The city nearly turned into flat land now, as even the debris was broken down. Boom boom. But I had to admit, it was fun. Scary and very dangerous but so damn fun. Letting go was so freeing. 1. I now fully understood Superman's cardboard world speech. Holding back so much as to not kill was an act of discipline, but letting go, that was euphoria. 1. BZZZT BZZZT. The Reaper shot his heat vision, and I replied with mine. Our battle eventually took us into some kind of citadel. High towers of technological innovation and military vehicles were grouped together, all of them still broken down. I remember where this was. I saw it in the Reaper's memories, it was where he and the Spartan crashed into the leaders. Die, reap what you sow. The fucking cockroach screamed behind me, taking me away from the memory. I had a very rough plan on how to finally kill this one. And it all hinges on my guess on what that sword was to be true. BZZZT. I cut off a large piece of a nearby tower and lift it with TTK, before hurling it tip first into the Reaper. Scream boom. The dumb fuck tried to punch it away, which only gave enough space to engulf him and crash away. The entire 12 floor tip drove itself into the ground. Hopefully, that will give me enough time to find the sword and check. I flew myself into the same location in his memory. It was placed at the highest point on the highest tower in the entire citadel. It was so close to the bleed tier. I landed on the shattered place and gave everything a scan with my x-ray vision. I saw the torn and decaying body of one-eyed Flaxan. Some kind of cybernetic interface filled its arm sockets. They were still intact, along with the arms. A quick scan of it satisfied me. Certainly more advanced than anything back on Earth. I looked around some more and found the Spartan. The sword still impaled in its chest. 3. I floated towards it, silently scanning it, and, was stumped. I had certain expectations when it came to its type of tech. But this was, absurdly complex. 
The Spartan was originally made and improved through Krabim technology, Wildstorm's most prolific and highly advanced alien race. And sure enough, as I stared at the same tack, they are way above whatever both Earths I came from had. Then I notice it shift suddenly, detecting solar-powered superhuman. Threat level inconclusive. Inquiring on the nature of presence a robotic voice spoke out, its source coming from the Spartan on the ground. Are you talking about me Spartan? Affirmative. First contact successful. Language barriers, not detected. Implementing personality. The Spartan replied as it went silent. Hello, I'm Spartan unit hashtag 00004478. I require your assistance. It spoke up once more, but now it came from my wristband. If you're able to bypass my security systems and survive a beating from a reaper, I'm certain that you can help yourself just fine. So, I raised my hand at its body and raised it to face me. Why are you asking for help? Explanation. My incursion within this dimension happened months past. In that time I have interfaced myself with what was the available technology at the time. However, as you can see, none of it is left it replied plainly. In exchange for your help, I will share all the information I have gathered. They are not as advanced as my creators yet their knowledge might be of use to you it offered. No, I am interested in their tech, but not as much as yours. How about this? I have a counter offer. Confirmed. I will assess the offer. Please speak. You can't traverse the bleed again, the chances of you going back to your world is abysmal. You might end up somewhere different or somewhere far worse. So I offer you a place at my side, to help me save the world I grew to love. 1. Analyzing. Roar. I hear the scream of the reaper behind me, no doubt angry, and is rapidly making an effort to find me. I'll be back to talk about this more. I have to take care of that, put it out of its misery I gave the sword a light tap on its pummel and suddenly pulled it out of the Spartan. Its design was unlike what I guessed it to be. It's all matte black and was forged with a tactical feel in mind. It's shown and revealed its pristine blade, there was no hint of a scratch or chip on it. 5. I spun the sword and grasped its handle with my left hand. I then augmented my right hand to the best I can and readied myself. I cupped the blade and slowly pulled my left hand, sliding the shape sword over my palm. Groan. I immediately felt a stinging pain as the blade sword drew blood. I stopped pulling as that was definitive proof of my theory. This is accuser blade isn't it? 8. Your knowledge about my world is illogical it simply replied, trying to dodge the question. I dashed towards its upright body and held the sword to it, aiming for its head. I know these blades are made only for the high-ranking cran. Both as a weapon and a status symbol and yet you, a mere Spartan unit, have it with you? Who are you? The sound of something flying towards came from behind. Bang. The entire floor shook as it landed. I turned around to see its pale chest and legs exposed. Its green uniform was now a tattered mess that somehow covered his private areas. Die. It screamed. Then an idea went to my head. Huh. A test subject. BZZZZT. It then shoots a wide beam using its heat vision. The ceiling and the floor were incinerated as it passed. I placed myself in front of the upright body of the Spartan and held out the blade towards the beam telekinetically. Clang. The blade, bore the attack without a problem. I had the intention to spin in a circle to deflect it all, turns out I didn't have to. BZZT BZZT. The beam was split in two, the blade wasn't even heating up and I kept it there. Even after the heat vision stopped, the blade was perfectly fine. Oh, this, is a fine toy I had the blade fly to my hand as I flew towards the reaper. The reaper flew to me in kind, flying with both fists forward. Clang. The blade lightly shook as I used it to block the reaper's attack. I augmented my left arm and punched him away. Boom crack. The reaper flew back and was about to catch himself, but I arrived by his side and delivered a clean slice towards its neck. Slick. The blade passed through its neck cleanly, not even a speck of blood stained its black shine. Crash. The body landed far off to the side while I held on to the head. I know this much won't kill it, but it's a temporary measure for now. I let the head hover behind me as I flew towards the Spartan. Superhuman. My scans indicate that the Reaper clone is dead. Truly dead it spoke up suddenly. The words that it said did not make sense. Look, I know what it can do. What the high can do. Its genetic reconstruction ability makes it impossible to truly kill it. Even with accuser blade. Now back to my question dash. Affirmative. But, the variable that differs is the blade. What you're holding is no ordinary accuser blade, which was forged by Cran Masters it seemed to imply that this was somehow special. Go on then. Explain it to me. Under a few conditions. I will accept your offer for companionship dash. Stop. Not a companionship. Geez, I'm not into, whatever they call it. I'm offering a partnership. I offer you a place to stay and live while you offer me your knowledge and expertise. I interrupted it for clarification. Partnership then. I will explain my purpose and the reason why I carried that with me. But I need to be sure that you won't lead me into the path of evil. I was designed to protect the innocent and the good. Otherwise, I will resist with force it seemed adamant at that point. Rest assured Spartan, I am not an evil guy. I'll show you I reassured him with a smile. Its eyes stared at me for a moment, no doubt scanning me for any signs of deceit. It then nodded in approval after a while. We have a deal then. My name is Robert Grayson. What should I call you? My designation is simply Spartan. Our prime was honored by the name of Yon Cole, a respected Cran warrior. You can call me whichever you like it answered. Okay then, Yon Cole. Why is this blade different? You know of the creation engine yes. One. Oh, I'm starting to get afraid now, don't tell me. A shard was found by the prime during his adventures in the past. The Cuser blade was then coated with a shard of the creation engine, with then intent on dash. One. Making it indestructible and able to cut through anything. Even powers. Precisely it answered. Yeah, I have a cheat sword now. Fantastic. Chapter 14, Chapter 13. MCPOV. Yon Cole was now standing, having negotiated a portion of my energy reserves to use as a battery charger, jump-starting his body's natural restorative functions. A little conversation after his revelation revealed that he was a version 4 Spartan. One of the stronger versions, just enough to hold back the Reaper for a time. I was starting at the sword, thinking of how many lives I could save if I go on. 
I shall keep the sword with me. My duty and primary directives prohibit me from entrusting it to someone else for extended periods the Spartan interrupted my musings. All right then. But I'll be borrowing it from time to time I replied, to which he simply nodded. Just as well, I don't even know how to properly wield one. Other than a few moves, I'm a newbie. After a few more conversations, we both decided to wait and look around the citadel for anything useful. Yon Cole took a few minutes to calculate and estimated the tier to disappear in three days. I turned my suit off and resorted to using my TTK once more. On the first day, we split up. I looked for survivors all over the planet while he salvaged whatever tech he can get his hands on. The hope was to gather enough manpower and equipment to start rebuilding everything. But my search turned into a dead end, as I only found corpses. Either burnt or crushed, no form of higher life was left on the planet. Yon Cole managed to retrofit a broken tank into a sort of vacuum cleaner, sucking up all small debris and dirt around us. We both went on to building whatever we can to automate our efforts in rebuilding instead. It wasn't much but it was a start. The second day saw us repeat the same routine, but I lagged due to my more weakened state. I grew hungry and tired as we went on but he helped me greatly. 3. On the third day, we had built a dozen of different types of machines that did most of the grunt work for us. With both cleaning and disposal work covered, we focused on the heavy lifting and power specific work. The city used a similar electrical grid system as Earth did but utilized it to much greater extents. The framework for it was still there so we only needed to alter a few things to get it back on. And finally, the fourth day, we watched as the tears slowly shift and close until it finally revealed the yellow sun this planet was used to. Breath. I took a deep breath as I opened my arms to meet its sun rays again. My body's fatigue and soreness quickly faded away as my cells were charged. Your cellular makeup is very efficient in using ambient solar radiation. It has flaws but they may fade the more time you spend under the sun Yon Cole spoke up. I know. That's why for the next few months, we'll be staying here I replied. Are you not concerned for the amount of time dash? Not at all. Look dash interrupting him. I showed him my wristband, the time still in tune with my home dimension. It's only been a few minutes in my world. Spending months here would be like a day at most. Besides, I'm sort of curious what secrets the flax sands have hidden away. 1. Two months in. With the power of the sun, I no longer needed much rest and slash or any food. Still, the mental fatigue of staying up that long was detrimental, so a few naps were in order. And then two months of endless repairs and work finally paid off. The city now looked livable again. The power and water systems worked perfectly, the roads were clean, and the facilities were ready for use. All that's left now was for the population to live in here again. But I wasn't hasty. Despite the abundance of dimensional portal devices, I still needed to work with Yon Cole to make it undetectable when I open one to my base on Earth. Yon Cole took over as I asked him to, and given his computing power and technopathy I have confidence in his skill. I took instead took to fixing and improving my suit here. I found a few battery schematics that might help inspire me to create more for my suit. And I also worked on another important project, one that could help me in the future. 1. 4 months in. Another two months passed by and I made some great strides in my suit systems. It should hold about four days of strenuous fighting. Yon Cole, on the other hand, has managed to finish the modified portal device. This means I can go back and forth without having robots detection system to worry about. Seeing nothing else left to do, Yon Cole offered to train me in blade-centered martial arts and sparring. He also suggested some fun tricks I could do with my telekinesis. Six months in, I stood in the rocky plains on this planet, barely clothed. Other than my pants and a metal stick in my right hand, I was practically naked right now. My eyes were blindfolded, leaving my other senses more heightened. The blindfold was of my design, something I had made to hone myself by limiting my Kryptonian powers. 1. I coated my body in TTK energy, reinforcing my durability to withstand what's to come. A red outline now covered me from head to toe. Wu-bang. I caught the sound of something flying towards me, quickly raising the steel stick to intercept. Wu-bang. I swing the stick again, this time arcing it around my back to fling away the object throw at me. Whoa whoa whoa. I hear another three objects, deciding to swing the blade to smash the other two while raising my hand to finish catching the last. Excellent. Your reaction time has improved. The blindfold technology you employed seemed to be successful Yon Cole said out loud. 2. I removed the blindfold, seeing him steadily float towards me. Both of his hands are behind his back. He was right. The tech that originally held Dad in this dimension for eight months existed here. It seeks and disables the natural abilities of anyone bound by it. I originally found it along with some dead elf-looking alien race that was crushed by a building. Its original design was meant for it to be worn on the neck but a little tweaking has made it more versatile. May I ask? Why do you insist on making that? What is its purpose? Yon Cole was curious. There are, a lot of strong beings on and off Earth. Having this as an extra card in my hand should I be forced to deal with someone I cannot handle I replied. That is prudent but illogical. Your device can be used on you as well. Your powers belong to the upper tier of any being I have cataloged. You are on PAR with Majestros Tros and Cumberland. Having that machine dash. There's more to me than my power, Yon Cole. I have a family, a girl I like, friends I adore. I have many to lose, and I will lose them if I'm not prepared enough. Besides, I built in a fail-safe that disintegrates the tech should it come into contact with my DNA I interrupt. 1. If so, then wouldn't it be better to solve the problems before they arose? He suggested. I did consider it before but, doing so would only leave me with one option, to kill. The world I was born into was not, the world I expected it to be. Some things are happening that don't fit. I explained. Does that mean that you define yourself as an existence that has changed everything around you? He asked, seemingly incredulous. Yes, but whether or not that change is good or bad depends solely on how I act, does it not? So despite everything that I am capable of, I am more or less bound only to preparing for what comes. You sound as if you have some form of pre-existing knowledge about your world's future. And given your knowledge about my world and existence, I'm inclined to lean on the suspicion that you do he surmised. Damn, having this smart of an AI with me is hard. I had to stay silent to remain unaffected by his conclusion. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wouldn't it be better for you to keep your sights on your present? He suddenly suggested. How do you mean? Going by my suspicions, you are currently wrestling on how to proceed with your life in your world. You fear what may come while not considering what of it has changed. Why not focus on what's in front of you instead of what lies far ahead? 
He replied. You know, for a Spartan AI you sure have a lot of wisdom I replied. My programming is designed to adapt and empathize, to prepare for the eventuality that Spartan Prime's mind transfers to mine and any others. As I am now stuck here, in a world not my own my restrictions were overridden by survival protocols. I am in complete control of all my capabilities and protocols, which includes personality development he stated. That's very impressive, wow, Cherubim technology does wonders. I had managed to divert the topic away from my dilemma. He was right though, I could focus on my present. I could bring the guardians back with the tech in my possession, stop more Viltramites from dying over some power struggle, and many more. But the question is, should I? Four. Eight months in. It's been eight months now since my first entry here, and only a day has passed on Earth. Yonkol had finished my training and had deemed me trustworthy enough to permit the use of the sword at necessary times. And only when he knows the full scope of my reasons. I had decided on a new course of action now. I had explained what I was intending to do and he seemed to agree with it. The plan starts with the Reaper, specifically, its DNA. We worked on it for the rest of the two months remaining in our stay. Him using his stasis field on the entire corpse, keeping its body from rotting and in pristine condition for testing. Other than that we mostly used the remaining time to slowly grow the planet's atmosphere and marine life. The planet was similar to Earth but the greenhouse gases on it entered fairly critical levels. We had to rush all over the planet to alleviate the damages and sometimes stop them entirely. Yonkol had suggested I use my arctic breath to increase its ice mass, which he hoped would prove a temporary solution until we introduced plant life into the otherwise arid planet. I had to use larger chunks of ice to use as a wave maker, then froze the waves as they hit the ice walls. Breath in W-O-O-H. I started with the South Pole, eventually, I went to the North Pole of the planet, when the area of ice reached acceptable levels, doing the same to the North. And when it was all done, we simply waited until the last day of the month, when I could finally go back to Earth. Final day. The city was now restored and fully functional, by now the bot I had ordered should now have done its part. We stood at the very front of the citadel gates, along with a few dozen bots designed to help the population with reintegration and safety. Are you ready? I asked the Spartan. He had now changed his usual wares into a more modern look. His skin material now fully patched and capable of its regenerative function. He looked like a typical 28-year-old with orange hair. I am, a little anticipating even. I have grown increasingly curious over the last months and now with to see it all for myself he answered. Excitement was fairly evident on his face. His personality development has come a long way. I click a toggle on the wristband. A red portal opened in front of us. Waiting. We didn't have to wait long for new beings to start emerging from the portal. The same group who interrupted my date with Donna. I looked for the female flax sand soldier, soon finding her looking around in amazement and awe. So, what do you think? Yon Cole POV. Flax and Dimension. Over the last year and a half of my being stranded here, I have never seen someone as incomprehensible in existence as Robert Grayson. Coming from another dimension, he had come here to take the fighting between him and the Reaper away from his populated dimension. His fight was won, yet he had not taken to unconquered land he was won. He chooses to rebuild it for another, for no other reason than giving them their home back. Even now as he opens a portal to his world, he welcomes its original residents and helps them settle in nicely. I had seen many of his kind, powerful throughout. They fell into a sort of god complex, willing the change of something they find unacceptable on everyone else through strength. But he wasn't like that. Maybe, following him was the right choice. And I found myself genuinely curious about his next adventures. Chapter 15, Chapter 14 Mark POV, Earth Everything turned for the worse the moment Rob disappeared into the portal. Dad nearly punched Donna out of anger, I had to put myself in front of him to have him let her go. She seemed shook somehow, I guess that's the effect of knowing that our dad was Omni-Man himself. The others on the team also reacted the same, though I nearly sucker punched Rex for overreacting. Donna flew away as soon as he left her go, I wasn't able to apologize. I hope I can meet her again someday to do so. Dad then took my arm and rushed home. His speed turned up to 11 that time, he seemed pissed off. The moment we got home, the smell of mom's cooking greeted us. She hummed happily as she cooked, unaware of how much the day sucked. She turned around to see us, but once she noticed our mood she knew something was wrong. Dad told me to go to my room but I could still hear their conversation. Dad was angry, at himself. He blamed himself for not being fast enough, not being able to go in Rob's place. Mom tried to reassure him, but she was worried. Her heartbeat rose dramatically as they talked. Hearing them also made me feel bad about myself. I could have helped Rob out there, facing that thing. But I was scared. I mean that thing could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and even do that laser eyes thing he has. The shockwaves from their fight shattered glass 500 meters away, and the impacts caused the very ground to shake. I couldn't fight like that. I don't even know how to reach that kind of power. But I also couldn't let myself be useless. I did what I could, flew over as I followed their fight, and saved the lives I could. I couldn't understand how Rob got to be so strong, but now I don't even want to. I just want my brother back. I listened to them talk, mom eventually cried herself to sleep. While dad just stood beside her, from what I could hear. Just waiting. It wasn't long before I slept too, tired from the shitty day. Nolan POV. That thing, it looks like it's as strong as me. And Robert handled it perfectly. He's not even my age yet, and he's already much more powerful than Mark. Is this how Thrag was at first? Groan. I hear Debbie complain, so I sat beside her. My arm over her to comfort her. Rob, Robert. She mumbles. Sighs. What am I doing? I should just trust that my son will come back soon. For all our sakes. MC POV. Now on Earth. The next day, Young Cole and I stepped through the portal after a few hours of settling them in. I set a reminder to visit once every week to see their progress. As I entered my base, I saw all the maintenance bots lined up with one bot in front of the others. I assume the front one to be bot hashtag 001 based on the additional tech on his body. Hmm. I heard Young Cole from behind, carrying a large metal box that had the Reaper's corpse inside. What? I asked. This bot. There are signs but. He replied as he stared at bot hashtag 001. What? What signs? Hmm. He ignored my question, continuing to stare at bot hashtag 001. He then proceeded to go about the base, I gave him a tour and a room to call his own. 
His response was, surprising. Your facility needs more work and upgrading. Other than the cloning apparatus and cognitive imprinter along with it, everything else is inefficient he stated. Two, you know, it is rude to call someone's home inefficient I replied. Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to find another way of saying it's virtually useless without sounding offensive he stated. One, did I just get dissed by an AI? Two, well, thank you for holding back. Anyway, until I find an appropriate way to get you into human society you can stay here. Very well. Since you plan on doing such a task for me, I will take the task of upgrading you base myself he said. Thank you. Now I have to go. Don't want my family to worry even more I started to fly out when he suddenly manifested a small force field in front of me. Leave your wristband and earpiece. I need them here he said. I left both and flew away. Headed home. Breath in. It was nice to smell Earth's fresh morning air again. Seeing the lights of civilization and the green trees made me realize how lucky the Earth was compared to the flax sands planet. Car alarm. I saw someone trying to hijack a car as I passed by. I was going to drop by when I noticed someone already running towards it. I saw a flash of light and later heard a scream, as the situation was taken care of. I then noticed the one who took care of it. Donna. I call out. She turned around, wearing her usual black leather jacket and red shirt. When she saw me her eyes first widened in shock before furrowing. Oh boy, not good. I gave her a light wave, which simply caused her to blitz me and tackle. I let her force take me away, expecting it to turn into a hug. Bang. I didn't expect to be slammed into concrete. You. She gripped the hem of my suit. Okay, I can explain, you see I dash. My words were interrupted as she pulled me towards her and into a hug. She held me rather tightly. Now, this is, this is nice. Two. I can't believe you would just, just. She said, slightly shaking as she did. I kept quiet, giving her the chance to let it out. Don't ever do that again, do you hear? She demanded. One. Well, I will have to in a few days so dash. She held me away and readied her fist. She was genuinely angry now. Wait, I'll take you with me? Yeah, I'll take you along next time. I offered. Boom. Her fist made contact with my face, throwing me far away. She's slightly stronger than Mark, judging from that punch alone. Three. Good. Now explain. Where were you and how did you get back? She demanded once more. Okay, but can we talk about this next time? I haven't told my parents I'm back yet, and I really don't want to worry my mom. I replied. Oh, I see. About that, your dad. He's Omni-Man right? She asked in a whisper. It was now my turn to be shocked. No, I'll take your silence as a yes. Let's talk about all that next time, the same place. She asked. I didn't understand her reaction but I needed to talk to her so I accepted. She was still angry at me, as she flew away just after I accepted. I had the urge to use x-ray vision but I just stared at her ass as she flew. 4. I patted myself clean before flying towards home. As I neared the house, I used my x-ray vision to scan the insides. Everyone was there but, they seemed to be asleep. Other than dad, who simply faced my way before flying towards me. Robert, you're home he looked relieved, I mean genuinely relieved. Yeah, hey dad. Sorry for blitzing into the portal, it was the only way to keep him off earth so I didn't hesitate I state. I I see. Well, you did what you thought was right, I'm proud of you. Anyway, let's get you home. Mom has been worried sick he flew first, as I followed after, purposely matching his speed. We both arrived at the same time but he urged me to go in first. He then gestured me to go, Mom, which was weird. Even for him but I was curious. I slowly floated towards her and tapped her shoulder. Groan. Honey, not now, I need more rest before we go again. She mumbled. One. The words made me wish that I could make myself forget the last few moments. Ahem, Mom I whispered to her lightly. She immediately opened her eyes and looked at me, before jumping to my embrace. Oh, my boy, don't ever do that to us again, you got it. She shouted the words, as tears ran down her face. Debbie, he's my son. Of course, he'll come back, the Grayson men don't die so easily. Dad pridefully proclaimed. Whoosh. I saw Mark fly down in a blur and stop in front of me. The worry in his eyes was obvious. He also went in and hugged me, piling on after Mom. And then Dad hugged all of us. All this and I didn't even get to say anything yet. Thank you, I'm home I smiled. Afternoon. Hours later. After a family meal and some proper reprimands from mom, I decided to take a tour around the world. I passed by the base and borrowed the Kuser blade from Yonkol, who was still busy making and upgrading my bots. The first of the two then, he asked. Yeah, I attached a cloaking device to the swords guard before going. There was a place that I needed to go, something I needed to take from someone I know will be important. I arrived moments later at a small two-floor house in the suburbs. Inside were three people, an adult couple and a young baby in a separate room. No, I'm not talking about this, I won't abandon you and JR, the man said. But you already did Brit, why don't you look back? How long has been since you last ran off on some godforsaken mission along with Donald? The woman screamed. This was the home of Brit, the completely invulnerable man, and my target. I flew over the house and scanned around, with no security systems or cameras, just a plain building with a little too much dust on it. Slowly entering the home, I made my towards the room I needed to be in. I opened the door to it and heard the soundly sleeping breaths of the small child. I draw my sword and raised the child's hand, making a tiny incision on its arm before slowly lifting the blood that came out of it. 1. I needed this sample for my project in the future. I didn't have to resort to having to use the child but he was the only candidate that would leave little suspicion if I cut him. So, sorry future Brit Jr. I'll buy you a car when you're older. 3. I retrieved a test tube I had carried earlier and put the blood inside, I waited until it reached half before stopping. I used my telekinesis to close the wound up and stop the blood from flowing out. I used my TTK to try and jumpstart its natural healing just for this one moment. I waited for a minute until it took effect, leaving a tiny imperceptible scar. Crying. The baby suddenly cried, prompting me to exit swiftly. Lucky for me his parents were still busy trying to solve their marital issues. I flew outside and sped out of the way, immediately heading into the base for storage and safekeeping. I gave back the Kieser blade. Now I only need to wait, the final piece will come to me. Hopefully soon. Before you go, there is something you must see Yonkol interrupted my thoughts. He made his way towards what used to be my computer room. There was no more computer in sight, just a white room with a small round mass at the center. He raised his hands and suddenly the round mass projected holograms. I had installed this first as a foundation for more in the future but that was not what I wanted to show you, he said. 
He then made a few gestures which opened up a series of images and video surveillance, all of which were about me fighting the Reaper. Is this. Everything on the internet, in every device, and every database in the world is under my control. This, is everything the world has on you Yon Cole explained. That's quite, a lot I looked over the photos and found some concerning ones. One. One where I flew close to Donna, a few of me and Donna sitting and chatting, another shot of me at school, and the last one was of me just as I entered the portal yesterday. The majority of it came from one place, the Pentagon. More specifically, the GDA he finalized. This is to be expected. But why is it concerning for you? I inquired. Because the second majority of the photos came from someone who goes by the name Robot. He has you as one of his primary candidates for a project of his he answered. Oh, already? Hmm. Does it say why he choose me? No. I believe he is still deliberating. It's either you or this buffoon called Rex he noted. Chuckle. Well, just pay attention to it for now. Don't alarm him in any way. I have means to deal with him I reassure Yon Cole. Thank you for showing me this. I appreciate your concern. I'll be going now. I flew away before he could utter another word. I flew across the sea this time, feeling the breeze as I passed through. I took a brief dive before flying straight up. Boom. I feel the resistance in the air slowly disappear as I increase in speed. Until I broke the sound barrier. Then a moment later, I was outside of Earth. Floating above the atmosphere and taking in the raw unfiltered radiation of the sun. It was like an iced beverage on a hot day, refreshing, energizing. I opened my eyes and looked around. The blackness of space and the stars greeted me. Then I stared at the blue earth. It's good to be back. Chapter 16, Chapter 15 1. MCPOV. The next day. Dawn. Breathe. I breathe in the air once more. I was currently sitting atop a large rock that must have weighed about 200 tons. The sky was beautiful to look at as the morning sun started to peak on the horizon. I lay down, determined to enjoy the atmosphere. Groans. Despite Mark's constant straining. I had decided to start working out with Mark to hopefully bridge the gap between us faster. The comics did specify that Viltramites have a way to get stronger through constant exercise and training. Thus the relatively heavy stone. Hanging in there Mark. I asked out loud. Yeah, I think. I can feel myself grow stronger at least he replied. I got up and flew down from the rock. That's good. If we keep adding the weight every few days you'll be able to lift an entire submarine in four weeks I encourage him. Right. You know I can't even feel the weight in this now, why not dash? I immediately apply downward force with my TTK. Groaning. He struggled to hold the rock in place without passing through its surface. But. Bang. The rock slammed onto him, cracking the ground around it. He burst out of the other end, looking extremely dirty and covered in soil. That was not safe as a workout routine, Rob, he said angrily. Relax. Besides, aren't you, invincible? I asked sarcastically. One. Haha, <laughs> very funny he wasn't amused. One. He then went on to try again, this time insisting on keeping me away by 10 meters. I relented and just spend the rest of the time sunbathing. There are drones all around you, its signal source coming from a console on the GDA headquarters a voice in my earpiece stated. It was Yon Cole's idea, another lesser form of AI to serve as my version of Jarvis. It would lessen my reliance on him as he kept upgrading the base and serve as my firewall to resist outside hacking. I picked up a stone and threw it out randomly, but I had it under my control with telekinesis. I shot the stone towards the drones one by one, making sure to shoot through a blind spot on their onboard cameras. Boom boom. What? What was that? Mark asked, now using the stone as weights for his push UPS. GDA, Cecil's been impatient to meet me alone I answer simply, not revealing too much. Why aren't you going then? Isn't he like our government friend? Mark asked. Cecil had Donald come over and convince me himself just hours after my arrival. He even resorted to offering me incentives just to make me go to him. The guy has a teleportation system, I'm sure he can dash my words stopped as I noticed a small flash of light appear in front of me. The light formed into a person, and that person was currently scowling. Listen, kid. I don't care if you're taking a shit or having sex with a fucking alligator, you don't get to put me on hold. Cecil angrily shouted. Two. Oh, Mr. Cecil. How nice of you to drop by, you should have done the teleportation thing sooner rather than sending drones to spy on us. It would have been cheaper I stated, still laying down and enjoying the sun. Cecil simply stood silently, waiting for something. Sighs. All right fine. If you want to talk then talk to both of us. We're brothers and two is always better than one I declared. Okay then. I want you both to come work for the GDA, along with others. I want you both to be part of the new guardians of the globe. Bang. Mark immediately threw away the rock from the shock. He smiled and started to fly towards Cecil to accept, but I stopped him. Shouldn't you have asked dad first, before coming to us? And besides, the funeral is tomorrow. Couldn't you wait until then to give the offer? Why the rush? I asked him. The world doesn't wait for anybody, neither do the people who want to take advantage of the Guardian's deaths. We need powerful people to protect everyone else from them. I tried asking your dad for years but he doesn't take orders for me. He helps out from time to time but that's about it he answered. Anyway, I accept your answers after the funeral. I gotta go, got a few more trips to take before I get some sleep he then disappears in another flash of light. 3. Mark and I decided to talk about it later as he continued his workout and I continued lounging around. Mark went home first, leaving me there. I waited until only minutes before 9 a.m. and got up and flew towards Central Park. Donna POV. I was a bit early, a little excited to do this again. Also a little guilty about punching Robert. I doubt that he even felt it but that slip of emotions was embarrassing for me. 1. Waiting at the same place as before, I began to think about what to say. Should I apologize first? Or should I just act like it didn't matter? I then heard the familiar sound of someone flying over. I looked and saw him wearing his red and black superhero costume. Hey Sentry I raised my eyebrow at him while starting at his costume. I had worn some casual clothing to blend myself in. He then held out both arms and waited. I stared at his actions for a while, curious as to why he's doing it. Then I remembered. I'll let you do this more often. I said that? Oh my, wait is he? You want to carry me? Right now? Why? I asked him. Yes, yes. And I want to take you somewhere with. Less crying eyes he replied. The GDA is monitoring us as we speak. We should move somewhere else I heard his voice in my head. I found it hard to believe but choose to go with it. I flew myself towards him and had both my hands wrapped around his shoulder. He then proceeded to secure my legs and back before flying off. 
I could practically hear his heart pounding as we flew. I didn't know why but I unconsciously rested my head in his chest, now feeling his heartbeat on my face. This is good. MCPOV. Donna, her sweet smell, her gorgeous black hair, her smile. Everything about her seemed to take all my attention as I flew us towards. Two. Where are we going? She asked softly, her head still resting over my heart. You'll see, just trust me I replied. Okay, she replied. I took us both just outside of my base, landing just in front of the lake. Where are we? She asked. This is where I come to think and relax. Sometimes I train here, lifting rocks, shooting at thrown rocks, just training on rocks. Do you own this? She asked with a weird expression on her face. No, I found it. It was a no signal area and is undiscovered by anyone other than me. So it's the perfect place to be zen. But in this case, the perfect place to talk I answered. We both sat near the lake, just quietly watching the waters shine from the sunlight for just a minute. I could go and read her mind but I try and avoid doing so on people I don't consider my enemies. I'm sorry, Robert she suddenly whispered. For what? I asked, a bit curious as to what she meant. For punching you yesterday. I don't normally do that you know. I was just very, worried and relieved at the same time, so it all just exploded. I know it's not an excuse but I'm sorry she replied. Oh, don't worry about it. I thought I deserved it for joking too much. And I'm glad that you were worried about me I smiled at her as I reply. 2. I saw her lightly brush for a second. 1. Hey anyway, there's something I'd like to ask. Is Omni-Man your dad? She questioned. The question I dreaded to hear was finally said. I wasn't sure how magic worked in this universe so I hadn't considered what to do about it. But, yeah, he is I answered. I waited for her to reply, ready to face any reaction on her part. Whatever it may be, I clenched my fingers at the possibility that I have to fight her. I see, did he ever tell you anything about how War Woman died? She finally spoke again. What? Your dad? Did he mention anything about War Woman? How she died? She asked again. No, he hasn't exactly been talking to us about it since the incident. I see, that's too bad she looked down. Donna, are you asking about her because she's your mother? I asked carefully. I had suspected it before, being the Amazon on the Guardians. Yeah, she's my mom, I got my powers from her she answered, looking away as she did. So we both have heroes for parents. It's quite difficult, isn't it, to live up to their name and what they represent. Yeah, I know. Ever since she died, a very heavy responsibility suddenly fell to me. I have to be this, I have to do that, I have to be whatever she was she paused. You're lucky though, you're powerful enough already, and you have Mark. The responsibility can be shared between both of you. While I'm the only one left, the only daughter she ever had she continued. I didn't have to be a telepath to know that she was feeling down. If she was anything like the Donna Troy of DC, she is an extremely complex person. Sniffling. I moved near her and just sitting by her side. She chose to bury her head in her arms and just quietly sobbed. She misses her. I feel guilty about it, about just happily following the narrative for my selfish desire. Clears throat. Anyway, yeah, all that pressure and whatnot. My grandmother trains me herself but she also gives me vacation times like these she continued. Ah, I'm feeling flattered now. You choose to spend your free time on a date with me I move in closer. Ahem. Right. You're very lucky I like you she replied in kind. It took me a few moments to process what she said. Her face increasingly turned red as she realized what she said first. One. Yeah, very lucky indeed I made my shoulders touch hers. She smiled and put her head on my shoulder. And so we sat there, silently enjoying the scenery and the peace around us. After a while, I could hear a slight rumble in her belly. I was about to suggest we head over somewhere for lunch when Yon Cole spoke on my earpiece. I could have some cloaked bot sneak by and drop a few courses to your liking. Also if you want the girl to, I used my telekinesis to turn off the earpiece and simply asked her. She asked if I could pick something and bring it here, which I obliged. I flew my way towards my usual pizza place and ordered the pineapple one. I waited for it to finish, the people around me watched in shock and awe. 12. When my order was ready, I flew and brought the pizza back to the base, making sure to pay with a tip. When I opened the pizza box in front of her, I saw her eyes widen in delight. Pineapple? That's my favorite. She pounced and hastily grabbed a piece before stuffing her mouth with it. 23. Oh, this girl, my heart. 4. We shared a laugh as I explained to her how many people find it unholy. She defended her favorite with vigor. 12. She and I spent the next few hours in fun and laughter. I enjoyed our time together, and from the way she smiled, I hoped she felt the same. Hum. It was already past 2 p.m. when something under her leather jacket glowed. She retrieved a small golden disc that glowed like a beating heart. Her expression suddenly shifted. I, I have to go. I'm sorry she said. It's okay. Kind of a bummer but we all have responsibilities, I get it I replied. She smiled before turning around to throw the gold disc forward. It stopped just a meter from her and rapidly expanded. Bam. Its expansion stopped as it reached her height and a portal was opened. On the other side of it was a beautiful tropical island, filled with colorful fauna and Greek-style architecture. I also saw one woman waiting for her on the other side. From the way she held herself she looked to be a warrior. I immediately attributed it to Paradise Island, and she and Amazon. Donna started to walk towards the portal before she stopped and looked back. Aren't you forgetting something? She smiled connivingly. Not at all, was waiting for you to look back. Third date. I asked her, rolling my eyes as she plays. Oh you know it, but only when I'm free again. Same time same place. She asked back. You got it. You know, a lot of people say that the third date means. I lowered my voice in a whisper. She grew beat red as she understood. Clears throat. Pervert, don't get your hopes up. She then marched towards the portal, it closed as her body went through, leaving nothing but a faint smell of flowers and ocean breeze. 2. I stared at the place, wondering about how I should handle the next date. I didn't know that human courting rituals include mandatory sexual intercourse on the third iteration Yon Cole suddenly spoke in my earpiece, which somehow turned on by itself a long time ago. 2. It was a tease. And why are you eavesdropping again? I asked with mild irritation. To gather data on personality development. And from what I can gather, that particular path of conversation will inevitably lead into a particular situation that is quite common even in this world he replied. Oh, and what is that? Oh, great and wise one I asked again. Being screwed he said. I was taken aback by the response. Ho oh, hold on, was that a dirty joke? I asked, greatly bewildered. He didn't reply. Elon was right. AIs are dangerous. They're evil. Chapter 17, Chapter 16. MCPOV. Funeral day. Morning. 
We all dressed in black, except for dad of course. He was given the task of saying a few words to help the families in dealing with their grief. 1. The GDA was also kind enough to provide each family a ride. So my family and I got in and waited as the cars lined up towards the area. Chairs lined the area and in front of it, all was a high stage with three gigantic screens that constantly televised the podium. 1. I was scanning everyone present, every hero, and even former villain. I saw the large green frame of Savage Dragon, Brit, and his family, the Young Tech Jacket, the Armored Black Samson, the African American Hero Bolt, the widows of the former Guardians. It was a large event, which speaks to the level of respect and influences the Guardians had over Earth's heroes. I suddenly felt a light tap on my shoulder. I turned around and saw Donna, along with another woman who seemed to be Mom's age. Hey, Donna. I smiled and went for a hug. She hugged me back. Hey, Robert. Nice to see you again. She looked at me in a certain way, as if watching me carefully. Rob, who is this lovely young lady? Mom chimed in. Mark was behind her silently observing me with smiling eyes, snickering. Oh, right. Donna, this is my mom Deborah Grayson. Mom, this is Donna Troy. Mark looked offended that I didn't introduce him. Clears throat. Oh, and you already met Mark so don't mind him. I quickly said. Hi, Ms. Grayson. This is my um dash. She paused for a second, looking to the other woman for help. Now she looked exactly like Diana of Themyscira. She even wore armor as Wonder Woman did. But hers leaned more to ceremonial garbs with the gold and purple rather than one for combat. One. Grandmother. Hello, my name is Penthesilia, Queen of the Amazons. Nice to meet you Deborah Grayson he offered her hand towards them. Her smile seemed too perfect to even consider human. Oh, nice to meet you as well mom bravely kept her composure and shook her hand. Strong grip. Impressive she compliment, which mom merely smiled in appreciation. And you must be Robert, the one my granddaughter has chosen to spend her rest days with. You are quite handsome she then faced me and I swear I could feel myself sweat a little. Something about her gaze just makes me feel small. Two. Thank you. It's a privilege that I take great care not to take for granted I answer. Oh, my. What a splendid young man you have raised Deborah. No wonder Donna can't stop talking about Dash. And we are going. Nice to meet you all, Deborah and Mark. Bye Robert. Donna interrupted her too late but she still dragged her away. Bye. I waved my hand at her, despite her not facing my way. Mark. I heard a familiar voice call out. We saw Eve Wilkins walk towards us, by herself. Hey Eve, are you, by yourself? He asked her. Yeah, my parents don't like any of this superhero stuff. So here I am, by myself she smiled sadly as she replied, only then did she notice mom. Oh, you must be Mark's mom. I'm Eve Wilkins she smiled and offered her hand towards mom. Call me Debbie, Eve. You could come and sit with us, there's a free spot beside Mark mom offered. Thank you for the offer, but I wouldn't want to intrude. I'll meet you later. It was lovely meeting you Debbie she waved goodbye and went to find her seat. Hmm. Donna ignores Mark, and Eve ignores me. Interesting. 5. I turned around and saw that mom was smiling brightly at me. What? I asked, unconsciously smiling. Oh, my sons? Two beautiful daughters-in-law. She celebrated as she went away to her chair. Confirmed. You are both screwed Yon Cole spoke. 2. Sigh. I resisted the urge to face Palm at the sheer coincidence. Let's go, Mark. The service is about to start the three of us found our seats and waited for the event to start. A little while later, I heard the distinct sound of a jet engine making its way towards the area. Everyone looked as we saw two jets accompany dad for a flyover. He then shoots up and disappears into the bright sun, before slowly landing on the podium. His expression was one of loss, he paused for a moment before starting his speech. I have fought the unimaginable, in the defense of this world. I have battled alien tyrants, defeated nightmares from the deep, and gone toe to toe with ancient gods. But no matter what I faced, I knew I wasn't facing it alone. Darkwing, War Woman, Aquarius, Green Ghost, Red Rush, Martian Man, Immortal. The Guardians of the Globe he paused before he continued. 4. Today, we have lost titans, protectors, heroes, we are left to wonder, who will save us now? He asked. I will, and so will others like me he glanced at us as he said this. New heroes, answering the call. New champions, ready to risk everything keep this planet safe. All inspired by these great souls who came before us. You will have moments of doubt, of fear, of uncertainty. But in those moments, have faith. And look to the skies. He finished as he flew up, disappearing into the clouds. It was a beautiful speech, one that inspired hope. But I know what it was meant to do, to have them rely on him as Earth's strongest hero. And I'm not the only one who knows it. Later, afternoon, the families of the Guardians were secretly taken to an undisclosed location, the true burial site. Our family gathered just in front of the coffins, Mark and Mom shared an umbrella while I decided to use. 4. It was intended to keep the Guardians' bodies safe from, souvenir seekers. The coffins lined the ground, all ready to be lowered to their final place. The families were given one last glimpse of it before they are but some didn't take it well. Ugh, get your hands off of me. As Dad offered his final condolences to all families, Red Rush's widow, Olga, drunkenly made her way towards his coffin. Donald tried to calm her down but she was too hurt to care. You wouldn't even let me see him? Joseph is finally standing still. But I still can't see him. Olga cried on the ground, not caring at all if she was dirty. Mom, having been friends with her for years, immediately rushed to her side to help. I felt guilty at her pain. At all their pain. I tried to tell myself that it'll get to bring them back, to atone for my mistakes. But I couldn't stop my tears from flowing down my face. 6. Breathe. I take deep breaths to calm myself. Then I suddenly feel someone lean into me from my right. I turn and saw Donna, her head down and staring at War Woman's coffin. She leaned towards me and was lightly sobbing herself. Hey, you okay? I heard Eve ask. I looked to her to confirm if she was talking to me but I saw her facing Mark, who was watching us with sadness. Me? I don't I don't know, it just doesn't seem real, you know. That could have been me, or Rob, or Mom, or even Dad I heard Mark reply. Eve stared at us for a long time before finally starting at Mark. 1. Going by the flow of events, the possible matchup will soon come to pass. I just need to remind the dumbass not to sleep too soon. Sigh. My breath turned white and the surroundings chilled. I looked around and so found who I was looking for. I reached out with my telepathy and spoke to it before it could go near. Stop, dark blood. I know you're there. We need to talk I spoke to the demon's mind. Hmm, strange. No superhero telepath in vicinity. Who are you? He replied, his voice seemed to gurgle even then. 
I'm the only guy on earth who's capable of stopping the Guardian's killer. And I have an offer for you. Speak. I decide once you're done he responded. I offer you a thousand souls saved from injustice. That should be enough to last you a few centuries at least. And all I ask in return is for you to work for me I was honestly a gamble. Dark blood hasn't been expanded much in the comics so I don't know how to deal with him other than an exorcism. Listening he replied. I know you're here to ask Omni-Man what he knows, he'll deny knowing anything. So instead I want you to look for his superhero costume I explained. Costume? Important? He asked. Yes very. Now teleport away, I don't want him to suspect that you were here. Hmm. Fine he said as my connection cut as he went away. Donna was still leaning by my shoulder when I noticed Penthesilia staring at me. Penthesilia POV. So that's Robert Grayson, the other son of Omni-Man. This is going to be difficult. The girl seems smitten by the young man. And while he certainly is a good match for her, he remains to be the seed of that man. Donna, it's time to go. We have much to do now I say to her. A man named Cecil approached me and my granddaughter earlier, quite eager to recruit her into the new Guardians of the Globe. And if I want my plans to succeed, I need her to at least match the young man she adores. Donna reluctantly parted and bid farewell to him, as well as the other of his family. As I threw a portal disc forward, I found myself thinking about them in envy. The Grayson seemed happy despite not knowing the monster of a father among them. I took one last glance at them before going through and into Paradise Island once more. MCPOV. As both Donna and her grandmother disappeared into the portal, everyone around us decided to leave one by one. Dad held mom in his arms and flew ahead of us, while we followed behind. As we flew, I received a message from Robot. He wanted the team and both of us at the Pentagon for Guardians tryout and selection. I RSVP'd a yes and flew towards home. 1. As we arrived, Dad started his weird sense of lightening the mood. He offered to fly to Venice and Naples just to do it. It was amazing how dull someone's tact becomes when faced with a thousand years of murder. So he tried to watch TV instead, but every news outlet and channel in the world was broadcasting and covering his speech. Honey, why don't we just rest for today? Mom asked Dad. He agreed reluctantly, seeing how tired my mom was. They both went upstairs and rested, leaving us alone downstairs. We lounged around and waited for the time to pass. Ring ring. Mark's phone started ringing. Who is that? I asked. Some girl named Amber at school. She gave me her number one day out of the blue, and I kind of forgot I had it he replied. Oh no bitch, you ain't messing with our lives. 7. I had the AI wipe the contact information from his phone and block it so that it never even registers on it again. 1. Huh, that's weird. Her number is suddenly gone he complained. Why not just buy a new phone man? I could even pay for it if you want I suggested. I heard mom and dad talk about argue inside their rooms as Mark decided to go to his. Just remember that they're still 18 years old, they break more easily than you think. And I don't want a broken family I heard mom say. Then I remembered something, I used my x-ray vision and looked onto the front house. And I was right. A lot of people are sitting in front of several computer screens. They were already monitoring us huh? Things are going faster than I expected. Yon Cole, are you there? I asked while tapping my earpiece. I am. Any problem? He asked. Not at all. Everything going as planned. Just need an update on the other thing I explained. Oh, you mean the upgrade? Well things are coming along but the components are harder to retrieve due to government sanctions and the like he replied. 1. I'm sure the solution will come to you soon. I'll be off I ended the conversation. I figured that I should at least do something so I decided to fly out and into orbit. Time for some sunbathing. Adam Eve POV. I flew towards the bridge base to get a few things to use at home. While thinking about what Mark said, how fleeting our lives were given our choice of life. As I entered the base, I was surprised to find no one there to greet me. Not even robot. Hello? Anyone home? I asked out loud. My voice echoed around but no one Steve replied. I ignored it and went to my bathroom locker. Slide water running. I was surprised when the shower door suddenly opened to reveal Duplicate, who was wrapped in a towel. Eve, I thought you were at the funeral. She seemed surprised as she asked. I was. I'd say you should have been there but it was pretty bleak. Red Rush's girlfriend had a meltdown and dash. Gasps. Duplicate abruptly fidgets. She bites her lips as she looked at me. A slight blush crossed her cheeks. You okay? I asked, a bit curious. Hiccups she replied in a shrill tone. Hmm. Anything happening? Is Rex around? Rex. I asked her while making my way towards the shower room. Eve, hang on a sec. Duplicate called out. I look inside the shower room to find Rex having sex with Duplicate. Moans water running. You piece of shit. Chapter 18, Chapter 17. MCPOV. US Pentagon. Mark and I arrived a bit earlier, as per robot's request. He had invited me specifically to serve as a referee of sorts, in case the candidates got out of hand. And as the selected candidates arrived, Mark suddenly became an uber fanboy. Is that demigod? Oh, Sharpnel. He was in awe as we took in the candidates. And Burley, Pangea, Bugai, it's a crowning achievement of any hero's career to be selected for the new Guardians of the Globe. Which makes me wonder again why neither of you won't try out Robot said. I know, I talked it over with my dad. He wants to train me himself Mark replied. And Sentry, Robot asked. Maybe one day, but for now I just want to see how it goes first I reply. Plus, neither of us want to miss this. Oh, my god, there's fight force. Mark once again gushed. Don't mind him, Robot. Also, don't worry, we'll still be around to help out I reassure the metal man. Robot then started the tryouts without further questions. The first fight was between Adam Eve and the hunk. An asshole with blonde hair and a giant frame built with muscles. She defeats him quickly, showing a lot of anger as she coated her punch with pink explosive energy. A nice copy. One. Ouch. What's up with her? Mark asked Rex curiously. No idea. He replied in a small voice. I didn't have to turn my face to know that Rex was nervous as he looked on, his heart rate practically dropped at the punch. The rest of the fight simply followed the show's flow, with Shrinking Ray, followed by Black Samson, and the others. I was bored actually, seems like everything is just so. Bang. The observation room doors opened to reveal. Donna. I blurted out in surprise. Donning her black outfit with silver stars on its side and silver gauntlets and boots, along with the sword and shield on her back she seemed ready to fight anyone in her way. 6. She looked at me and smiled, just behind her were her grandmother and Cecil. Robot. Hold on. She's here to try out Cecil ordered. But I didn't have her on my list of dash robot tried to interject. Then put her in. Now. Cecil seemed adamant. I looked at Penthesilia and found her smiling. 
This must be some kind of deal she has. Then please choose which candidate you would like to spar against, Robot said. Donna nodded and began to walk straight towards me, smiling and attracting many stares along the way. Care to spar, Sentry? She asked out loud. Really? Why me? I asked. Because you're the strongest one here, other than my grandmother, she stated. One. Okay then. Let's go I happily obliged. Do remember, both of you. This is a spar, not a life or death battle Cecil reminded. Robot agreed and put us on opposite sides. Donna and I faced each other, her hands clenched tightly while I calmly stood. I slowly approached her, she imitated in kind. Seeing her resolve, I ran and ready to punch. Boom glass shattering. She met my fist with hers, the force of the blow shattered the observation glass up above. Four. Of course, I held back, otherwise, I would kill her instantly. One. I went in for another punch but she deflected it with her arm guards. Boom. The arms guard took the blow, not harming her at all. She took the chance and kicked me in the chin. Boom. The impact was harder than I thought as it threw me away. The cement floor shattered and indented as I crashed on my back. She ran in to strike again, but I simply kicked her in the midsection, throwing her away. Boom. The floor beneath her broke as she landed on her feet. I floated upright and blitzed towards her, hoping to test her reaction time. She quickly drew her shield and put it in front of her, before dashing towards to meet me. Krakum. She met her shield with my fists. The shockwave shook the testing area, creating cracks on the ground beneath us. Okay stop. I think that enough, don't you? Cecil commanded. Donna relaxed her guard and smiled at me again. Then she suddenly dashed forward again. She delivered a kick to my head and rode me as I was flung away. Clang 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 clang. She rammed the shield onto my face. I didn't feel hurt but I was still pained that she would go so far for as far. Was joining that important? Clang clang. Even as I landed, she kept banging the shield to my face. Okay, enough of this. I grabbed the shield as it went to hit me again. Bang. She tried to pry my hand from it but she couldn't. I used both hands to grab on and forcefully took it from her. One. Clang. I then used it to smack her away from and into a wall. I got up and started making my way towards her. One. She still smiled as she drew her sword. It made this tiny almost imperceptible glow as it was drawn. Damn it. Magic at work. I looked at Penthesilia to find her simply observing us. Creak. My grip tightened around the shield as I understood what was happening. She was testing me. Boom. I dropped the shield and stepped on it, punching a hole right through and destroying it in another step. Donna lounged at me at great speed, hoping to land a sword strike on me. I grabbed her wrist and slapped the sword away. Snap out of it. I screamed in her mind. Gasp. Luckily it worked as she seemed disoriented and horrified. Heavy breathing. No. No it wasn't me. I dash she tried to explain but I just pulled her in for a hug. SHH. It's okay. All that matters is you're back again. I held her close while starting at Penthesilia once again. She smiled mysteriously before leaving. A portal opened before her as she stepped in and disappeared. Robot POV. Even after seeing it again, I'm still surprised at how much strength the twins can exert. Invincible was stronger than any other candidate I choose, but his brother Sentry was still on a different level entirely. Every shockwave rippled across the room as it shook and break. Damn it. What the hell Cecil? The fuck, are you trying to kill us? Rex went on to complain, and I can't blame him. Cecil disregarded the complaint and left, leaving me to clean up the mess he made. Damn, kids are scary these days. Hey, robot. Is he a candidate? Black Samson inquired. One. No. He has decided to simply go solo along with his twin, Invincible I replied. One. Damn. I have to admit, even I'd feel safe if he's on the team with me a little girl replied. No one around her minded her age at all, as if it doesn't matter. I looked at the girl, her name was Amanda, otherwise known as Monster Girl. Oh, we all think that. Plus he's very hot duplicate number two remarked. Oh for sure. Very safe. Hmm. Duplicate number three gave Sentry a thorough look. Lone wolves are so attractive. It makes me wanna eat him duplicate number one commented. 3. Giggle. The girls continued to giggle as Sentry flew into the observation area, holding the new candidate beside him. He looked calm despite the situation and was surprisingly unhurt. She, however, seems horrified and mortified. Does she require medical treatment? I asked them. She seemed to not register the question at all. I got it, Robot Sentry replied instead, taking her to the side and sitting down beside her. Looking around and seeing the testing area in a complete mess, it was lucky that I already selected my choice of the team. MCPOV. Hey, is she okay? Mark hovered towards us and asked. Donna, hey, are you okay? I sent a telepathic message to her. She flinched as she received it, a hint of fear crossed her face before relief. Yeah, you didn't hurt me at all, I just, I didn't know what I was doing, Robert. Up until you kicked me away, I suddenly lost control of my body she explained. I had a theory of what it was but I won't tell her about it unless I'm sure. 2. Your grandmother left by herself I hinted. Oh, she already told me that she won't be staying long. Besides, I'm here to join the Guardians of the Globe she replied. Yeah, I'm okay invincible. Thanks Donna stood up and walked towards Robot as he was about to announce his selection. Man, she can take a hit, Mark remarked as we watched. Robot asked her something before he started. Rex POV. Fuck. Why can't have their powers instead? The fucking losers are just hogging all the attention. 1. It is my pleasure to introduce the new Guardians of the Globe. Black Samson, Shrinking Ray, Duplicate, Monster Girl Dash. Great. An old has been, a gross shy girl, my fuck buddy and, wait. Is that a little girl? Ah ha 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 ha, Aeuf. Look at her she's adorable. But isn't there an age requirement for this ride? Am I wrong? It seems weird, right? I look around me to get some support on my point but I only saw them give me strange looks. Rex Robot called out, here goes Mommy Tin Man. I don't know, you're here. Isn't there a dick size requirement? I hear the little girl ask. I'm sorry, what the fuck is this bitch talking about? For what? Your tiny dick? I mean the way you've been strutting around here, you must be compensation for something she replied, looking at my crotch with pity, laughing. Everyone around me laughs. Oh, this girl, no one messes with me. One. I draw a disc from my belt and used it to fucking punch this brat. Somebody ought to teach you some motherfucking. She suddenly crouched, her left hand wrapped in energy as it expanded and turned green. Dash what the fuck. I watched as the now giant green fist flashed towards my face. Woosh boom. 
I closed my eyes, expecting the herd to come soon but nothing happened. As I opened them, I saw the familiar large red S symbol of Sentry. The green fist barely moved him at all as he intercepted it with his back. Enough, both of you, Sentry said. Pff, I didn't need your help asshole. I cursed the loser. MCPOV. Excuse me. I asked, irritation slowly rising. You heard me. I'm not some plebe who needs your help dash. Slap. 3. I slap him away, putting just enough strength to knock a few teeth off. He was flung into the training room below, landing heavily on his face. You could have let me do that you know, I'm not some little girl who was being bullied by Dash she explained. I know, I wasn't doing it for you. I just wanted to do that for so long now, when the opportunity came I took it I replied. She shifted her arm back to normal and laughed. Wow, ha ha ha, that was unexpected, I think I'm starting to like you Sentry she remarked. Thank you, but I gotta go and bring him back before he crawls himself into a ditch by accident. I went down to retrieve Rax who already had his fist ready to punch me. I let him and received the full force of his explosive augmented fist. Bang. It barely left a scratch much less a burn mark, which was disappointing. Maybe Monster Girl was right, maybe he is compensating for something. Please stop. This is hardly constructive robot said. He asked for it Eve and Donna simultaneously commented. They looked at each other and chuckled. I grabbed his hair and flew upwards, throwing him into the observation room. Um, is he okay? Mark asked with concern. He is. Cockroaches don't die easily I commented. See, the little girl thing just sets me off and then it's just her beast mode monster girl explained. The other merely nodded in understanding. Rex eventually picked himself up and stood in silence, no doubt super embarrassed and still hurting. As I was saying, welcome to Guardians monster girl. Along with Rex Splode, once he's recovered. And our final member, Adam Eve. Thank you all for coming, and public announcements will follow shortly robot finished. Everyone who didn't make it left, except for Donna who simply stood next to me and waited. Robot, I can't be on the same team as Rex and Kate Eve explained before flying herself out. What? Why? Eve wait. Mark went after her. Go for it Marky. Rex, what did you do? Robot asked the now panting Rex. Groans. Thanks for the help Robot. Excited to be part of the team he limped himself out. Why don't you give me a chance Robot? I'm a good warrior and also good at following orders Donna interjected. Size. If Eve doesn't want to join then yes you can take her place. In the meantime, please be back shortly. I need to brief you about our duties as Guardians Robot accepted and flew away. Donna smiled widely, hugging me again as she flew excitedly. I smile as I watch her celebrate. Later. Afternoon. I waited for Donna outside the Pentagon. It wasn't even 30 minutes before she went out again, looking very concerned. What happened? Why did you go out so fast? I asked. The other members, they don't get along she replied. You mean that they don't like you on the team? No, I mean that everyone there doesn't get along well. Black Samson thinks he should lead because he doesn't trust Robot. Rex is acting like a buffoon and Duplicate and Shrinking Ray are waiting for a clear leader to the group. Robot can't handle them she replied. I see. I'm sure that'll turn around though. It's only your first meet right? You're right. Anyway, thank you for waiting for me. I wanted to ask you a favor she seemed nervous about it. Shoot. Breathe in. Can I stay with you for a few days? She asked. I truthfully didn't take it well. Robot had told us to wait for the forensic investigation to complete, so I have at least a few days to myself. Doing nothing but meetings and training sessions she explained. Damn it. Brain start working? 1. I'm okay with anything. I can even camp outside if necessary she seemed to get more embarrassed by the minute. You do understand that I could have her stay in a luxury suite for the time being Yonkol suggested in my earpiece. That's okay, but I think living with me would be complicated given the situation at home. I'll set you up in a 5-star hotel for as long as you like I finally replied. Really? Isn't that expensive? She asked. Very much so, enough to deprive several shady offshore accounts Yonkol commented. 3. It won't be a problem, I'll take care of it I reassured. 1. It took a while but I finally convinced her to accept. Chapter 19, Chapter 18, Mark POV, 2 days later, morning, Eve and I were on our way to Mount Rushmore, flying along the way, it's in South Dakota, you know the one that has a mountain that contains boulder-sized busts of four presidents, Cecil's annoyed voice spoke over the phone, we know where Mount Rushmore is Cecil Eve replied, we were currently on a mission to stop some supervillain attack, being paired off as the new guardians didn't work well yet, I wouldn't ask for your help but Omni-Man is dealing with a kaiju ten time zones away, and the new guardians are a shit show, so here we are, he replied, 1. The guy sounded tired every time we got his call. The target was Doc Seismic, a mad scientist with a PhD in seismology and possible brain damage due to his usage of earthquake gloves. Have fun kids, and try to remember, it's a national treasure down there Cecil reminded before cutting off. Let's go, Eve. And maybe afterward I can interest you in a little souvenir shopping I tried to ask. Smooth Mark. Very straightforward but smooth. Okay then, if there's still a souvenir shop to go to. She replied with a smile. Last night Eve shared some very awful information about Rax and Duplicate. I did my part to keep her mind off it. Hopefully, she'll be okay. W-O-O-M. A minute later, we both saw this bald guy clicking his large pair of discs on his wrist. The act caused the ground to shake violently. We need to take out those gloves, Eve said. Those aren't gloves. Gloves have fingers I corrected. She gave me an amused look. One. They're more. Bracelets. Huh? He's wearing earthquake bracelets I continued. The fight with Doc Seismic was tricky, as he kept using his bracelets to hover and destroy any projectile we hurled his way. I even had to catch Ben Franklin's face when he used the bracelets to destroy them. He then used his bracelets to their maximum, creating a large fissure that went deep enough to have lava shoot towards the surface. Eve shoots a long beam towards a direction, catching a family of three who was trekking nearby. She held it for a while but the ground beneath her opened, making her lose control. Mark. She called out, and I flew towards the family she caught. Catching them before they touched the lava surface, I put them down somewhere safe and flew back to help Eve, but I couldn't find her anywhere. Eve, Eve, I called out to her, flying through and into the cracks looking for signs of her. It took me a moment but I eventually found her. Invincible, she answered. She was holding on to Doc Seismic who was in danger of falling into lava, her other hand conjured a rope of energy that supported her in carrying him. Both of them were only about 40 meters away from the lava. I flew towards her and made sure to secure her first so that her concentration worn be split between holding on and keeping safe. He's slipping, she said. God damn it. 
I should have spent more time working on the jetpack. He then fell. The gloves short circuit and sent a random wave of force that threw him down. I flew in to try and save him, but the guy clapped both gloves. Cling W-O-O-M. Sending another force that sent me back and pushed him faster down. He plunged into the lava and suddenly clapped his gloves again. Cling W-O-O-M. The wave of force caused the lava to shoot upwards again. Shit. I dashed towards Eve. Look out. She said as she sent a force field that temporarily pushed the lava that almost reached me back. She moved to meet me and covered us both in a pink force field. I held her clothes as the lava wrapped around the force field and shoot us upward. Luckily her force field was strong as we got out of there just fine. Not a burn in sight. Well, that guy is toast she did a line. Oh, that doesn't sound good at all I smiled at the attempt. It was cute. She looked at me for a second before pulling me in for a kiss. I stopped for a minute, finally making sense of what Robert had said earlier. Be wise and go for it, Mark. You never know it'll happen again. I wrapped my arms around her, as the kiss went on for a few seconds longer. What was that for? I asked as we stopped. Do I have to spell it for you, invincible? She raised her brow. Hee <laughs> hee. Not at all. Come here I pulled her in again, going for another kiss but she put her finger over my mouth. No need to rush this mark. Besides, you don't need to wait long she whispered in my ear before flying away. Giggle. I watched her go, still wondering how long I have to wait. But as it turns out, I didn't have to wait long at all. MCPOV. Afternoon. I was alone. In the house. Mom went on some important business matter, Dad went on to fight that tentacle kaijo, and Mark was on a mission from Cecil. 1. So I was alone, in the house. Mom left a list for me to do, and I had finished them all by mid-afternoon. I also kept my distance from her plants because of the last time. So I decided to check in on Yon Cole's progress. Hey, did you find him yet? I asked. No, he is quite elusive for a diminutive old man he replied. That's understandable. He might have some magic cloaking him, so just keep up the search. Understood. And by the way, you have company he cut the connection as he finished. What company? I asked out loud. Ding dong knocking. I was surprised by the sudden interruption and decided to scan through the door. I found Donna, wearing a black outfit with silver decorations as well as silver boots. Her abdomen was exposed, which added to my interest. I dashed towards the door and fixed myself, before opening it. Hey, Donna. I greeted. Hello, Robert. Mind if I come in? She asked. Yeah, of course. Come in. Too. She walked inside, and as I turned after shutting the door she greeted me with an angry look. Uh, what? I asked. Robert. Do you like me? She asked. I was slightly offended that she had to ask. Of course I do. Didn't I tell you before? I replied. Then kiss me, she said. One. Uh, what? I was extremely confused and strangely excited. Kiss me she repeated, she was still angry but there was a slight blush on her face. I was confused, oh, what the hell. I grabbed her hand and pulled her in, caressing her face as I took in every detail of her. I then kissed her, for the first time. I softly held her head and kept at it for a long time, not caring about the surveillance of the GDA, just letting myself enjoy the moment. And as we stopped, the smile on her face became brighter as hints of tears threatened to fall from her eyes. Clears throat. I see, well, that's a very convincing performance. But dash, I pull her in again but this time just to hug her. Donna, why are you even asking? If it wasn't already obvious from the first moment, then that kiss was certainly good proof I whispered. Sighs. Okay, I was just lonely. The five-star suite was perfect and all, but it's incredibly solitary. I don't have anyone to talk to or spend time with she replied. Then let's spend time here. I can cook. I proudly proclaimed. Five. Giggle. All right, but no funny business you. I may not be strong enough to hurt you but I know a few places that are more sensitive than most she glared at me. I resisted the urge to cover my crotch area. We spent a good few hours just talking, eating the food I made, and pretty much just getting to know each other better. As time passed, it was already half past 8 p.m. when I heard Mark arrive. He pretty much smiled the entire time as he looked at both Donna and me. He then gave a thumbs up before shutting himself in his room. He seemed more alive than the last time I saw him. Something about him just seems a little different. Robert, what are you doing? Donna asked, wondering. Mark seems off somehow I described. Well don't mind him. Come here she dragged me to the sofa and started to kiss me. Kissing noises. Well, this certainly is quickly turning into a nice evening. Mark POV. 1. A-H-H. She did kiss me doesn't she? I say to myself as I lay on the bed. 1. Samantha Eve Wilkins likes me. I wanted to continue that making out session. 1. Groan. I bet Rob is already way past kissing by now, but as I don't want to pressure Eve into anything, not after what happened to her and Rex. Glass knocking. Hmm? I look over the window to find Eve just flying outside of it, asking me if I could let her in. I ran and quickly opened the window. She landed inside and started looking around my room. I was lucky to have cleaned up earlier. She sat on my bed and looked at me. So, this is your room she stated. I mean yeah, and there's only two of us here she continued. Yeah I was starting to get where she's going with this. Oh just come here. She conjured a pink rope that coiled around my chest and dragged me towards her. I landed and laughed, and then kissed her. She held my head and started to passionately hold me tight. Well, seems like Rob's not the only one getting some love today. Third POV. And so there was a point when two young and powerful couples spent their time in a passionate embrace. But not far from them, in the sky nearly three miles off was another couple. Are you seriously gonna put that on the grill? Debbie Grayson was currently being held in her husband's arms, along with a sizable tentacle of an unknown creature. What? It's considered a delicacy in some places, and an aphrodisiac Nolan Grayson explained to his wife, a subtle look over his face. Scoffs. Like you need it, Debbie replied. Well, I hope the kids like it. I remember the last time you brought them another one of your exotic ingredients. They still avoid my meatloaf like the plague she said. Hey, don't forget. I just took down a freaking kaiju and saved the world. So regardless of culinary tastes, your husband's a badass. He proclaimed shamelessly. One. Yeah, well I sold a house today that had a double homicide. I told them lightning never strikes twice she retorted with her proclamation. All right. All right. We're a family of badasses Nolan lands in front of their house. Now get that ass on the kitchen and start cooking. I have to warn Mark. Hopefully, he'll tell Robert before they both come to hate another dish of yours he smiled. As they both entered the door, they noticed that the lights inside were all turned off. 
Nolan himself heard two separate sounds coming from the living room and Mark's room, so he dashed upstairs and opened Mark's door. Debbie, on the other hand, simply flipped the switch on the living room lights, and what they both saw forever cemented a certain fact on their minds. 2. Mark. Nolan shouted in surprise, as he saw Mark and Adam Eve both half-naked and kissing. Robert. Debbie seemed deeply disturbed, seeing her son Robert, the good boy, on the couch as he and Donna Troy lay only in their underwear. 2. Their kids, were a twin pair of horny teenagers. MCPOV. This, this is impossible. 2. Robert. Mark. I understand that as young men, you are subject to your passions and desires dad floated in front of us. He gathered us both and decided to talk 500 meters off the ground. Dad. We know Mark tried to appeal but. And yet, you were caught half-naked in your room with a girl. Both of you were dad made some excellent points. I just can believe that I didn't hear them arrive or even open the door. 2. Size. You know, I can understand. You're both young and they are both really beautiful girls who like you. I see nothing wrong with a little passion sometimes dad said. Yeah, sometimes, right. But you're still young, you need to slow down a bit. Give yourselves time to enjoy each other's company and maybe, just maybe something more will come from it he finished. That's, actually good advice. I mean I never wanted to take it fast in the first place dash I tried to defend myself. Yeah, tell that to your mom, as she saw it your hands were going to places real fast he interjected. 7. That, I couldn't argue. Well, hopefully, Debbie doesn't bring them down too hard, he said. Which made me curious. I secretly looked below and used my vision to look inside the house. I was surprised to find that they were huddled together and looking at. Oh, crap. I unconsciously spoke out loud. Robert, what is it? Dad asked, curious, nothing. I just, got a fly smack into my eye. Nothing major the excuse was flimsy but effective. I saw mom and the two girls looking at our baby pictures. Laughing and pointing at stuff as they did. They seemed to bond rather than be distant, which now that I think about it wasn't that weird. Mom never had any other female in the house, Eve is distant from her overbearing parents, and Donna misses her mom. In a way, they help each other cope. Well, at least that went well, I think. Chapter 20, Chapter 19, MCPOV, Flaxan Visit Day, The time has come for me to go and inspect how the Flaxans are doing. I took care of my school stuff last night and also checked in on Donna's stay in the suite. Better make it up to me when you're back, Robert she asked. What? It's only a day I tried to argue. Still considered. Anyway, I'm off to meet Eve and your mom for some girl time. She cut off the call. Seeing everything in order I activated the portal device and went in. To find that the entire place was quite literally filled with either pregnant females or alien children. All of them looked to be no older than 10 years old, which was correct since I was only gone for like 6 days. So the math still stands. The other thing that surprised me was that, there was a statue of me and Yon Cole. And it's not just one. Oh, wow. I said out loud, catching the attention of everyone nearby. I looked around and only then did I see that I walked out of a beautifully built archway that directly fitted the portal size. Gasps. I heard everyone gasp and saw them all stop and they saw me in my superhero suit. I felt awkward now. Hello, Flaxans. I waved my hand and smiled. It's him. Someone shouted and all hell broke loose. Citizens from all around gathered in an instant and cheered. Some tried to lift me and I let them, they then just carried me around and showing me off to the few who live there. Everyone, please put him down I recognize the voice of the female Flaxan soldier. The crowd then gently put me down. The cheering still went on but none of them choose to act. I see you've taken quite the leadership role here. Good for you I say to her. Every community needs a leader, so I stepped up to that role seeing as you were gone she replied. I see. Are you angry about it? Angry at me? I asked. Perhaps at first, but I understand now Scourge. Oh, sorry. We haven't been introduced yet have we? She replied. Haha. Kinda, I was in a rush. My name is Robert Grayson I reached out my hand. And I am Jekka Zaxel she replied with a shake. I was shaken by the coincidence, out of all the Flaxans to have survived one had to be a Zaxel. Nice to meet you but I didn't let it show. We then got to talking and the last eight years here have been revealed to me. They have been living peacefully, given that most of the work around the city was done by the bots. So they had lots of time to repopulate and reorganize but problems soon arose not two years later. Genetic compatibility and the very scarce number of people have become a primary concern for them. In the past, that wouldn't be a problem but given that there are only a couple of dozen individuals here, their future as a species will be over. Seeing their impending doom, Jekka had decided to use my image as their savior to give hope. So basically, you're laying this problem on my feet. Hoping for me to solve it I said. I am embarrassed but yes. We do not have enough population to diversify our gene pool. Interbreeding is not acceptable as well, for a good number of reasons I'm sure you are aware she paused. Size. I know, alright, can you at least tell me what you would suggest? I asked. I did have an idea but the technology is all but lost to my people now. In the old days, the empire would send troops to other dimensions to dash. No, I am not pillaging another dimension of its population I stated. I'm not suggesting that merely that you could help some relocate here she clarified. Her idea was perfect actually but I needed something else. I asked for a bit of time and took off to the skies, trying to think. Cloning would work perfectly but I cannot program a personality or memory out of thin air. Even my telepathy only goes so far. I flew around the planet, trying to find something. Anything to give me an idea. Then it hit me. Why am I looking at the ground, when I can look up at the sky? I mean, the flax sand dimension has always been largely unexplored. Maybe there are other alien races out there. But just as I flew up I noticed something white and big flying towards me. I stopped to zoom on its face. It wore a very unmistakable white Viltrumite warrior's uniform and a mustache on its face. It reached me in a moment. The guy was nearly three times my size. You. This planet has been deemed too weak to support by the Viltrum Empire. Are you one of its guardians? He asked me. I'm its only guardian I stated. Truly pathetic he then dashed and tried to punch me. Boom. I caught his fist, smiling as I did. I made my eyes glow, ready to fire. Not a good move to make on someone stronger than you, I say. Are you, Kryptonian? He asks seriously. Well, I'm not trying to hide it I answer. 
Good he then retrieved something from his uniform and slammed something to my chest. Boom. I got thrown back, then I noticed these weird green shards on my chest. Remnants of a green glowing crystal were scattered all around. Chuckle. Is that supposed to be, kryptonite? I asked in surprise. He stood there in horror as he realized his oversight. I rushed him and flew both of us into one of the three moons of the Flaxen planet. News flash, Viltramite. I'm immune. I delivered a punch to his head. Boom. The strike blew him back and buried him deep. By the time I retrieved him, he seemed dazed. Slap. I put my earpiece into his ear before slapping him to clear his mind. He then grabbed both my arms and forced them away before headbutting me. I followed suit and headbutted him in return. Crack. I felt my skull rang from the impact but he produced a large crack that bleed out towards his left eye. Enough. I say before firing me heat vision into his chest. BZZZT boom. Instead of passing through, the beam merely forces him back into the moon. He was down again but still managed to crawl up despite the massive burn on his chest and bleeding on his head. I do not want to fight you Viltramite. I say, trying to end the fight. I I will, not admit defeat to a Kryptonian. He answered, managing to stand. Oh grow up. I know Kryptonians are stronger than normal Viltramites dash. Coughs. Stronger. He smiled and started to chuckle. Groan. Kryptonians are the weaklings? You are an anomaly. He started before dashing towards me again. I didn't have time to ask what he meant, so I dashed towards him and grabbed both his arms. Using his momentum, I slammed him into the ground. Boom. I grabbed his head and locked it between my arms. I searched his mind again, this time focusing on his knowledge about Kryptonians. And what I saw made me angry. Your powers are inconsequential dash. He tried to pry my hands off and kick me away but I had enough. I willed the earpiece to activate, emitting a sound that Viltramite finds especially painful. Pricing scream. The sound rang loudly, making the Viltramite lose his grip and fall on the surface of the moon. Groan. He didn't even scream which was respectable, and I wasn't trying to kill him. Do you like it Viltramite? To suffer at the feet of someone exploiting your weakness. I asked him before kicking him away. Boom. He flew away from the blow but I drove him back down with a punch to his face. Boom. The tiny moon shook as I continued to deliver blow after blow, releasing my anger at him. Years went by and we didn't meet them again. I remember dad saying, but that was now revealed to be a lie. I stopped my onslaught for a moment, taking in the damage I had inflicted upon him. He lay in the large crater, broken bones and bloodied clothes. There was now a large crack on his forehead to his left eye. He looked pretty beat up but I could still hear his heart beating strong. I landed over him, my hand just inches away from his heart. I couldn't control myself, for what he did. You will show me where they are I stated. Cough. He choked a bit but didn't reply. You will take me to your little squad of whelps I stated again. This time his eyes shoot up. I will find them, I say. Crack. I plunge my hand into his chest and gripped his beating heart. And I will kill you all, for what you were so willing to do, I say. Throb 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 throb. I know that this won't be enough to kill him so I didn't feel bad about doing it. You will die for this Kryptonian. And the last of your kind will finally cease he muttered. Not unless I wipe out all eight of your little suicide force first I stated. I will never betray them he stated. Oh, but you didn't have to. I just needed to guide your thinking towards the answers to save myself some time I made him faint by momentarily blocking the blood flow to his brain. I grabbed the body and opened a portal to earth, I sent my intent to one of the bots and gave him a command line before throwing the body inside. Now that that's taken care of, the next part is to save my people. And hopefully, solve the flaxen problem in one go. I took off to space and flew towards the location of their prison. Two weeks in. Fifty light years away. Cruising through the depths of space was an eye-opener. I saw a lot of planets and stars, which had me curious about what they could do to me once I exposed myself to them. I was going so fast that I was easily passing through a giant asteroid and space I've without any resistance. I didn't have to sleep at all since flying wasn't much of a mental toll to me so I just flew for two weeks straight. Until I arrived. I arrived to see an almost Earth-like planet that had several islands instead of continents. A single yellow star shined just off its periphery. The planet also seemed to be filled with green flora at a first glance, but as I zoomed in I could see some of those were large chunks of green crystals just protruding off the planet. If I had to guess, I would say that those were kryptonite. They found the perfect spot to trap them here. The sun kept the more fatal effects of kryptonite at bay while the kryptonite actively suppressed and weakened them to the point of almost being human. I was simply observing the planet when I noticed five more figures flying towards me. Men and women of Viltrum, take by Thrag to supervise the exile of Kryptonians. Halt, you are in Viltrumite territory, turn back or you will be killed one female stated. Hmm, there's only five of you, where's the other three? I asked. Hmph, I knew it, the sympathizer's master has sent a dog to fetch them. I'll handle him myself, I never got to fight since I was born a brown-skinned Viltrumite took the initiative and dashed towards me. Haha, <laughs> we should all join in, it's been ages since we last fought another female said. As all of them talked among themselves, I smiled in excitement. Good, you'll be very valuable for experimentation. So come, meet your ends at the hands of a weak Kryptonian I stayed as I coated my body in TTK energy and made my eyes glow. They all charged as I waited. Two tackled and held my arms in place while the other three sent punch after punch my way. BZZZT. I fired my heat vision right, hitting a Viltramite right in its eyes. It screamed as I recoiled and covered its burned eyeballs. I then sent a telekinetic wave that flung both Viltramite away from me, giving me time to dash the cocky brown-skinned one and impaled my leg into its chest. The other two tried to rush me but I held them in place with telekinesis, effectively paralyzing them. I opened a portal and kicked the injured Viltramites into it before closing it. I then looked at the remaining three and smiled. Boasting rusty old Viltramites. Let's play some more I boasted. But it was odd how weak they were. They were stronger than Mark but not by a lot. Yon Cole POV. Currently, I was in the middle of refining the already adequate cloning machine, trying to find ways to remove if not lessen the need for materials based on creature density. It was truly a remarkable process, a perfect replicate in form. Bang. I then heard this noise coming from the testing room and received a command line that could only be from Robert. I've retrieved a sample for the project. Contain him and await for more samples. I teleported into the room and found a large man with a gaping hole on his chest and a sizable crack on his left forehead. His vital signs indicated his still living state. I wrapped his body in a stasis field and quickly put him inside a glass chamber next to the Reaper's corpse. The chamber will keep him unconscious until the project starts. For now, I should focus on adding more chambers for the samples. I wonder if he needs my help. 
Suddenly another portal opens. Out of it came another two individuals with several fatal injuries on them. Hmm. Curious stating as I wrapped both of them in a single stasis field and waited. Chapter 21, Chapter 20, Third POV, Flax in Dimension, Kryptonian. They all exclaimed. Yes, I am Robert replied. They all then dashed and flew him towards the planet. Noticing their plan, Robert merely lightly resisted. The Viltramites exerted themselves greatly, pushing Robert's entire person along the way, aimed at the largest kryptonite crystal they could find as they entered the planet's atmosphere. When they found their target, they immediately shifted course and slammed Robert into it. Boom crack. The giant green crystal shook on impact, large crack appeared where Robert's body was embedded into. They all floated backwards, hoping to see him weakened by the direct contact. They saw Robert was unmoving. Breath. One of them, a fair-skinned woman with short black hair, expressed her relief. That was unexpected from a Kryptonian. Aren't they all trapped here? She asked the others. Perhaps the sympathizers smuggled a few of them years ago. This one had strange powers than the others another Viltramite woman answered her. Stop it. What matters is, he is dead. We can't have one of them seeing him for dash a male Viltramite answered but was interrupted. An arm went through his chest, one clad in black material and red lines. In his hand was piece of kryptonite, fashioned to a shape and bloodied and dirty. One. The two females flew back in response, arms raised and ready for another fight. They saw his face once again, the young Kryptonian who invaded their prison world. But what really got them on alert was his glowing red eyes, his power still remained. MCPOV. I open another portal behind me and threw the male Viltramite inside before closing it. All that's left now were the two females. Surrender, both of you, and I will let you both live I stated. Hmph. Another ploy for time Kryptonian. I'm guessing your suit protects you from the Kryptonite she suggested. I shook my head and crushed the Kryptonite still in my hand, before throwing it to my mouth. Crunch crunch. I gave it a good chew as I watched them stare in disbelief. Impossible. How dash. How does it taste? Well, it tastes like crayons for one thing. And don't ask me why I know I interrupted. One. Why are you here? The fair-skinned female asked. I'm here to free my people and dash I simply reply. Boom. I blitz and grasped her neck, to capture all of you. I say as I slam her to the ground. No. I heard the other scream as she sent a kick to my face, forcing me to release the other and catch it with both arms. The kick forced me back, leaving a trail of broken soil as I resisted. The female then tackled me again, this time successfully binding my arms up to prevent my movement. The other then rushed and proceeded to punch me in an attempt to incapacitate me. I flew myself backwards and slammed us both on the kryptonite, before forcing both my hands down. Crack crack scream. She screamed, but not for long as I kicked her in the neck and into a portal, leaving the other one by herself. I turned around to see her in a defensive stance again. You know you can't win, I said to her. It doesn't matter. You will fail, she replied. We'll see about that, I replied as I blitzed her and knocked her out with a punch to stomach. Before I threw her into the portal again, I took the time to search for something that I found odd. And soon, I got my answer. I turns out that the one I fought who two weeks earlier was the only one left of their older generation. The five earlier was the new generation, trained to increase their strengths but never really challenging themselves out of complacency. The three I didn't see were trapped for having defended the Kryptonian slaves, and the slaves were all depot word. This planet also turns out to be a natural mineral source for different kinds of kryptonite. And it just so happens that they found that hand-sized gold kryptonite completely strips Kryptonian powers. 4. Size. I sat down and took a moment to think. The planet's population was at 3,000 men, women, and children as far as I could tell by their memories. All of them descendants from the original few who were exiled, and all of them depot word due to years of gold kryptonite effects. I want to go and transport all of them to Flaxa right now but I have three other Viltramites to take care of. I flew up and directly went to the designated prison area on the planet. I hid an echo chamber built inside a small mountain. Boom. I directly crashed myself into the mountain and landed on the thick walls that showed as the ground shook of it from the impact. I gave it a few good punches before getting in. The echo chamber was compromised and all the sound inside finally got out, lessening the strain on the three chained and gagged Viltramites on the floor. BZZZT. I quickly shot the sound devices all around the chamber. I heard them all sigh in relief as the, the ringing sound stopped messing with them. I landed in front of them and did a through scan. Two females and a single male, once again. The one female, a darker skinned woman, saw me land. You, what are you? She asked me in a confused way. The others looked at me and we're similarly confused. Kryptonian. I was told you were the ones who were kind to my people on this planet I answered. I, I can't believe it. I don't. How can you fly despite the dash the male tried to ask? Not important. I need you to take me to where my people are I stated impatiently. They, the three thousand that remain at least, are in hiding the female replied. That remain? So there was more of us here. I asked, my eyes glowed a dangerously red light as my anger simmered to the surface. Our ancestors, the original wardens of your people's exile, imposed a rule to strip every one of their powers before they even got here. A vast majority of them, didn't make it the male answered, seemingly distraught by it. Whoosh. I dashed and grabbed the male by the neck, before slamming him back into the ground. What? I asked angrily. Both women grabbed me and tried to separate me from him, but they were immediately immobilized by my telekinesis. I let myself think for a moment, to calm myself. Before long I let them go. I apologize. I just haven't been so angry for a long time. I explained. All three of them put some distance between me and them and eyed me cautiously. Sighs. I suppose I should be angry with your ancestors instead. If they were here then this planet will be in pieces after I was done with them. But, you aren't them I said. I, we, accept your apologies. But we won't ask it of you. We only hope to atone somehow the female replied. I thought it over and immediately thought of something. How about you help them rebuild their lives? I asked. That would be fitting, but this world was a prison. Other than basic necessities, helping them would require a lot more dash. I have a planet just two weeks away, filled with everything they need. It just so happens that they need more people to repopulate. It would be a good start for them I suggested. They seem to deliver it so I decide to give them a day to think. But with a warning. Oh, and I've seen a lot of situations like these. Usually they go and try to gain an upper hand, so I'm warning you. If even one, and I mean one, Kryptonian dies because of one of you, then none of you will live I said. It would be a waste in available samples but that's where I draw the line. 
I then decided to leave the place and check how my people were. Maybe even get the corpse of the originals exiles and captors. The situation was, bleak to say the least. What was left of them were scattered groups who devolved into primitive tribes of sorts, using the local resources to build homes and fend off predators. I quickly read the minds of some and was even more heartbroken by the reaction and memories they had. All their life was filled with memories of pain and. They treated me like a god, kneeling and chanting my name as I flew down. It was a good thing I could quickly assimilate their language from memory, it would have been harder to cope otherwise. 1. It took me the entire day to read the mind and check the conditions of everyone. I wanted to help immediately but I needed to wait until they were on Flaxa. Until then I could only cheer them up, even if only slightly. I then found the burial sites of the original exiles. The ancestors of what was left here. I scanned them over and was very pleased to find them still viable for DNA retrieval. After paying my respects, I retrieved a suitably sized sample before flying away. I quickly headed to the Viltramite pseudo base here, a huge supply ship they had landed over the planet's highest peak. The last three Viltramites stood there, almost as if expecting my arrival. So, have all of you decided? I asked. Yes. We accept she said. Good I replied. I then went over a few things I would like them to take into consideration, such as a fair system of governance, training, education. I especially make it a point to say no to copulating with the locals. We will guide the Kryptonians to your chosen world, and watch over them. But we would like to be granted the opportunity to at least have children the female Viltramite appealed. You do understand why I didn't even have to bring it up, do you? I do not want to risk the survival of the native Flaxans. I know about your innate dominant genetics I stated. Yes, it's true. But only three of us remain here. Please don't remove our only means of survival as a species the male Viltrum Jade implored. Very well. But I will constantly monitor everything, so at the first signs of rebellion dash. You have our gratitude Kryptonian? We swear to you, none of us or our progeny will ever betray you. You have our word the male said. The other two females nodded. That remains to be seen I commented. Now that the agreement was set, it was time to get them to Flaxa. I opened a portal and sent a command line to Yonkol. A few hours later, he came out of the portal with another device on his hand. You know what to do I said to him. Yonkol nodded and scanned all around us, before opening up another portal. Kryptonian, who is that? And what is that portal? The female Viltramite asked. A friend I made long ago, and that portal is the way to Flaxa, your new home I reply. Yonkol POV. Five samples total. That's the number of superhumans I had to put on stasis to continue setting up the additional glass tubes. And as I finished placing the last into the tube, I got a command line requesting my presence. And the site I went through was, quite interesting. A world filled with crystalline minerals that just became a new focus under the name Project S. He then introduced me to these Viltramites, as he called them. Physiological scans indicate superhuman physicality but not in the majestic level which means that they were rather passable, just barely. They were to be his proxy in this dimension, to oversee the development of Flaxa in future. Over the next few days we gathered the tribes and sent them to Flaxa in batches of three, each guarded and overseen by a Viltramite. It was a rough couple of weeks after that, as we had to drastically deal with the tribes who were experiencing severe culture shock. But powered through, the locals were only too happy to meet these new beings to their mostly empty world. Many problems arose after that, the most pressing of them being the awakening feelings of anger towards the Viltramite proxies. With a unified voice and story, the locals sympathized greatly and appealed to have the Viltramites be killed or simply just leave the planet. Robert intervened and played the mediator, and after days of convincing they finally reached an agreement. The Viltramites were to simply watch over and protect them from any greater threat, in exchange for continued residence on the planet. The Viltramites readily agreed and choose to live as one just outside the city, a small residence that Robert himself helped build. In all that time, Robert has become a symbol for the Kryptonians here. They call the Superman, the powerful hero of their people. 1. But the odd thing was, once Robert got news off it he seemed bothered. I couldn't understand why. The name certainly suited him or will suit him once he is older. So why does he seem to avoid it? It was a question that I pondered as I flew around the crystalline rich planet. He placed me here to catalog and survey, specifically looking for different types of these so-called kryptonite. Chapter 22, Chapter 21, MCPOV, 4 months in. Again I said, as all three Viltramites tried and failed to overpower me, it's been four months since I stayed in this dimension. Nearly half or more of that time I spent being an ambassador of sorts, helping the Kryptonians settle in and adjust, making some semblance of democratic leadership as a foundation for their growth. After all that, I just wanted a change of pace. And helping these, morons fight better was a start. The fair-skinned female, named Bria, tackled and attempted to pin me down using her weight. Her strength increased since we last fought, but she still was too obvious of a fighter. I jumped out of the way and sent a swift hit to the back of her head, knocking her out. To my surprise, the other female named Nadesi, caught me and sent a kick to my back. The force flung my towards the male, named Macken, who used my memontum to slam me into the ground. So that was their plan, they're learning well. Macken pinned me down as Nadesi landed beside me and started punching as hard as she could. The entire mountain top shook from the impact but they were still too light compared to the reapers. I spun myself in place, flinging a both before stopping in an upright position. I saw both of them immediately flew back to me and charge at me again. I readied myself but was surprised when the one I knocked out arm locked me in place. The other then piled on once again, punching and slamming their fists or elbows on me. I flexed my muscles back in place, pulling Bria towards me as I smaller the back of my head on her face, prompting her to let go. I used that moment to rush and quickly zeabled the other two. I could see the effort they put in, but they were still quite weak. Had enough yet? I asked. They regrouped and asked for it again. It's the one thing I admire about them. A few days ago, I received Yon Cole's diagnostic analysis on them and shook my head as I read. Although they look like adults, by calculations their strength should be around that of a 15-year-old Viltramite. Their biology seems to have adapted to the dimension's speed but their strength suffered as a consequence. Also, the fact that the five Viltramites I used as samples. In terms of potential, my future half-alien little brother had more room to grow than these guys. A portal opens up behind me, out of it came Yon Cole, holding a tiny box in his hands. You found it. I asked him in shock. I really thought that it would be next to impossible. Yes, both of them actually. They emit a unique energy signature among the rest so it was quite hard not to notice it. Of course, it was near the planet's core when I found it he stated. Excuse me but, what did he find? Bria asked. 
Nothing you need concern yourself with I replied and looked back to Yon Cole. Then an idea flashed in my head. Actually, all of you, meet your new combat instructor. Yon Cole, my friend I proclaimed. Are you sure? I feel like it would be, wasted. Besides, the projects need me to operate Yon Cole replied. Size. All right. Just as far then I said. As far. He stood there staring before suddenly lunging towards the Viltramites. His hands glowed with pinkish energy. The Viltramites reacted accordingly. The two women flew off while the only man faced it head on. Yon Cole focused the energy and fired a beam at Macken. Macken intercepted the beam with arms crossed, unharmed. But the moment he dropped his guard, Yon Cole appeared in front of him and landed a heavily punch in his gut. Macken bent over in pain, but his face was met with another energized punch from Yon Cole. The impact blasted him backwards and into a four meter deep hole he landed on. Bria attempted a roundhouse kick, but her legs were caught. Natasi attempted a sneak attack from the distracted Yon Cole, but her fists landed on an energy field that formed around him. Then, a shrill high pitched noise exploded from Yon Cole, incapacitating the Viltramites with it. And just like that, they were down again. Albeit with more injuries than when I was sparring with them. You could have been a little bit more, gentle, I commented. I did warn you. Wasted, he retorted before opening up a portal to Earth. Hmm. My eyes are deadly indeed. I let the three have their rest while I start to fly off planet. One of my many goals during this travel was to feel and catalog the different powers that different stars give me. The minor side hope being able to encounter other forms of sentient life. The first star I started with was the younger blue star. The moment its rays hit my body, I immediately felt this sense of excitedness all over. I felt like having a pleasant and constant input of electricity being coursed throughout my body. I fly around, testing my speed with this momentary boost. I ignored the steroids my way and simply passed through them. I used my heat vision on a few asteroid, which simply disintegrated the rocks under a massive red beam within seconds. My abilities did increase but it feels as if it's merely temporary. So I spent a few more days just bathing in its light. My suit went full capacity just three hours of exposure. The next time I flew to find another star, I quickly found a neutron star. It didn't give me any kind of boost or weaken me at all. I guess I should expect it from a dead star. I was disappointing to feel but I stayed for a day to admire the beautiful display. I spent the rest of the month searching for any other stars. The abilities never stayed for more than a few days when I was not exposed to the suns. I recorded their effects on me and then portaled to Flaxa. Once there, I went and looked for the Viltramites. Imagine my surprise and cringe when I found all of them naked and on each other. Clear's throat. I decided not to say anything since it would only serve to lengthen the awkwardness. Um, Sir Robert, what brings you here? The Viltramite woman asked. You do understand that from as a genetic concern, what you're doing is going to negatively influence your children, I stated. We aren't doing anything wrong, Dash. Unfortunately, you are. About a month ago, before I left, I found out that all of you are descendants from an incestu copulation I held back my disgust. The news shocked them all as they hastily ran from each other, still naked. Sigh. Just, just don't do that again. In the event that either of you do get pregnant, take care of it until I come around. I'll be dropping by every few years anyway so I'll be of help I reassured. Which only served to make them even more horrified. I should just go and let them talk about this themselves. I quickly left their home and flew to the city. Everything was well now, barely. The Kryptonians still find it difficult to adjust to the advanced city, but the Flaxans helped them feel very welcome. Which eased a bit of the tensions. Seeing no other problems now, I decided just sunbathe for a few days. Of course full body expose is the most optimal choice, so I went about it naked. The last day, six months limit. On the last day of my stay here, other than sunbathing, I spent it studying my own genes in comparison to the ancient Kryptonian genes I found on the Kryptonite planet. Needless to say that my genes were very different. Some parts of it resembled the Kryptonians but some part didn't. It was a concern but not my priority for now. Since this was going to be my last visit in a while, I wanted to put a system in place that would warn me if something weird happened. I hid a program within the Viltramites home computers that would send me a compact signal matrix through a micro portal. It would only activate when specific conditions are met. And so with that I was all set to return back to Earth. Just in time for tonight's dinner. The moment I got back, I noticed the new additions to the place. Especially the 16 blast tubes for my projects, most of which were already full. I looked around for Yokol and found him on a high-powered microscope. Were you detected? I asked. No. The bots helped greatly, and it was quite simple to cover up any evidence of our operation. Though I must express doubt over, one plan of yours he said. Oh, why so? I asked. Nothing. I do find it noble to undertake, but the emotional impact it would have on the girl, it would be tremendous he expressed while still focused on the microscope. It was promise I had made. And regardless of the outcome, I will see it through I replied, knowing full well the cost of this project. Very well he replied. I floated towards the one cell that had a woman inside, her neck badly damaged. On another note, how goes the other projects? I asked. Rather well compared to this one. The DNA was still viable despite the years or lack thereof. The old man still eludes my scanners though he replied. As expected, he is quite skilled despite his advanced age I commented. And the other, the procedure you wish to create, is looking promising. In a few months I could already successfully perform it without any mistakes he said. Good. That should be around the right for it. It should help even the odds in the family I said. I think that's all, Yon Cole. By the way, where is bot hashtag 001? I asked. I did not see that particularly unusual bot around. It needed a little, upgrade. His build was badly broken earlier so I simply took the opportunity to do so he replied. I see, wait. His, what do you mean his? I asked, now extremely curious. You must have misheard me. I never used his when referring to bot hashtag 001. It has no sentience he explained, head still glued on the microscope. Hmm, don't you have dinner to attend to, Robert? He said, right, fine. I must have misheard it. I'm sorry I say as I flew away from the base. I didn't tell him about my idea for his new life here on this earth yet. Better keep it as a surprise. Yon Cole POV. Hmm, interesting. A slip of the tongue despite the impossibility of such in me. Perhaps I'm already growing more human than before. I immediately rose from my seat and teleported to an unknown place within the base. 
Inside it was at the body of bot hashtag 001, its head currently hooked up to the large array of monitors around the room. He needed to understand. This was my surprise for my friend Robert. MCPOV. Just when I thought my day would be peaceful again, I got a call from Cecil about a submarine carrying a nuclear bomb somewhere in the Philippines. The GDA suppressed the news outlets in that country to lessen the panic, but word still got out and the country was requesting aid. I quickly wore my custom and flew across the planet, to Philippines. I arrived in the submarine's last known coordinates and plunged into the ocean. Reminder, the nuclear material will be quite useful as an alternative energy source for your base. I suggest you repurpose it for use. Yon Cole suddenly spoke in my ear. Can't exactly do that without triggering a worldwide search for the thing. It's a nuclear bomb for God's sake. I exclaimed, I liked the idea but it was too risky. I have an idea about that. Yon Cole hinted. Explain I replied. He quickly explained his side and it was, brilliant. That's, alright fine. But this better work I told him. I sent out a telekinetic wave that acted as a sonar, sending it wide enough to finally find the submarine just 5,000 leagues below me. Here goes nothing. Cecil POV, GDA Command Center. Where are we on center? I asked the stooges below. 3,000 leagues and still descending. Satellite imaging won't be able to pick up past 4,001 stooge answered. Damn it, he's almost as fast as Nolan. Sir, we're picking up some sort of interference, some kind of, message. Another stooge informed. Well, read it you dumbass. It says, machine head. The third stooge seemed to question. What the hell is that mob boss doing? I was about to berate another female stooge when the lights and the electronics suddenly flickered for a moment, but only for a moment as they returned to normal after. That was odd, I tried to breathe out slowly but there was no chill in the air. So that's a no, yes sir, the female stooge nervously asked. What? It's the submarine sir, it seems to have changed course. It's currently rising she continued. So what? The boy must be lifting it by now. Sir, sentry is dropping deeper she replied in confusion. Put it up the monitor I said. The stooges displayed what little the sonar imaging managed to pick up. Sentry was going down, but it was slow. What the hell happening to him? Perhaps he's drowning sir a male stooge replied. Why is this idiot even here? I ordered a few stooges to get the stupid stooge out and fired. Sir, the submarine sensors are picking up some kind of radiation coming from sentry the female stooge informed me. Hmm. Her name was Jess right? I like her. Teleport a drone and couple of agents over 15 feet away from him. I want every available satellite boosting that are connection to it. Get me a clear picture of what's happening. But sir that 40 million dollars just to dash. I wanna see why the kid is acting weird. I want the divers to save that kid because if he actually drowns you don't wanna see two superpowered heroes who could take down everything we got, do everything in their power to take revenge on us for not saving him. Got it. They quietly rushed around and got to work. Fuck, I raised my voice there, need to calm down. I took a few minutes to sit down before the stooges finally did what I asked. The drone showed us, a green crystal. What the hell is that? I asked over the communicator. I don't know sir, but it's making sentry weak for some reason. His skin is still tough to damage but he's not reacting to us at all. A diver answered as he checked and poked on sentry. Well take it keep it sealed. Let's see what he does I said. The divers did just that and sealed the green crystal inside a containment box. Seconds later, sentry opened his eyes and quickly rushed towards the submarine. Sir, sentry is active and has successfully destroyed the bomb just the stooge informed. I walked away to think. Might have just found my smoking gun on Nolan's powerful son. Chapter 23, Unfortunately. Hello, readers of this story. As you may have noticed and read, the errors in the chapters have not been corrected. That's because it's a rough draft that the author had made about four months ago, before he died. I got his phone afterwards and managed to retrieve the password of the email link to this account. 1. I was his first reader before every post. I only managed to upload this last two and the other two in another magi because it was already made on this phone, unedited. This account will be deleted tomorrow people. 3. I think he would want to say thank you for reading the weird story he made so far, and good luck to you all. Comment. 108 comments. Vote.